Chapter One London, 1848 Winter Wynne had always thought Kev Merry Pen was beautiful, the way an austere landscape or a wintry day could be beautiful. He was a big, striking man, uncompromising in every angle. His hair was as thick and black as a raven's wing, his brows strong and straight. Most of the time, his mouth was set with a brooding curve, Wynne found irresistible. When he smiled, his face was transformed, the dark eyes sparkling, the teeth very white, and he was the handsomest man who'd ever lived. Mary Penn, her love, but never her lover. They had known each other since childhood, when he'd been taken in by her family. He came to Wynne's bedroom and stood at the threshold to watch as she packed a valise with personal articles from the top of her dresser. A hairbrush, a rack of pins, a handful of handkerchiefs her sister Poppy had embroidered for her. As Wynne tucked the objects into the leather bag, she was intensely aware of Mary Penn's motionless form. She knew what lurked beneath his stillness, because she felt the same undertow of yearning. The thought of leaving him was breaking her heart, and yet there was no choice. She had been an invalid ever since she'd had scarlet fever two years earlier. She was thin and frail, and given to fainting spells and fatigue. Weak lungs, all the doctors had said. Nothing to do but succumb. A lifetime of bed rest followed by early death. Wynne wouldn't accept such a fate. She longed to get well to enjoy the things most people took for granted, to dance, laugh, walk through the countryside. She wanted the freedom to love, to marry, to have her own family some day. With her health in such a poor state, there was no possibility of doing any of those things. But that was about to change. She was departing this day for a French clinic where a dynamic young doctor, Julian Harrow, had achieved remarkable results for patients just like herself. His treatments were unorthodox, controversial, but Wynne didn't care. She would have done anything to be cured, because until that day came, she could never have Mary Penn. Don't go, he said, so softly she almost didn't hear him. Wynne struggled to remain outwardly calm, even as a hot and cold chill went down her spine. Close the door, she managed to say. They needed privacy for the conversation they were about to have. Mary Penn didn't move. Colour had risen in his tanned face, and his black eyes glittered with emotion he would never allow himself to express. She went to close the door herself, while he moved away, as if any contact between them would prove fatal. Why don't you want me to go, Kev? she asked gently. You won't be safe there. I'll be perfectly safe, she said. I have faith in Dr. Harrow. His treatments sound sensible to me, and he's had a high success rate. He's had as many failures as successes. There are better doctors here in London. You should try them first. I think my best chances lie with Dr. Harrow. Wynne smiled into Mary Penn's hard, black eyes, understanding the things he couldn't say. I'll come back to you. I promise. He ignored that. Any attempt she made to bring their feelings to light was always met with rock-hard resistance. He would never admit he cared for her, or treat her as anything other than a fragile invalid who needed his protection, a butterfly under glass while he went on with his private pursuits. Despite Mary Penn's discretion in personal matters, Wynne had no illusions that he'd been celibate. Something bleak and angry rose from the depths of her soul at the thought of Mary Penn lying with someone else. It would shock everyone who knew her, had they understood the power of her desire for him. It would probably shock Mary Penn most of all. Seeing his expressionless face, Wynne thought, very well, Kev, if this is what you want, I'll be stoic. We'll have a pleasant, bloodless goodbye. Later, she would suffer in private, knowing it would be an eternity until she saw him again. But that was better than living like this, forever together and yet apart, her illness always between them. 
Well, she said briskly, I'll be off soon, and there's no need to worry, Kev. Leah will take care of me during the trip to France, and- Your brother can't even take care of himself, Mary Penn said harshly. You're not going. You'll stay here, where I can- He bit off the words. But Wynne had heard a note of something like fury or anguish buried deep in his voice. This was getting interesting. Her heart began to thump. There, she had to pause to catch her breath. There's only one thing that could stop me from leaving. He shot her an alert glance. What is it? It took her a long moment to summon the courage to speak. Tell me you love me. Tell me, and I'll stay. The black eyes widened. The sound of his indrawn breath cut through the air like the downward arc of an axe stroke. He was silent, frozen. A curious mixture of amusement and despair surged through Wynne as she waited for his reply. I care for everyone in your family. No, you know that's not what I'm asking for. Wynne moved toward him and lifted her pale hands to his chest, resting her palms on a surface of tough, unyielding muscle. She felt the response that jolted through him. Please, she said, hating the desperate edge in her own voice. I wouldn't care if I died tomorrow, if I could just hear it once. Don't, he muttered, backing away. Casting aside all caution, Wynne followed. She reached out to grasp the loose folds of his shirt. Tell me, let's finally bring the truth out into the open. Hush, you'll make yourself ill. It infuriated Wynne that he was right. She could feel the familiar weakness that came along with her pounding heart and laboring lungs. She cursed her failing body. I love you, she said wretchedly. And if I were well, nothing on earth could keep me away from you. I'd take you into my bed and love you as passionately as any woman could. No. His hand lifted to her mouth as if to muffle her, then snatched back as he felt the warmth of her lips. If I'm not afraid to admit it, why should you be? Her pleasure at being near him, touching him, was a kind of madness. Recklessly, she moulded herself against him. He tried to push her away without hurting her, but she clung with all her remaining strength. What if this were the last moment you ever had with me? Wouldn't you have been sorry not to tell me how you felt? Wouldn't you? Mary Penn covered her mouth with his, desperate for a way to make her quiet. They both gasped and went still, absorbing the feel of it. Each strike of his breath on her cheek was a shock of heat. His arms went around her, wrapping her in his vast strength, holding her against the hardness of his body. And then everything ignited, and they were both lost in a furor of need. She could taste the sweetness of apples on his breath, the bitter hint of coffee, but most of all, the rich essence of him. Wanting more, craving him, she pressed upward. He took the innocent offering with a low, savage sound. She felt the touch of his tongue. Opening to him, she drew him deeper hesitantly using her own tongue in a slide of silk on silk, and he shivered and gasped and held her more tightly. A new weakness flooded her, her senses starving for his hands and mouth and body, his powerful weight over and between and inside her. Oh, she wanted him, wanted. Mary Penn kissed her hungrily, his mouth moving over hers with rough, luscious strokes. Her nerves blazed with pleasure, and she squirmed and clutched at him, wanting him closer. Even through the layers of her skirts, she felt the way he urged his hips against hers, the tight, subtle rhythm. Instinctively, she reached down to feel him, to soothe him, and her trembling fingers encountered the hard shape of his arousal. He buried an agonized groan in her mouth. For one scalding moment, he reached down and gripped her hand tightly over himself, her eyes flew open as she felt the pulsing charge, the heat and tension that seemed ready to explode. Kev, the bed, she whispered, going crimson from head to toe. She had wanted him so desperately, 
for so long, and now it was finally going to happen. Take me. Gasping uncontrollably, Mary Penn cursed and pushed her away. Wynne moved toward him. Kev, stay back! For at least a minute, there was no sound or movement, save the angry friction of their breaths. Mary Penn was the first to speak. His voice was low and unsteady. That will never happen again. Because you're afraid you might hurt me. Because I don't want you that way. She stiffened with indignation and gave a disbelieving laugh. <laughs> you responded to me just now. I felt it. His colour deepened. That would have happened with any woman. You... You're trying to make me believe you have no particular feeling for me. Nothing other than a desire to protect one of your family. She knew it was a lie, but his calloused rejection made leaving a bit easier. How noble of you. Her attempt at an ironic tone was ruined by her breathlessness. Stupid, weak lungs. You're overwrought. Mary Penn moved toward her. You need to rest. I'm fine, Wynne said fiercely, going to the washstand, gripping it to steady herself. When her balance was secured, she poured a splash of water onto a linen cloth and applied it to her flushed cheeks. Glancing into the looking-glass, she made her face into its usual serene mask. Somehow, she made her voice calm. I'll have all of you or nothing, she said. You know what words that will make me stay. If you won't say them, then leave. The air in the room was thick with emotion. Wind's nerves screamed in protest as the silence drew out. She stared into the looking-glass, able to see only the broad shape of his shoulder and arm. And then he moved, and the door opened and closed. Wynne continued to dab at her face with the cool cloth, using it to blot stray teardrops. Setting the cloth aside, she noticed that her palm, the one she had used to grip the intimate shape of him, still retained the memory of his flesh, and her lips still tingled from the sweet, hard kisses, and her chest was filled with the ache of desperate love. Well, she said to her flushed reflection, now you're motivated, and she laughed shakily until she had to wipe away more tears. As Cam supervised the loading of the carriage that would soon depart for the London docks, he couldn't help wondering if he were making a mistake. He'd promised Amelia he'd take care of her family, but less than two months after they'd married, he was sending one of her sisters to France. We can wait, he had told Amelia only last night, holding her against his shoulder, stroking her rich brown hair as it lay in a river over his chest. If you wish to keep Wynne with you a little longer, we'll send her to the clinic in the spring. No, she must go as soon as possible. Too much time has already been wasted. Wynne's best chance of improvement is to start the course of treatment at once. Cam had smiled at Amelia's pragmatic tone. His wife excelled at hiding her emotions, maintaining such a sturdy facade that few people perceived how vulnerable she was underneath. He was the only one with whom she would let down her guard. We must be sensible, Amelia had added. Cam had rolled her to her back and stared down at her small, lovely face in the lamplight, such blue eyes, as dark as the heart of midnight. It's not always easy to be sensible, is it? She shook her head, her eyes turning liquid. He stroked her cheek with his fingertips. Poor hummingbird, he whispered. You've gone through so many changes in the past months, not the least of which was marrying me. And now we're sending your sister away. To a clinic, to make her well, Amelia had said. I know it's best for her. It's only that I'll miss her. Wynne is the dearest, gentlest one in the family, the peacemaker. We'll all probably murder each other in her absence. She gave him a little scowl. Don't tell anyone I was crying, or I shall be very cross with you. No, Monisha, he had soothed, cuddling her closer as she sniffled. 
Your secrets are safe with me. You know that. And he had kissed away her tears and removed her nightgown and made love to her slowly. Little love, he had whispered as she trembled beneath him. Let me make you feel better. And as he took careful possession of her body, he murmured that she pleased him in all ways. He loved to be inside her. He would never leave her. Amelia's hands had worked on his back like cat paws, her hips pressing upward into his weight. He'd pleasured her with all his love and skill, and taken his own pleasure, until she'd fallen into a sated sleep. For a long while afterward, Cam had held her nestled against him, the trusting weight of her head on his shoulder. He was responsible for Amelia and her entire family now. The Hathaways were a group of misfits that included four sisters, a brother, and Mary Penn, who was a rom like Cam. No one seemed to know much about Mary Penn, aside from the fact that he'd been taken in by the Hathaway family as a boy, after having been wounded and left for dead by a lawless group of local landowners bent on destroying temporary Romany encampments. There was no predicting how Mary Penn would fare in Wynne's absence, but Cam had a feeling it wasn't going to be pleasant. They couldn't have been more opposite, one so refined and otherworldly, the other hardy, physical, and down-to-earth. But their connection was like the path of a hawk that always returned to the same forest, following the invisible map etched in its very nature. When the carriage was properly loaded, and the luggage had been secured with leather straps, Cam went into the family's hotel suite. They'd gathered in the receiving room to say their goodbyes. Mary Penn was conspicuously absent. They crowded the small room, the sisters and their brother Leo, who was going to France as Wynne's companion and escort. There now, Leo said gruffly, patting the back of the youngest, Beatrix, who had just turned sixteen. No need to make a scene. She hugged him tightly. You'll be lonely so far from home. Won't you take one of my pets to keep you company? No, darling. I'll have to content myself with what human companionship I can find on board. He turned to Poppy, a ruddy-haired beauty of eighteen. Goodbye, sis. Enjoy your first season in London. Don't accept the first fellow who proposes. Poppy moved forward to embrace him. Dear Leo, she said, her voice muffled against his shoulder. Do try to behave while you're in France. No one behaves in France, Leo told her. That's why everyone likes it so much. He turned to Amelia. It was only then that his self-assured facade began to disintegrate. He drew an unsteady breath. Of all the Hathaway siblings, Leo and Amelia had argued the most frequently and the most bitterly. And yet she was undoubtedly his favourite. They had been through a great deal together, taking care of the younger siblings after their parents had died. Amelia had watched Leo turn from a promising young architect into a wreck of a man. Inheriting a title hadn't helped one bit. In fact, it had only hastened Leo's dissolution. That hadn't stopped Amelia from fighting for him, trying to save him every step of the way, which had annoyed him considerably. Amelia went to him and laid her head against his chest. Leo, she said with a sniffle, if you let anything happen to win, I'll kill you. He stroked her hair gently. You've threatened to kill me for years, and nothing ever comes of it. I've been waiting for the right reason. Smiling, Leo pried her head from his chest and kissed her forehead. I'll bring her back safe and well. And yourself, she asked. And myself. Amelia smoothed his coat, her lip trembling. Then you'd better stop living like a drunken wastrel, she said. Leo grinned. But I've always believed in cultivating one's natural talents to the fullest. He lowered his head so she could kiss his cheek. You're a fine one to talk about how to conduct oneself, he said. You, who just married a man you barely know. It was the best thing I ever did, Amelia said. 
Since he's paying for my trip to France, I suppose I can't disagree. Leo reached out to shake Cam's hand. After a rocky beginning, the two men had come to like each other in a short time. Goodbye, Fral, Leo said, using the Romany word that Cam had taught him for brother. I have no doubt you'll do an excellent job taking care of the family. You've already gotten rid of me, which is a promising beginning. You'll return to a rebuilt home and a thriving estate, my lord. Leo gave a low laugh. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you'll accomplish. You know, not just any peer would entrust all his affairs to a pair of Roma. I would say with certainty, Cam replied, you're the only one. After Wynne had bid farewell to her sisters, Leo settled her into the carriage and sat beside her. There was a soft lurch as the team pulled forward, and they headed to the London docks. Leo studied Wynne's profile. As usual, she showed little emotion, her fine-boned face serene and composed. But he saw the flags of colour burning on the pale crests of her cheeks, and the way her fingers clenched and tugged at the embroidered handkerchief in her lap. It had not escaped him that Mary Penn hadn't been there to say goodbye. Leo wondered if he and Wynne had exchanged harsh words. Sighing, Leo reached out and put his arm around his sister's thin, breakable frame. She stiffened, but did not pull away. After a moment, the handkerchief came up, and he saw that she was blotting her eyes. She was afraid, and ill, and miserable. And he was all she had. God help her. He made an attempt at humour. You didn't let Beatrix give you one of her pets, did you? I'm warning you. If you're carrying a hedgehog or a rat, it goes overboard as soon as we're on the ship. Wynne shook her head and blew her nose. You know, Leo said conversationally, still holding her. You're the least amusing of all the sisters. I can't think how I ended up going to France with you. Believe me, came her watery reply. I wouldn't be this boring if I had any say in the matter. When I get well, I intend to behave very badly indeed. Well, that's something to look forward to. He rested his cheek on her soft, blonde hair. Leo, she asked after a moment, why did you volunteer to go to the clinic with me? Is it because you want to get well too? Leo was both touched and annoyed by the innocent question. Wynne, like everyone else in the family, thought his excessive drinking was an illness that would be cured by a period of abstinence and healthful surroundings. But his drinking was merely a symptom of the real illness, a grief so persistent that at times it threatened to stop his heart from beating. There was no cure for losing Laura. No he said to Wynne. I have no intention of improving. I merely want to carry on with my debauchery in new scenery. He was rewarded by a small chuckle. Wynne, did you and Mary Penn quarrel? Is that why he wasn't there to see you off? At her prolonged silence, Leo rolled his eyes. If you insist on being close-mouthed, sis, it's going to be a long journey indeed. Yes, we quarrelled. About what? Harrow's clinic? Not really. That was part of it, but... Wynne shrugged uncomfortably. It's too complicated. It would take forever to explain. We're about to cross an ocean, and then half of France. Believe me, we have time. After the carriage had left... Cam went to the mews behind the hotel, a tidy building with horse stalls and a carriage house on the ground floor and servants' accommodations above. As he had expected, Mary Penn was grooming the horses. The hotel mews were run on a part livery system, which meant some of the stabling chores had to be assumed by the horse owners. At the moment, Mary Penn was taking care of Cam's black gelding. Mary Penn's movements were light, quick, and methodical as he ran a brush over the horse's shining flanks. Cam watched for a moment, appreciating his skill. What do you want? 
Mary Penn asked, without looking at him. Cam approached the open stall, smiling as the horse lowered his head and nudged his chest. No, boy, no sugar lumps. He patted the muscular neck. His shirt sleeves were rolled up to his elbows, exposing the tattoo of a black flying horse on his forearm. Cam had no memory of when the tattoo had been done. It seemed to have been part of him forever. The symbol was an Irish nightmare steed called a puka, an alternately malevolent and benevolent horse who spoke in a human voice and flew at night on widespread wings. According to legend, the puka would come to an unsuspecting human's door at midnight and take him on a ride that would leave him forever changed. Cam had never seen a similar mark on anyone else, until Mary Penn. Through a quirk of fate, Mary Penn had recently been injured in a house fire. As his wound was treated, the Hathaways had discovered the tattoo on Mary Penn's shoulder. That had raised more than a few questions in Cam's mind. He saw Mary Penn glance at the tattoo on his arm. What do you make of a rom wearing an Irish design? Cam asked. They're a Roma in Ireland. Nothing unusual. There's something unusual about this tattoo, Cam said evenly. I've never seen another like it. Until you. And since it came as a surprise to the Hathaways, you've evidently taken great care to keep it hidden. Why is that, Frau? Don't call me that. You've been part of the Hathaway family since childhood, Cam said. And I've married into it. That makes us brothers, doesn't it? A disdainful glance was his only reply. Cam found perverse amusement in being friendly to a rom who so clearly despised him. He understood exactly what had engendered Mary Penn's hostility. For a stranger to come in and act as the head of the family was nearly unendurable. Why have you always kept it hidden? Cam persisted. Mary Penn paused in his brushing and gave Cam a cold, dark glance. I was told it was the mark of a curse. Cam showed no outward reaction, but he felt a few prickles of unease at the back of his neck. Who are you, Mary Penn? he asked softly. The big rom went back to work. No one. You were part of a tribe once. You must have had family. I don't remember any father. My mother died when I was born. So then mine. I was raised by my grandmother. The brush halted in mid-stroke. Neither of them moved. The stable became deadly quiet, except for the snuffling and shifting of horses. I was raised by my uncle Pov, to be one of the Asherib. Ah. Cam kept any hint of pity from his expression. No wonder Mary Penn fought so well. Asherib were hardened fighters down to the bootstraps, designated as warriors of the tribe. Well, that explains your sweet temperament. Cam said. Was that why you chose to stay with the Hathaways after they took you in? Because you no longer wanted to live that way? Yes. You're lying, Frau, Cam said, watching him closely. You stayed for another reason. And Cam knew from the Rom's visible flush that he'd hit upon the truth. Quietly, Cam added, you stayed for her. Chapter Two Twelve Years Earlier There was no softness in him. He'd been raised by his uncle to fight on command. There was no mother to plead for him, no father to intervene in his uncle's harsh punishments. Eventually, Gaja had decided to attack their encampment. There had been gunshots, clubbing, sleeping Roma attacked in their beds, women and children screaming and crying, the camp had been scattered, and everyone had been driven off. The wagons set on fire, many of the horses stolen. Kev had done his best to defend the tribe, until he'd been struck on the head with the butt of a gun. Someone else had stabbed him in the back with a bayonet, and then he'd been left for dead. Alone in the night, he had lain half-conscious by the river, listening to the rush of dark water, 
feeling the chill of hard, wet earth beneath him. With no reason or desire to live, he'd waited without fear for the great wheel to roll into darkness. But as morning had approached, Kev had found himself gathered up and carried away in a small, rustic cart. Agajo had found him and bid a local boy to help carry him into his house. It was the first time Kev had ever been beneath the ceiling of anything other than a Vardo. He'd been too weak to lift a finger in his own defence. The room he occupied was not much bigger than a horse stall, holding only a bed and a chair. There were cushions, pillows, framed needlework on the walls, a lamp with beaded fringe. Had he not been so ill, he would have gone mad in the overstuffed little room. The gajo who had brought him there, Hathaway, was a tall, slender man with pale hair. His diffident manner made Kev hostile. Why had Hathaway saved him? What could he want from a Romany boy? Kev refused to talk to him, and wouldn't take medicine. He rejected any overture of kindness. He owed this man nothing. He hadn't asked to be saved. So he lay there flinching and silent whenever the man changed the bandage on his back. Kev spoke only once, and that was when Hathaway had asked about the tattoo. What's this mark for? It's a curse, Kev said through gritted teeth. Don't mention it to anyone, or the curse will fall on you too. I see. The man's voice was kind. I'll keep your secret, but I don't believe in superstitions. A curse has only as much power as one gives it. Stupid Gajo. Everyone knew denying a curse was very bad luck. It was a noisy household, full of children. Kev could hear them beyond the closed door of the room he had been put in. But there was something else, a faint, sweet presence nearby. He felt it hovering, outside the room, just out of reach. Amid the clamour of children bickering, laughing, singing, he heard a girl's voice that raised every hair on his body. Lovely, soothing. He wanted her to come to him. He willed it as he lay there, his wounds mending slowly. Come to me. But she never appeared. The only ones who entered the room were Hathaway and his wife, a pleasant but wary woman who regarded Kev as if he were dangerous. On one or two occasions, the children came to look at him, peeking around the edge of the partially open door. There were two little girls named Poppy and Beatrix, who squealed with happy fright when he scowled at them. There was another, older daughter, Amelia, who glanced at him with the same sceptical assessment her mother had. And there was a tall, blue-eyed boy, Leo, who looked not much older than Kev himself. I want to make it clear, the boy had said from the doorway, his voice quiet, that no one intends to do you any harm. As soon as you're able to leave, you'll be free to do so. He'd stared at Kev's sullen, feverish face for a moment, before adding, My father is a kind man, but I'm not, so don't even think of hurting or insulting any of my sisters, or you'll answer to me. Kev respected that enough to give Leo a slight nod. He'd begun to accept that this odd little family really didn't mean him harm, nor did they seem to want anything from him. After a week, Kev's fever had eased, and his wound had healed enough for him to move. He woke up early one morning and dressed in the clothes they'd given him. It hurt to move, but Kev ignored the fierce pounding in his head and the jabbing fire in his back. He filled his coat pockets with a candle stub and a sliver of soap. The first light of dawn shone through the little window above the bed. The family would be awake soon. He started for the door, felt dizzy, and half collapsed onto the mattress. Gasping, he tried to collect his strength. There was a tap at the door just before it opened. May I come in? He heard a girl ask softly. Kev's senses were overwhelmed. He closed his eyes, breathing, waiting. It's you. You're here. You've been alone for so long she said as she approached. 
I thought you might want some company. I'm Wynne. Kev drew in the scent and sound of her, his heart pounding. Carefully, he eased to his back, ignoring the pain that shot through him. He opened his eyes. He'd never thought any gaji could compare to Romany girls, but this one was remarkable. An otherworldly creature, her hair moonlight blonde, her features delicate. She gazed at him with tender gravity, and his entire being responded so acutely that he reached out and seized her. She gasped, but held still. Kev knew it wasn't right to touch her. He didn't know how to be gentle. But she relaxed in his hold, staring at him with those pure blue eyes. Why wasn't she afraid of him? Let go, she told him gently. He didn't want to, ever. He wanted to keep her against him and pull her braided hair down and comb his fingers through the pale silk. He wanted to carry her off to the ends of the earth. If I do, he said gruffly, will you stay? Her lips curved in a sweet, delicious smile. Silly boy, of course I'll stay. I've come to visit you. Slowly, his fingers loosened. Lie back, she said. Why are you dressed already? Her eyes widened. Oh, you mustn't leave. Not until you're well. She needn't have worried. Any notion of escaping had disappeared the second he'd seen her. Kev eased back against the pillows, watching intently as she sat on the chair. She was wearing a pink dress. The edges of it, at the neck and wrists, were trimmed with little ruffles. What's your name? she asked. Kev hated talking, hated making conversation, but he was willing to do anything to keep her with him. Mary Penn. Is that your first name? No. Winifred tilted her head to the side. Won't you tell it to me? He shook his head. He could only share his true name with another Rom. At least tell me the first letter, she coaxed. At his silence, she ventured. I don't know many Romany names, she said. Is it Luca? Marco? Stefan? He realized she was teasing him. He didn't know how to respond. Usually, if someone tried to tease him, he responded by sinking his fist into the offender's face. Some day you'll tell me, she said with a little grin. She made a move, as if to rise from the chair, and Kev's hand shot out to take her arm. Surprise flickered across her face. You said you'd stay, he said gruffly. Her free hand came to the one clamped around her wrist. I will. Be at ease, Mary Penn. I'm only going to fetch some bread and tea for us. Let go and I'll come right back. Her palm was light and warm as it rubbed over his hand. I'll stay all day if you wish. They won't let you. Oh, yes, they will. She coaxed his hand to loosen, gently prying at his fingers. Don't be so anxious. My goodness, I thought Roma was supposed to be merry. She almost made him smile. I've had a bad week, he told her gravely. Yes, I can see that. How did you come to be hurt? Gaja attacked my tribe. They may come for me here. He released her carefully. I'm not safe. I should go. No one would dare take you away from us. My father is a respected man in the village. A scholar. Seeing Mary Penn's doubtful expression, she added, The pen is mightier than the sword, you know. That was something only Gaja would say. It made no sense at all. The men who attacked me last week weren't armed with pens. Poor thing, she said compassionately. Your wounds must hurt after all this moving about. I'll fetch some tonic. Kev had never been the object of sympathy before, his pride bristled as he watched her go to the door. He was certain she wouldn't come back, and he wanted her near him so badly. So he fixed her with a sullen stare and muttered, Go then. Devil take you. Winifred paused at the doorway, 
and glanced over her shoulder with a quizzical grin. Don't be cross. I'll come back with bread and tea and a book, and I'll stay as long as it takes to have a smile from you. I never smile, he told her. Much to his surprise, Wynne did return. She spent the better part of a day reading to him. Some dull and wordy story that made him drowsy with contentment. No music, no rustling of trees in the forest, no birdsong had ever pleased him as much as her voice. Occasionally, another family member came to the doorway, but Kev couldn't bring himself to snap at any of them. He couldn't seem to hate anyone when he was so close to happiness. The next day, the Hathaways brought him to the main room in the cottage, a parlour filled with worn furniture. Every available surface was covered with sketches, needlework, and piles of books. While Kev half reclined on the sofa, the smaller girls played on the carpet nearby, trying to teach tricks to Beatrix's pet squirrel. Leo and his father played chess in the corner. Amelia and her mother cooked in the kitchen. Wynne sat close to Kev and combed the tangles from his hair with great care. Hold still. I'm trying to be... Oh, do stop flinching. Your head can't possibly be that sensitive. Kev wasn't flinching because of the tangles or the comb. It was because he'd never been touched for so long by anyone in his life. But as he glanced around the room, it seemed no one minded or cared about what Wynne was doing. He settled back with slitted eyes. The comb tugged a little too hard, and Wynne murmured an apology and rubbed the smarting spot with her fingertips, so gently. It made his throat tight and his eyes sting. He held still, hardly able to breathe for the pleasure she gave him. Next came a cloth draped around his neck, and the scissors. I'm very good at this, Wynne said, pushing his head forward and combing the locks at the back of his neck. And your hair badly needs cutting. There's enough wool on your head to stuff a mattress. Beware, lad, Mr. Hathaway said cheerfully. Recollect what happened to Samson. Kev's head lifted. What? Wynne pushed it back down. Samson's hair was his source of strength, she said. After Delilah cut it, he turned weak and was captured by the Philistines. Haven't you read the Bible? Poppy asked. No, Kev said. He held still as the scissors bit carefully through the thick waves at his nape. Oh, how pretty! The little girl, Beatrix, exclaimed. May I have it, Wynne? No, Mary Penn said gruffly, his head still bent. Why not? Beatrix asked. Someone could use it to make a bad luck charm, or a love spell. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Beatrix said earnestly. I just want to line a nest with it. Never mind, darling, Wynne said serenely. If it makes our friend uncomfortable, your pets will have to make do with some other nesting material. The scissors snipped through another heavy black swathe. Kev was quiet, listening to the family talk while Wynne cut his hair. It was the oddest conversation he'd ever heard. They moved from one subject to another, debating ideas that didn't apply to them, situations that didn't affect them. There was no point to any of it, but they seemed to enjoy themselves tremendously. He had never known people like this existed. He had no idea how they'd survived this long. The Hathaways were an unworldly lot, eccentric and cheerful, and preoccupied with books and art and music. They lived in a ramshackle cottage, but instead of repairing door frames or holes in the ceiling, they pruned roses and wrote poetry. If a chair leg broke off, they merely wedged a stack of books beneath it. Their priorities bewildered him. He was further mystified when, after his wounds had healed sufficiently, they invited him to make a room for himself in the stable loft. Kev began to take care of the things the Hathaways paid no attention to, such as repairing the holes in the ceiling and the decaying joints beneath the chimney stack. Despite his terror of heights, he did new coat work on the thatched roof. He took care of the horse and the cow, and tended the kitchen garden, and even mended the family's shoes. 
Soon, Mrs. Hathaway trusted him to take money to the village to buy food and other necessities. There was only one time his presence at the Hathaway cottage had seemed in jeopardy, the time he'd been caught fighting some village toughs. Mrs. Hathaway had been alarmed by the sight of him, battered and bloody-nosed, and demanded to know how it had happened. I sent you to fetch a round from the cheesemaker, and you come home empty-handed and in such a condition, she'd cried. Whom were you fighting, and why? Kev hadn't explained, only stood grim-faced at the door as she berated him. I won't tolerate brutality in this household, Mrs. Hathaway had continued. Perhaps you should collect your things and leave. But before Kev had been able to obey, Wynne had entered the house. No, mother, she'd said calmly. I know what happened. My friend Laura just told me. Her brother was there. Mary Penn was defending our family. Two other boys were shouting insults about the Hathaways, and Mary Penn thrashed them for it. What insults? Mrs. Hathaway had asked, bewildered. Kev had stared hard at the floor with his fists clenched. Wynne hadn't flinched from the truth. They're criticizing our family, she'd said, because we're harboring a rom. Some of the villagers don't like it. They're afraid Mary Penn might steal from them, or put curses on people or other such nonsense. They blame us for taking him in. In the silence that followed, Kev trembled with anger and a sense of defeat. He was a liability to the family. He would never be able to live among Gaja without conflict. I'll go, he said. It was the best thing he could do for them. You most certainly will not, Mrs. Hathaway had astonished him by saying. What would it teach my children to let such ignorance and despicable prejudice prevail? No, you'll stay. But you mustn't fight, Mary Penn. Ignore them, and they'll eventually lose interest in taunting us. A new voice had entered the conversation. If he stays, Leo had remarked, coming into the kitchen, he'll most certainly have to fight, mother. Like Kev, Leo had looked much the worse for wear, with a blackened eye and a split lip. He gave a crooked grin at his mother's and sister's exclamations. Still smiling, he glanced at Kev. I thrashed one or two of the fellows you overlooked, he said. Oh, dear, Mrs. Hathaway had said sorrowfully, taking her son's hand, which had been bruised and bleeding from a gash where he must have caught someone's tooth with a knuckle. These are hands meant for holding books, not fighting. I like to think I can manage both, Leo had said dryly. His expression turned serious as he gazed at Kev. I'll be damned if anyone will tell me who may live in my home. As long as you wish to stay, Mary Penn, I'll defend you as a brother. I don't want to make trouble for you, Kev had muttered. No trouble, Leo had replied, gingerly flexing his hand. After all, some principles are worth standing up for. Chapter 3 Constant exposure to the Hathaways had changed Kev. He'd spent years listening to their discussions about Shakespeare, Galileo, Flemish art versus Venetian, democracy and monarchy and theocracy, and every other imaginable subject. He'd learned to read, and had even acquired some Latin. He had changed into someone his former self would have had a difficult time recognising. Kev had never come to think of Mr. and Mrs. Hathaway as parents, although he would have done anything for them. He had no desire to form attachments to people. That would have required more trust and intimacy than he could summon. But he did care for all the Hathaway brood, even Leo. And then there was Wynne, for whom he would have died a thousand times over. He would never dare assume a place in her life other than as a protector— she was too fine, too rare. As she grew into womanhood, every man in the county was enthralled by her beauty. Outsiders viewed Wynne as an ice maiden, but they knew nothing of the sly wit and warmth that lurked beneath her perfect facade. Outsiders hadn't seen Wynne teaching Poppy the steps to a quadrille until they'd both collapsed to the floor in giggles. 
or the time she'd gone frog hunting with Beatrix and returned covered in mud and grass. Kev loved her. Not in the way that novelists and poets described. Nothing so tame. He loved her beyond earth, heaven, or hell. Every moment out of her company was agony. Every moment with her was the only peace he had ever known. Every touch of her hands was a sensation that ate down to his soul. He would have died before admitting it to anyone. The truth was buried deep in his heart. There, Wynne said one day, after they had rambled through dry meadows and settled to rest in their favourite place. You're almost doing it. Almost doing what? Kev asked lazily. They reclined by a clump of trees, bordering a stream that ran dry in the summer months. The grass was littered with purple rampion and white meadow sweet, the latter spreading an almond-like fragrance through the air. Smiling, she lifted on her elbows beside him and touched his lips with her fingertips. Kev stopped breathing. A pipit rose from a nearby tree on taut wings, drawing out a long note. Intent on her task, Wynne shaped the corners of Kev's mouth upward and tried to hold them there. Aroused and amused, Kev let out a smothered laugh and brushed her hand away. You should smile more often, Wynne said, staring down at him. You're very handsome when you do. She was more dazzling than the sun. At first, her gaze seemed like nothing more than friendly inquiry, but as it held on his, he realized she was trying to read his thoughts. He wanted to pull her down with him and cover her body with his. It had been four years since he had come to live with the Hathaways. Now he was finding it more and more difficult to control his feelings for Wynne. What are you thinking when you look at me like that? she asked softly. I can't say. Why not? Kev felt the smile hovering on his lips again, this time edged with wryness. It might frighten you. Don't be such a silly, she frowned. Are you ever going to tell me your first name? No. I'll make you. She pretended to beat his chest with her fists. Kev caught her slim wrists in his hands, restraining her easily. His body followed the motion, rolling to trap her beneath him. It was wrong, but he couldn't stop himself. As he pinned her with his weight, felt her wriggle instinctively to accommodate him, he was almost paralysed by the pleasure of it. He expected her to struggle, but she went passive in his hold, smiling up at him. Dimly, Kev remembered one of the mythology stories the Hathaways were so fond of, the Greek one about Hades the god of the underworld, kidnapping the maiden Persephone in a flowery field and dragging her down through an opening in the earth, down to the dark, private world where he could possess her. I don't see why eating a mere half-dozen pomegranate seeds should have condemned Persephone to stay with Hades part of every year, Poppy had said in outrage. No one told her the rules. It wasn't fair. I'm certain she would never have touched a thing had she known what would happen. And it wasn't a very filling snack, Beatrix had added, perturbed. If I'd been there, I would have asked for a pudding or a jam pasty at least. Perhaps she wasn't altogether unhappy, having to stay, Wynne had suggested, her eyes twinkling. After all, Hades did make her his queen, and the story says he possessed the riches of the earth. A rich husband, Amelia had said, doesn't change the fact that Persephone's main residence is in an undesirable location with no view whatsoever. Just think of the difficulties in leasing it out during the off months. They had all agreed that Hades was a complete villain, but Kev had understood exactly why the underworld god had stolen Persephone for his bride. He had wanted a little bit of sunshine of warmth for himself, down in the cheerless gloom of his dark palace. So, Roma you haven't even met, Wynne said, bringing Kev's thoughts back to the present. They might be allowed to know your name, but I wouldn't. That's right. Kev watched the brindling of sun and leaf shadows on her face. 
He wondered how it would feel to press his lips to that soft, light-tricked skin. A delectable notch appeared between Wynne's tawny brows. Why? Why can't I know? Because you're a gaji. His tone was more tender than he had meant it to be. You're gaji. At this foray into dangerous territory, Kev felt his heart contract painfully. He rolled off her, rising to his feet. It's time to go back, he said curtly. He reached down for her, gripped her small extended hand, and hauled her upward. She didn't check the momentum, but instead let herself fall naturally against him. Her skirts fluttered around his legs, and the slim, feminine shape of her body pressed all along his front. Desperately, he searched for the strength, the will, to push her away. Will you ever try to find your tribe, Mary Penn? she asked. Will you ever go away from me? Never, he thought in a flash of ardent need. But instead, he said, I don't know. If you did, I would follow you, and I'd bring you back home. I doubt the man you marry would allow that. Wynne smiled, as if the statement were ridiculous. She eased herself away and let go of his hand. They began the walk back to Hampshire House in silence. Tobar, she suggested after a moment. Garadan? Palo? No. Rye? No. Cooper? Stanley? No. To the pride of the entire Hathaway family, Leo was accepted at the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, where he studied art and architecture for two years. So promising was Leo's talent that part of his tuition was assumed by the renowned London architect Roland Temple, who said Leo could repay him by working as his draftsman upon returning. Few would have argued that Leo had matured into a steady and good-natured young man, with a keen wit and a ready laugh. And in light of his talent, there were few limits to his future. Upon his return to England, Leo took up residence in London to fulfil his obligation to Temple, but he frequently visited his family at Primrose Place. On these occasions, he also courted a pretty, dark-haired village girl named Laura Dillard. During Leo's absence, Kev had done his best to take care of the family, Mr. Hathaway had tried on more than one occasion to help Kev plan a separate future for himself, but those conversations had turned out to be an exercise in frustration for them both. You're being wasted, Mr. Hathaway had told Kev, looking mildly troubled. Kev had snorted at that, but the man had persisted. We must consider your future. Before you say a word, let me state that I'm aware you came from a different culture and your perspectives are often different from mine. But I feel it's my duty to make you aware that in staying here, you're sacrificing many opportunities for self-improvement and success. Do you want me to leave? Kev asked quietly. Heavens, no, not at all. As I've said before, you may stay with us as long as you wish. You'll always have a home and family here. But while you're young, you should go out into the world as Leo has, take an apprenticeship, learn a trade, perhaps enlist in the military. What would I get from that? Kev had asked. To start with, the ability to earn more than the pittance I'm able to give you. I don't need money. You'll need it if you want to marry some day, or buy your own plot of land, to I don't want to marry, and I can't own land. No one can. In the eyes of the British government, Mary Penn, a man most certainly can own land, and a house upon it. The tent shall stand when the palace shall fall, Kev had replied prosaically. Hathaway had let out an exasperated chuckle. <laughs> I'd rather argue with a hundred scholars, he had told Kev, than with one rom. Very well, we'll let the matter rest for now. But bear in mind, Mary Penn, a man must make his mark on the world. Why? Kev asked in genuine bewilderment, but Hathaway had already gone to join his wife in the rose garden. Approximately a year after Leo had returned from Paris, 
tragedy struck the Hathaway family. Until then, none of them had ever known true sorrow, fear, or grief. They'd lived in what had seemed to be a magically protected family circle. But Mr. Hathaway complained of odd, sharp pains in his chest one evening, leading his wife to conclude he was suffering dyspepsia after a particularly rich supper. He went to bed early, quiet and grey-faced. No more was heard from their room until daybreak, when Mrs. Hathaway came out weeping and told the stunned family that their father was dead. And that was only the beginning of the Hathaway's misfortune. It seemed the family had fallen under a curse, in which the full measure of their former happiness had been converted to sorrow. "'Trouble comes in threes, was one of the sayings Mary Penn remembered from his childhood, and, to his bitter regret, it proved to be true. Mrs. Hathaway was so overcome by grief that she took to her bed after her husband's funeral. The melancholy was too pervasive for her to eat or drink. None of her children's attempts to bring her back to her usual self were effective. In a startlingly short time, she had wasted away to almost nothing. Is it possible to die of a broken heart? Leo asked one evening, after the doctor had left, with the pronouncement that he could discern no physical cause of their mother's decline. She should want to live for Poppy and Beatrix at least, Amelia said, keeping her voice low. At that moment, Poppy was putting Beatrix to bed in another room. They're still too young to be without a mother. No matter how long I had to live with a broken heart, I would force myself to do it, if only to take care of them. But you have a core of steel, Wynne said, patting her older sister's back. You draw from your own supply of strength. I'm afraid Mother has always drawn hers from Father. She glanced at Mary Penn with despairing blue eyes. Mary Penn, what would Roma prescribe for melancholy? How would they view this? Kev shook his head, switching his gaze to the hearth. They would leave her alone. Excessive grief tempts the dead to come back and haunt the living. All four were silent then, listening to the hiss and snap of the small fire. She wants to be with father. Wherever he is gone, Wynne said eventually, her heart is broken. I wish it weren't. I'd exchange my life, my heart for hers, if such a trade were possible. I wish... She broke off with a quick breath as Kev's hand closed over her arm. He hadn't been aware of reaching out for her, but her words had provoked him irrationally. She was tempting fate. Don't say that, he muttered. Why not? she whispered. Because it wasn't hers to give. Your heart is mine, he thought. It belongs to me. And though he hadn't said the words aloud, it seemed somehow that Wynne had heard them. Her eyes widened, darkened, and a flush of strong emotion rose in her face. Right there, in the presence of her brother and sister, she lowered her head and pressed her cheek to the back of Kev's hand. Kev longed to comfort her, envelop her with kisses, surround her with his strength. Instead, he released her arm carefully and risked a wary glance at Amelia and Leo. The former had picked up a few pieces of kindling from the hearthside basket and was occupying herself by feeding them to the fire. The latter was watching Wynne intently. Less than six months after her husband's death, Mrs. Hathaway was laid to rest beside him, and before the siblings could begin to accept that they had been orphaned with such cruel swiftness, the third tragedy occurred. Mary Penn. Wynne stood at the front threshold of the cottage, hesitating to come in. There was such a queer look on her face that Kev rose to his feet at once. He was bone-weary and dirty having just come in from working all day at a neighbor's house, building a gate and fence around their yard. To set the fence posts, Kev had dug holes in ground that had already been permeated with the frost of approaching winter. He had just sat down at the table with Amelia, who was attempting to clean spots from one of Poppy's dresses with a quill dipped in spirit of turpentine. 
The scent of the chemical burned in Kev's nostrils as he drew in a quick breath. He knew from Wynne's expression that something was very wrong. I've been with Laura and Leo today, Wynne said. Laura took ill this morning. She said her throat hurt, and her head, and so we took her home at once, and her family sent for the doctor. He said it was scarlet fever. Oh, God, Amelia breathed, the colour draining from her face. The three of them were silent with shared horror. There was no other fever that burned so violently or spread so quickly. It provoked a brilliant red rash from the skin, imparting a fine, gritty texture, like the glass paper used to smooth pieces of wood, and it burned and ravaged its way through the body until the organs failed. The disease lingered in the expired air, in locks of hair, on the skin itself. The only way to protect others was to isolate the patient. Was he certain? Kev asked in a controlled voice. Yes, he said the signs are unmistakable. And he said... Wynne broke off as Kev strode toward her. No, Mary Penn! And she held up a slim, white hand with such desperate authority that it stopped him in his tracks. No one must come near me. Leo is at Laura's house. He won't leave her. They said it was all right for him to stay, and... You must gather up Poppy and Beatrix, and Amelia too, and take them to our cousins in Hedgerley. They won't like it, but they'll take them in and... I'm not going anywhere, Amelia said, her manner calm, even though she was trembling slightly. If you have the fever, you'll need me to take care of you. But if you should catch it... I had a mild bout of it when I was a child. That means I'm probably safe from it now. What about Leo? I'm afraid he didn't have it, which may put him in danger. Amelia glanced at Kev. Mary Penn, did you ever... I don't know. Then you should stay away with the children until this is over. Will you go collect them? They went out to play at the Winterbourne. I'll pack their things. Kev found it nearly impossible to leave Wynne when she might be ill. But there was no choice. Someone had to take her sisters to a safe place. Before an hour had passed, Kev had found Beatrix and Poppy, loaded the bewildered girls into the family carriage, and taken them on a half-day journey to Hedgerley. By the time he'd settled them with their cousins and returned to the cottage, it was past midnight. Amelia was in the parlour, wearing her night clothes and dressing robe, with her hair trailing down her back in a long braid. She sat before the fire, her shoulders hunched inward, she looked up with surprise as Kev entered the house. You shouldn't be here. The danger. How is she? Kev interrupted. Any sign of fever yet? Chills, pains, no rise in temperature as far as I can tell. Perhaps that's a good sign. Perhaps that means she'll only have a mild case. Any word from the Dillards? From Leo? Amelia shook her head. Wynne said he meant to sleep in the parlour and sit with her whenever they would allow it. It isn't at all proper, but if Laura... Well, if she doesn't live through this... Amelia's voice thickened, and she paused to swallow back tears. They wouldn't want to deprive Laura of her last moments with the man she loves. Kev sat nearby, and silently sorted through platitudes he'd heard people say at difficult times. Things about endurance and accepting the Almighty's will, and about worlds far better than this one. He couldn't bring himself to repeat any of it to Amelia. Her grief was too honest, her love for her family too real. It's too much, he heard Amelia whisper after a while. I can't bear losing anyone else. I'm so afraid for Wynne. I'm afraid for Leo. She rubbed her forehead. I sound like the rankest coward, don't I? Kev shook his head. You'd be a fool not to be afraid. That elicited a small, dry chuckle. I'm definitely not a fool, then. By morning, Wynne was flushed and feverish, her legs moving restlessly beneath the covers. Kev went to a window and drew open the curtain, admitting the weak light of dawn. She awakened as he approached the bed, her blue eyes wide in her red, burnished face. No, 
she croaked, trying to shrink away from him. You're not supposed to be here. Don't come near me. You'll catch it. Please go. Quiet, Kev said, sitting on the edge of the mattress. He caught Wynne as she tried to roll away and settled his hand on her forehead. He felt the burning pulse beneath her fragile skin, the veins lit with raging fever. As Wynne struggled to push him away, Kev was alarmed by how feeble she had grown already. Don't, she sobbed, writhing. Weak tears slid from her eyes. Please don't touch me. I don't want you here. I don't want you to get sick. Oh, please go. Kev pulled her up against him, her body living flame beneath the thin layer of her nightgown, the pale silk of her hair streaming over both of them. And he cradled her head in one of his hands, the powerful, battered hand of a bare-knuckle fighter. You're mad, he said in a low voice. If you think I'd leave you now, I'll see you safe and well no matter what it takes. I'm going to die, she whispered, and I won't take you with me. Kev was shocked by the words, and even more by his own reaction to them. He gripped her more closely, letting her fitful breaths blow against his face. No matter how she writhed, he wouldn't let go. He breathed the air from her, taking it deep into his own lungs. Stop, she cried, trying desperately to twist away from him. The exertion caused her flush to darken. This is madness. Oh, you stubborn idiot, let me go. Never. Kev smoothed her wild, fine hair, the strands darkening where her tears had tracked. Easy, he murmured. Don't exhaust yourself. Rest. Wynne's struggles slowed as she recognized the futility of resisting him. You're so strong, she said faintly, the words born not of praise, but hopeless fury. You're so strong. Yes, Kev said, gently using a corner of the bed linens to dry her face. I'm a brute, and you've always known it, haven't you? Yes, she whispered, and you're going to do as I say. He cradled her against his chest and gave her some water. You're going to let me take care of you. I won't let you die. She took a few painful sips. Can't, she managed, turning her face away. More, he insisted, bringing the cup back to her lips. Let me sleep, please. After you drink this. Kev wouldn't relent until she obeyed with a moan. Settling her back into the pillows, he let her drowse for a few minutes, then returned with a dish of toast softened in broth. He bullied her into taking a few spoonfuls. By that time, Amelia had awakened, and she came into Wynne's room. A quick double blink was Amelia's only reaction to the sight of Wynne leaning back against Kev's arm while he fed her. Get rid of him, Wynne told her sister hoarsely, her head resting on Kev's shoulder. Mary Penn, you fiend, Amelia said in a conversational tone, coming to stand at the bedside. She patted his shoulder affectionately as she continued, sneaking into an unsuspecting girl's room to feed her soggy toast. The rush has started, Kev said, noting the roughness that was rising up Wynne's throat and cheeks. Her silken skin had turned sandy and red, he felt Amelia's hand clench in a loose fold of his shirt, as if she needed to hold on to him for balance. But Amelia's voice was light and steady. I'll mix a solution of soda water. That should soothe the rawness, dear. Kev felt a surge of admiration for Amelia. No matter what disasters came her way, she was willing to meet all challenges. Of all the Hathaways, she had shown the toughest metal so far— but Wynne would have to be even stronger and more obstinate if she was to survive the days to come. While you bathe her, he told Amelia, I'll fetch the doctor. Not that he had any faith in a gajo doctor, but it might give the sisters peace of mind. Kev also wanted to see how Leo and Laura were faring. After relinquishing Wynne to Amelia's care, 
Kev went to the Dillard's home, but the maid who answered the door told him that Leah wasn't available. He's in there with Miss Laura, the maid said brokenly, blotting her face with a rag. She knows no one. She's near insensible. She's failing fast, sir. Kev felt the traction of his short, pared nails against the tough skin of his palms. Wynne was less robust than Laura Dillard, less sturdy in form and constitution. If Laura had sunk so fast, it hardly seemed possible Wynne would be able to withstand the same fever. His next thought was about Leo, who loved Laura Dillard with an intensity that wouldn't allow him to accept her death rationally, if at all. What is Mr. Hathaway's condition? Kev asked. Does he show any sign of the illness? I don't think so, sir. I don't know. But from the way her watery gaze slid away from his, Kev understood that Leo wasn't well. He wanted to take Leo away from the death watch now and put him to bed to preserve his strength for the days to come. But it would be cruel to deny Leo the last hours with the woman he loved. When she passes, Kev said bluntly, send him home, but don't let him go alone. Have someone accompany him all the way to the doorstep of the Hathaway cottage. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Two days later, Leo came home. Laura's dead, he said, and collapsed in a delirium of fever and grief. Chapter Four the scarlet fever that swept the village was a particularly virulent strain, most deadly to the very young and the old. There weren't enough doctors to tend the ailing, and no one outside Primrose Place dared come. After visiting the cottage to examine the two patients, the exhausted village doctor had prescribed hot vinegar poultices for the throat and left a tonic containing tincture of aconite. It had no effect on either Wynne or Leo. We're not doing enough, Amelia said on the fourth day. Neither she nor Kev had had enough sleep, both of them taking turns caring for the ailing brother and sister. She came into the kitchen, where Kev was boiling water for tea. The only thing we've accomplished so far is make their declines more comfortable. There must be something that can break the fever. I won't let this happen. She'd looked so vulnerable that Kev was moved to compassion. He wasn't comfortable with touching other people, or being touched, but a brotherly feeling caused him to step toward her. No, Amelia said quickly, as she realized he was about to reach out to her. Taking a step back, she gave a strong shake of her head. Thank you, but I... I'm not the kind of woman who can lean on anyone. I would fall to pieces. Kev understood. For people like her, and himself... Closeness meant too much. What's to be done? Amelia whispered, wrapping her arms around herself. Kev rubbed his weary eyes. Have you heard of a plant called deadly nightshade? No. Amelia was only familiar with herbs used for cooking. It only blooms at night. When the sun comes up, the flowers die. There was a drabengro, a man of poison in my tribe. Sometimes he sent me to find the plants that were difficult to find. He told me deadly nightshade was the most powerful herb he knew of. It could kill a man, but it could also bring someone back from the brink of death. Did you ever see it work? Kev nodded, giving her a sidelong glance as he rubbed the taut muscles at the back of his neck. I saw it cure fever once, he muttered, and he waited. Find some, Amelia finally said, her voice unsteady. It may prove to be fatal, but they're both sure to die without it. Kev boiled the plants, which he had found in the corner of the village graveyard, down to thin black syrup. Amelia stood beside him as he strained the deadly broth and poured it into a small egg cup. Leo first, Amelia said resolutely, though her expression was doubt-ridden. He's worse off than Wynne. They went to Leo's bedside. It was astonishing how quickly a man could deteriorate from scarlet fever, how emaciated their strapping brother had become. 
Leo was unrecognizable, his formerly handsome face swollen and discolored. His last coherent words had been the day before, when he'd begged Kev to let him die. His wish would soon be granted. From all appearances, a coma was only hours, if not minutes, away. Amelia went to a window and opened it, letting the cold air sweep away the stench of vinegar. Leo moaned and stirred feebly, unable to resist, as Kev forced his mouth open, lifted a spoon, and poured four or five drops of the tincture onto his dry, fissured tongue. Amelia went to sit beside her brother, smoothing his dull hair, kissing his brow. If it was going to... to have an adverse effect, she said, when Kev knew she meant if it was going to kill him, how long would it take? Five minutes to an hour. Kev saw the way Amelia's hand shook as she continued to smooth Leo's hair. It seemed the longest hour of Kev's life as they sat and watched Leo, who moved and muttered as if he was in the middle of a nightmare. Poor boy, Amelia murmured, running a cool rag over his face. When they were certain no convulsions were forthcoming, Kev retrieved the egg cup and stood. You're going to give it to Wynne now? Amelia asked, still looking down at her brother. Yes. Do you need help? Kev shook his head. Stay with Leo. He went to Wynne's room. She was still and quiet on the bed. She no longer recognized him, her mind and body consumed in the red heat of fever. As he lifted her and let her head fall back on his arm, she moaned in protest. Win, he said softly. Love, be still. Her eyes slitted open at the sound of his voice. I'm here, he whispered. He picked up a spoon and dipped it into the cup. Open your mouth, little Gudgy. Do it for me. But she refused. She turned her face, and her lips moved in a soundless whisper. What is it? he murmured, easing her head back. Win, you must take this medicine, she whispered again. Comprehending the scratchy words, Kev stared at her in amazement. You'll take it if I tell you my name. She struggled to produce enough saliva to speak and settled for a nod. His throat got tighter and tighter, and the corners of his eyes burned. It's Kev he managed to say. My name is Kev. She let him put the spoon between her lips then, and the inky poison trickled down her throat. Her body relaxed against him. As he continued to hold her, the fragile body felt as light and hot as flame in his arms. I will follow you, he thought, whatever your fate is. Wynne was the only thing on earth he had ever wanted. She wouldn't leave without him. Kev bent over her and touched the dry, hot lips with his own, a kiss she could not feel and would never remember. He tasted the poison as he let his mouth linger on hers. Lifting his head, he glanced at the bedside table where he had set the remainder of the deadly nightshade. There was more than enough left to kill a healthy man. It seemed as if the only thing that kept Wynne's spirit from leaving her body was the confinement of Kev's arms. He held her and rocked her and thought briefly of praying. But no, he wouldn't acknowledge any being, supernatural or mortal, who threatened to take her from him. The world had become this quiet, shadowed room, the slender body in his arms, the breath that filtered softly in and out of her lungs, he followed that rhythm with his own breath, his own heartbeat. Leaning back against the bed, he fell into a dark, drowsing trance as he waited for their shared fate. Unaware of how much time had passed, he rested with her, until a movement in the doorway and a glow of light awakened him. Mary Penn, Amelia's husky voice. She held a candle at the threshold. Kev felt blindly for Wynne's cheek, laid his hand along the side of her face, and felt a thrill of panic as his fingers met cool skin. He felt for the pulse in her throat. Leo's fever has broken, 
Amelia said. Kev could barely hear her over the blood rush in his ears. He's going to be well. A weak but steady throb lay beneath Kev's searching fingertips. Wind's heartbeat, the pulse that sustained his universe. Chapter 5 London, 1849 As the de facto head of the family, Cam Rowan wielded his authority with a mixture of patience and relaxed charm that turned out to be perfect for managing Hathaways. He was a steady and calming presence, a man who liked to solve problems and never seemed intimidated by anything. The girls adored him and Amelia was so dazzled and in love she could hardly see straight. None of them had ever met anyone quite like Rowan, whose origins were as mysterious as Kev's. For most of his life, Rowan had worked at a gentleman's gaming club, Jenner's, eventually becoming a factotum and then owning a small interest in the business. Burdened with a growing fortune, he had invested it as badly as possible to spare himself the embarrassment of being a rom with money. It hadn't worked. The money kept coming, every foolish investment returning nearly miraculous dividends. Rowan sheepishly referred to it as his good luck curse. As it turned out, the surfeit of good luck was useful, since taking care of the Hathaways was an expensive proposition. The Ramsey estate in Hampshire which Leo had inherited last year, along with his title, had burned down recently and was being rebuilt. And Poppy needed clothes for her London season, and Beatrix wanted to go to finishing school. On top of that, there were Wynne's clinic bills. Rowan was in a position to help the Hathaways a great deal, and for their sake, Kev would tolerate him. Privately, however, he found Rowan to be obnoxiously suave and silver-tongued not to mention far too sure of himself. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered, now that Wynne had gone to France. He was always filled with a bleak awareness that she was far away, and he couldn't reach her. And yet the Hathaways all seemed to expect him to behave as usual, to take part in the family routine, to pretend the earth had gone on spinning. Good morning, Cam said cheerfully coming into the dining area of the family suite at the Rutledge Hotel. They were already halfway through breakfast. Unlike the rest of them, Rowan was not an early riser, having spent most of his life in a gambling club where there was activity at all hours of the night. Cam cut a strikingly handsome figure, with dark hair worn a shade too long and a diamond stud sparkling in one ear. He was lean and supple, with an easy way of moving. Before taking the chair next to Amelia, he leaned down to kiss her head, an open display of affection that caused her to colour. There had been a time in the not-too-distant past when Amelia would have disapproved of such demonstrations. Now she merely blushed and looked bemused. Kev scowled down at his half-finished plate. "'Are you still sleepy?' he heard Amelia ask her husband. "'At this rate, I won't be fully awake until noon.' You should try some coffee. No, thank you. I can't abide the stuff. Beatrix spoke then. Mary Penn drinks coffee. He loves it. Naturally, Cam said. It's dark and bitter. He grinned as Kev gave him a warning glance. Amelia deliberately changed the conversation, asking her husband about his latest investment. It had become something of a game, for Cam to find an investment opportunity that wouldn't succeed. The last time he'd tried it, he bought a London rubber manufactory that was failing badly. As soon as Cam had purchased it, however, the company had acquired patent rights for vulcanization and invented something called the rubber band. Now people were buying millions of the things. This one is sure to be a disaster, Cam was saying. There is a pair of brothers both of them blacksmiths, who have come up with a design for a man-powered vehicle. They call it a velocipede. Two wheels set on a steel frame, propelled by treadles you work with your feet. Only two wheels? Poppy asked, perplexed. 
How could one ride it without falling over? The driver would have to balance his centre of mass over the wheels. How would one turn the vehicle? More importantly, Amelia said in a dry tone, how would one stop it? By the application of one's body to the ground, Poppy suggested. Cam laughed. Probably. We'll put it into production, of course. Westcliff says he's never seen a more disastrous investment. The velocipede looks uncomfortable as the devil and requires balance beyond the abilities of the average man. It won't be affordable or practical. After all, no sane man would choose to pedal along the street on a two-wheeled contraption in lieu of riding a horse. It sounds fun, though, Beatrix said wistfully. It's not an invention a girl could try, Poppy pointed out. Why not? Our skirts would get in the way. Why must we wear skirts? Beatrix asked. Trousers look much more comfortable. I'm afraid it would shock people to see women's legs, Amelia said. Why can men show their legs but women can't? Beatrix persisted. Everyone knows they're there. It's not as if we have wheels under our skirts. Looking amused, Amelia picked up a glass of water and raised it in Cam's direction. Well then, here's to your first failure. She raised an eyebrow. I hope you're not risking the entire family fortune before I go to the dressmakers today. He grinned at her. Not the entire fortune. Shop with confidence, Monisha. When breakfast was concluded, the women left the dining table, while Cam and Kev stood politely. Lowering himself back into the chair, Cam watched as Kev began to leave. Will you join me for a moment? he asked lazily. We need to discuss a few things. Kev complied with a scowl. You're a man of few words, aren't you? Cam observed. Better than to fill the air with empty chatter. I'll go straight to the point, then. While Leo, Lord Ramsay, is in Europe, his entire estate, his financial affairs, and three of his sisters have been placed in the care of a pair of Roma. It's not what I'd call an ideal situation. If Leo were in any condition to stay, I would have kept him here and found someone else to accompany Wynne to France. But Leo was not in good condition, as they both knew. He had been a broken man, a wastrel, ever since the death of Laura Dillard. And although he was finally coming to terms with his grief, his path to healing would not be short. Do you actually think Leo will check himself in as a patient at a health clinic? Kev asked curtly. No, but he'll stay close by to keep an eye on Wynne, and it's a remote setting where opportunities for trouble are limited. He did well in France before, when he was studying architecture. Perhaps living there again will recall him to himself. Or, Kev said darkly, he'll disappear to Paris and kill himself with drink and opium. Cam shrugged. Leo's future is in his own hands. My job is to worry about what we're facing here. Amelia wants Poppy to have a season in London, and Beatrix to go to finishing school. In the meantime, the rebuilding of the manor in Hampshire has to continue, and the grounds— I know all that, Kev snapped. Try not to be such a surly ass for just a minute, would you? I'm asking you to manage the Ramsey estate, and work with the architect, the builders, the masons and carpenters, and so forth. Kev glared at him with rank antagonism. I'll be damned if I have to answer to you for anything. Cam's hands lifted in a staying gesture, a scattering of gold rings gleaming richly on his fingers. For God's sake, I'm proposing a partnership. I'm no more thrilled by the prospect than you are, but we have more to gain by working together than being at cross-purposes. You'd have to stay in Hampshire, obviously, but you could come and go as you please. Cam gave him an astute glance. You have nothing keeping you in London, do you? Kev shook his head, considering the proposition. It would be a relief to return to Hampshire. He hated London. The grime and clamour and crowded buildings. The smoke and noise. He missed the green countryside and fresh air and good hearty food. 
and the hard work of rebuilding the manor would do him some good. Besides, he knew what the Ramsay estate needed better than anyone. Cam Rowan might know every street, square, and rookery in London, but he wasn't at all familiar with Hampshire. It only made sense for Kev to take charge of the Ramsay estate. I'll have to make improvements to the land as well, Kev said, setting down the knife. There are field gates and fences that need repair, ditches and drainage channels to be dug. The estate should have its own bakehouse to save the tenants from having to go to the village for their bread. Also, whatever you decide, Cam said hastily, having the typical Londoner's complete lack of interest in farming. Attracting more tenants will benefit the estate, of course. I won't come begging to you for every shilling. I'll need access to the Ramsey accounts, and I'm going to pick the land crews and manage them without interference. Cam's brows lifted at Kev's authoritative manner. Very well. Shall we shake on it? Kev stood, ignoring the overture. Not necessary. Cam's white teeth flashed in a grin. Mary Pen, would it be so terrible to attempt a friendship with me? I'll settle for being enemies with a common purpose. Cam's smile lingered. It's progress, he said with a shrug. He waited until Kev had reached the door, before saying casually, By the way, I'm going to pursue the matter of the tattoos. If there is a connection between the two of us, I want to find out what it is. You'll do so without my cooperation, Kev said stonily. Why not? Aren't you curious? No, I am. Looking troubled, Cam rubbed his arm over his shirt sleeve, where the tattoo was located. When I was about ten years old, my grandmother sent me away from the tribe. She said I was in danger. My cousin Noah brought me to London and helped me to find work at the gambling club as a listmaker's runner. That was the last time I saw anyone from my tribe. Cam paused, his face becoming shadowed. We have two things in common, Fral. We're outcasts, and we both bear the mark of an Irish nightmare horse. And I think finding out where it came from may help us both. Over the following months, Kev prepared the Ramsey estate for reconstruction. A mild winter had descended on the village of Stony Cross and its environs where the Ramsey estate was located. The crews employed by John Dashell, the contractor hired to rebuild the Ramsey Manor, were hard-working and efficient. The first two months were spent clearing the remains of the house, carting off charred wood and broken rock and rubble. A small gatehouse on the approach road was repaired and refurbished for the Hathaway's convenience. Near the end of February, Kev made the twelve-hour journey from Stony Cross to London. He had received word from Amelia that Beatrix had left finishing school precipitately. Although Amelia had said all was well, Kev wanted to make certain for himself. The two-month separation was the longest he had ever been away from the Hathaway sisters, and he was surprised by how intensely he had missed them. It seemed the feeling was mutual. As soon as Kev arrived at their suite at the Rutledge Hotel, Amelia, Poppy, and Beatrix all pounced on him with unseemly enthusiasm. He tolerated their shrieks and kisses with gruff indulgence, secretly pleased by the warmth of their welcome. Following them into the family parlour, Kev sat with Amelia on an overstuffed settee, while Cam Rowan and Poppy occupied nearby chairs. Beatrix perched on a footstool at Kev's feet. The women looked well, all three stylishly dressed and groomed, their dark hair arranged in pinned-up curls, except for Beatrix, who had plaits. Amelia in particular seemed happy, laughing easily and radiating contentment. Poppy was emerging as a beauty, with her fine features and her rich, auburn-toned hair a warmer, more approachable version of Wynne's delicate blonde perfection. Beatrix, however, was subdued and thin. What happened at school? Kev asked with his customary bluntness. Beatrix unburdened herself eagerly. Oh, Mary Pennett was all my fault. 
School is horrid. I abhor it. I did make a friend or two, and I was sorry to leave them, but I didn't get on with my teachers. I was always saying the wrong thing in class, asking too many questions. It appears, Amelia said wryly, the Hathaway method of learning and debating isn't welcome in school. And I got into some rows, Beatrix continued, because some of the girls said their parents told them not to associate with me, because we have gypsies in the family, and for all they knew I might be part gypsy too. And I said I wasn't, but even if I were, it was no cause for shame, and I called them snobs, and then there was a lot of scratching and hair-pulling. Kev swore under his breath. He exchanged glances with Cam, who looked grim. Their presence in the family was a liability to the Hathaway sisters, and yet there was no remedy for that. And then, Beatrix said, my problem came back. Everyone was silent. Kev reached out and settled his hand on her head, his fingers curving over the shape of her skull. Chavi, he murmured, a Romany endearment for a young girl. Since he rarely used the old language, Beatrix gave him a round-eyed look of surprise. Beatrix's problem had first appeared after Mr. Hathaway's death. It recurred every now and then in times of anxiety or distress. She had a compulsion to steal things, usually small things like pencil stubs or bookmarks or the odd piece of flatware. Sometimes she didn't even remember taking an object. Later she would suffer intense remorse and go to extraordinary lengths to return the things she had filched. Kev removed his hand from her head and looked down at her. What did you take, little ferret? he asked gently. She looked chagrined. Hair ribbons, combs, books, small things, and then I tried to put everything back, but I couldn't remember where it all went. So there was a great rumpus, and I came forward to confess, and I was asked to leave the school, and now I'll never be a lady. Yes, you will, Amelia said at once. We're going to hire a governess, which is what we should have done in the beginning. Beatrix regarded her doubtfully. I don't think I would want any governess who would work for our family. Oh, we're not as bad as all that, Amelia began. Yes, we are, Poppy informed her. We are odd, Amelia. I've always told you so. She turned to Kev. No matter how difficult it is to find a proper governess... We must have one. I need help. My season has been a disaster, Mary Penn. It's only been two months, Kev said. How can it be a disaster? I'm a wallflower. No man wants anything to do with me. In fact, I'm lower than a wallflower. A slug on the leaf of a wallflower, Beatrix expounded helpfully. Kev gave an incredulous shake of his head. A beautiful, intelligent girl with a dowry should have been overrun with suitors. What is the matter with these gajos? he asked in amazement. They're all idiots, Cam said. Glancing back at Poppy, Kev asked, Is it because there are Roma in the family? Is that why you're not sought after? Well, that doesn't exactly help, Poppy admitted. But the real problem is that I have no social graces. I make faux pas all the time. And I'm dreadfully awkward at small talk. You're supposed to go lightly from topic to topic like a butterfly. The men who bring themselves to approach me find an excuse to flee after five minutes. I wouldn't want any of them for her anyway, Amelia said crisply. You should see them, Mary Pen. A more useless flock of preening peacocks could not be found. I believe one should call it a muster of peacocks, Poppy said, not a flock. She paused and said glumly, You see, it's that sort of remark gentlemen don't like. Kev frowned, knowing Poppy had always dreamed of a London season. For it to turn out this way must be a crushing disappointment. He turned to Amelia and Cam. What are we going to do about this? We are going to withdraw Poppy from the season, Amelia said, and tell everyone that, on second thought, 
she's still too young to be out in society. No one will believe that, Beatrix said. After all, Poppy's almost nineteen. There's no need to make me sound like a warty old crone bee, Poppy said indignantly. And in the meantime, Amelia continued with great patience, we'll find a governess who'll teach both Poppy and Beatrix how to behave. She'd better be good, Beatrix said, pulling a grunting black and white guinea pig from her pocket and snuggling it under her chin. We have a lot to overcome, don't we, Mr. Nibbles? Later, Amelia took Kev aside. She reached into the pocket of her gown, extracted a small, sealed letter, and gave it to him. This arrived for you. Unable to speak, Kev closed his fingers around the bit of parchment sealed with wax. He went to his hotel room, which was separate from the rest of the family at his request. Sitting at a small table, he broke the seal with scrupulous care. There was Wynne's familiar writing, the pen strokes delicate and precise. Dear Kev, I hope this letter finds you in full health and vigour. I cannot imagine you in any other state, actually. Every morning I awaken in this place, which seems another world entirely, and I'm always surprised to find myself so far away from my family. And you? The journey across the channel was trying, the land route to the clinic even more so. As you know, I'm not a good traveller, but Leo saw me safely here. He's taken up residence as a paying guest at a small chateau nearby, and so far he's come to visit every other day. Wynne's letter went on to describe the clinic, which was quiet and austere. The patients suffered from a variety of ailments, but in particular those of the lung and pulmonary system. Instead of dosing them with narcotic drugs and keeping them inside, Dr. Harrow had put his patients on a regimen of exercise, cold baths, health tonics, and a simple diet. Prescribing exercise for his patients was a controversial treatment, but according to Dr. Harrow, motion was the prevailing instinct of all animal life. The patients started every day with a walk outside, rain or shine, followed by an hour in the gymnasium for activities such as ladder climbing or lifting dumbbells. So far, Wynne could hardly manage any exercises without becoming severely out of breath, but she thought she'd already detected a small improvement in her abilities. Everyone at the clinic was required to practice breathing on a new device called a spirometer, an apparatus for measuring the volume of air inspired and expired by the lungs. There was more about the clinic and the patients, which Kev skimmed over quickly. And then he reached the last paragraphs. Since my illness, I've had the strength to do very little except to love. But that I've done and still do in full measure. I'm sorry for the way I shocked you the morning I left, but I don't regret a single word I said. I'm running after you and life in desperate pursuit. My dream is that some day you will both turn and let me catch you. That dream carries me through every night. I long to tell you so many things, but I'm not free yet. I plan to be well enough some day to shock you again, with far more pleasing results. I've enclosed a hundred kisses in this letter. You must count them out carefully, and not lose any. Yours forever, Win. Flattening the slip of paper on the table, Kev smoothed it and ran his fingertips along the lines of script. He read it twice more. He let his hand close over the parchment, crushing it tightly, before bringing it to his lips. With a single, choking sob, he threw the letter into the hearth. The parchment smouldered and burst into flame, until the whiteness had darkened into ash, and every last word had disappeared. Chapter 6 London 1851. Spring. At long last, Wynne had come home. The clipper from Calais was docked, 
the hold packed with luxury goods, and bags of letters and parcels to be delivered by the Royal Mail. It was a medium-sized ship with seven spacious staterooms for the passengers. Wynne stood on the deck and watched the crew employing the ground tackle to moor the ship. Only then would the passengers be allowed to disembark. Once, the excitement that gripped her would have made it impossible to breathe. But Wynne was returning to London a different woman. Her family had changed as well. Amelia and Cam had been married for two years now, and Poppy and Beatrix were now out in society. And Mary Penn. Wynne's mind shied from thoughts of him, which were too stirring to dwell on in anything other than a private setting. She gazed at her surroundings, the forest of ship masts, the immense warehouses for tobacco, wool and wine. Chimney smoke and coal vapour hazed the air, thickening as night unrolled over the city. Wynne longed to be in Hampshire, where the spring meadows would be green and the hedgerows in bloom. According to Amelia, the restoration of the Ramsey estate wasn't yet complete, but the manor was habitable now. The work had gone with miraculous speed under Mary Penn's direction. The gangplank was lowered from the vessel and secured. As Wynne watched the first few passengers descend to the dock, she saw her brother's tall, almost lanky form leading the way. France had been good for both of them. Whereas Wynne had gained some much-needed weight, Leo had lost his dissipated bloat. He had spent so much time out of doors, walking, painting, swimming, that his dark brown hair had lightened a few shades, and his skin had soaked up sun. His eyes, a striking light shade of blue, were startling in his tanned face. Wynne knew that her brother would never again be the gallant, unguarded boy he had been before Laura Dillard's death. But he was no longer a suicidal wreck, which would no doubt be a relief to the rest of the family. In a relatively short time, Leo bounded back up the gangplank. He came to Wynne with a wry smile, clamping his top hat more firmly on his head. Is anyone waiting for us? Wynne asked eagerly. No. Worry creased her forehead. They didn't receive my letter, then. She and Leo had sent word that they would be arriving a few days earlier than expected, owing to a change in the Clipper Line's schedule. Your letter is probably stuck to the bottom of a Royal Mail satchel somewhere, Leo said. Don't worry, darling. We'll go to the Rutledge by Hackney. It isn't far. But it will be a shock to the family for us to arrive before we're expected. Our family likes to be shocked he said, or at least they're accustomed to it. They'll also be surprised that Dr. Harrow has come with us. I'm sure they won't mind his presence at all, Leo replied. One corner of his mouth twitched in private amusement. Well, most of them won't. Evening had fallen by the time they reached the Rutledge Hotel. Leo arranged for rooms and managed the luggage, while Wynne and Dr. Harrow waited in a corner of the spacious lobby. I'll allow you to reunite with your family in private, Harrow said. My manservant and I will go to our rooms and unpack. You're welcome to come with us, Wynne said, but she was secretly relieved when he shook his head. I won't intrude. Your reunion should be private. But we'll see you in the morning, Wynne asked. Yes. He stood looking down at her, a slight smile on his lips. Dr. Julian Harrow was an elegant man, supernally composed, effortlessly charming. He was dark-haired and grey-eyed, and possessed a square-jawed attractiveness that had caused nearly all of his female patients to fall at least a little in love with him. One of the women at the clinic had remarked dryly that Harrow's personal magnetism not only affected men, women, and children— but also extended to armoires, assorted chairs, and the nearby goldfish in a bowl. As Leo had put it, Harrow doesn't look at all like a doctor. He looks like a woman's fantasy of a doctor. I suspect half his practice consists of love-struck females who prolong their illness merely to continue being treated by him. I assure you, Wynne had said, laughing, I'm neither love-struck, nor am I the least bit inclined to prolong my illness. But she had to admit, it was difficult not to feel something for a man who was attractive, attentive, and had cured her of a debilitating condition, 
and Wynne thought Julian might possibly have feelings for her in return. During the past year, especially when Wynne's health had progressed into full vitality, Julian had begun to treat her as something more than a mere patient. They'd gone on long walks through the impossibly romantic scenery of Provence, and he had flirted with her and made her laugh. His attentions had soothed her wounded spirit after Mary Penn had so callously ignored her. Eventually, Wynne had accepted that the feelings she had for Mary Penn were not reciprocated. She had even cried on Leo's shoulder. Her brother had pointed out that she'd seen practically nothing of the world and knew even less about men. Don't you think it's possible your attachment to Mary Penn was a result of proximity as much as anything else? Leo had asked gently. Let's look at the situation realistically when you two have nothing in common. You're a lovely, sensitive, literate woman, and he's... Mary Penn. He likes to chop wood for entertainment. Granted, it's your right to enjoy a big slab of brawn, if that's to your taste, but you can't spend all your time in bed. Shocked out of her tears, Wynne had asked, Are you suggesting my feelings for Mary Penn are only physical? They're certainly not intellectual, Leo had said, and grinned as she punched him in the shoulder. Upon reflection, however, Wynne had to admit that Leo wasn't entirely wrong. Mary Penn was keenly intelligent, with an impeccable memory, but he didn't have a scholarly bent. He was far too interested in the world around him, too vigorous and active to lose himself in books for hours at a time. When he did read, it was to acquire knowledge, not to ponder philosophical questions. There was so much to love about him, his strength, his tenderness, his intrinsic sense of honour. He was responsible and hard-working, with a dry sense of humour. And yes, he happened to be a stallion of a man with a magnificent physique. She wasn't going to apologise for liking that. Her thoughts were wrenched back to the present, as Julian took her hand in his long, elegant one. His fingers were smooth and well-tended, tapered at the tips. Winifred, he said gently, now that we're away from the clinic, life won't be nearly so well regulated. You must safeguard your health. Make certain you rest tonight, no matter how tempting it is to stay up all hours. Yes, Doctor, Wynne said, smiling up at him. She felt a surge of affection for him. Remembering the first time she had managed to climb the exercise ladder in the clinic, Julian had been behind her every step, his encouragements soft in her ear, his chest firm against her back. A little higher, Winifred. I won't let you fall. He hadn't done any of the work for her, only kept her safe as she climbed. I'm a bit nervous, Wynne admitted, as Leo escorted her to the Hathaway suite on the hotel's second floor. Why? I'm not sure. Perhaps because we've all changed. The essential things haven't changed. Leo gripped her elbow firmly. You're still the sweet, delightful woman you were, and I'm still a scoundrel with a taste for spirits and light skirts. Leo, she said, darting a quick frown at him, you're not planning to go back to your old ways, are you? I'll avoid temptation as long as it avoids me, he replied. If it happens to fall directly in my path, I make no promises. He stopped her at the middle landing. Do you want to pause for a moment? Not at all, Wynne continued enthusiastically upward. I love stair climbing. I love doing anything I couldn't do before. And from now on, I'm going to live by the motto, Life is to be lived to the fullest. Leo grinned. You should know that I've said that on many occasions in the past, and it always resulted in disaster. Wynne glanced at her surroundings with pleasure. After living in the austere surroundings of Harrow's clinic for so long, she would enjoy a taste of luxury. Elegant, modern, and supremely comfortable, the Rutledge was owned by the mysterious Harry Rutledge, about whom there were so many rumours that no one could even say definitively whether he was British or American. All that was known for certain was that he had lived for a time in America, 
and had come to England to create a hotel that combined the opulence of Europe with the best of American innovations. The Rutledge was the first hotel to design every single bedroom en suite with its own private bathroom, and there were delights such as food service lifts, built-in cupboards in the bedrooms, private meeting rooms with atrium glass ceilings, and gardens designed as outdoor rooms. The hotel also featured a dining room that was said to be the most beautiful in England, with so many chandeliers that the ceiling had required extra reinforcements during construction. They reached the door of the Hathaway suite, and Leo knocked gently. There were a few movements within. The door opened to reveal a young, fair-haired maid. The maid's gaze swept over the both of them. "'May I help you, sir?' she asked Leo. "'We've come to see Mr. and Mrs. Rowan.' "'Beg pardon, sir, but they just retired for the evening.' The hour was quite late, Wynne thought, deflated. We should go to our rooms and let them rest, she told Leo. We'll come back in the morning. Leo stared at the housemaid with a slight smile. What's your name? Her brown eyes widened, and a blush crept up her cheeks. Abigail, sir. Abigail, he repeated. Would you tell Mrs. Rowan her sister has arrived and wishes to see her? Yes, sir. The maid giggled and left them at the door. Wynne gave her brother a wry glance as he helped to remove her cloak. Your way with women never fails to astonish me. It astonishes me even more, he said. Before another minute had passed, they both turned as someone entered the receiving room. It was Amelia, clad in a blue dressing robe, accompanied by Cam, who was handsomely dishevelled in an open-necked shirt and trousers. Amelia's eyes turned as round as saucers at the sight of her brother and sister. Is it really you? she asked unsteadily. Wynne tried to smile, but it was impossible when her lips were trembling with emotion. She tried to imagine how she must appear to Amelia, who had last seen her as a frail invalid. I'm home, she said, a slight break in her voice. Oh, Wynne, I dreamed of seeing you like this. Amelia stopped and rushed forward, and their arms went around each other fast and tight. Wynne closed her eyes and sighed, feeling that at last she had come home. My sister, she basked in the soft comfort of Amelia's arms. You're so beautiful, Amelia said, drawing back to cup Wynne's wet cheeks with her hands. So healthy and strong. Look at this goddess. Cam, just look at her. You look well, little sister, Cam told Wynne, his eyes glowing. Better than I've ever seen you before. He kissed her forehead. Welcome back. Where are Poppy and Beatrix? Wynne asked, clinging to Amelia's hand. They're abed, but I'll go wake them. No, let them sleep, Wynne said quickly. We shan't stay for long. We're both exhausted but I had to see you before retiring for the night. Amelia's gaze went to Leo, who had hung back near the door. Wynne heard the swift intake of her sister's breath as she saw the changes in him. There's my old Leo, Amelia said softly. Wynne was surprised to see a flicker of something in Leo's sardonic expression, a sort of boyish vulnerability, as if he was embarrassed by his own pleasure in the reunion. Now you'll weep for a different cause, he told Amelia, because, as you see, I've come back as well. She flew to him and was swallowed in a strong embrace. The French wouldn't have you, she asked, her voice muffled against his chest. On the contrary, they adored me, but there's no entertainment in staying where one is wanted. That's too bad, Amelia said, standing on her toes to kiss his cheek because you're very much wanted here. Smiling, Leo reached out to shake Cam's hand. I look forward to seeing the improvements you wrote about. It seems the estate is thriving. You can ask Mary Penn on the morrow, Cam replied easily. On the morrow, Leo repeated, giving Wynne a quick glance. He's in London, then? Here at the Rutledge. He's in town to hire more servants. I have much to thank Mary Penn for. 
Leo said, with uncharacteristic sincerity. And you as well, Rowan. As the two men talked, Amelia drew Wynne to a settee near the hearth. Your face is fuller, Amelia said, openly cataloguing the changes in her sister. Your eyes are brighter, and your figure is altogether splendid. No more corsets, Wynne said with a grin. Dr. Harrow says they compress the lungs, force the spine and head into an unnatural attitude, and weaken the back muscles. Scandalous! Amelia exclaimed, her eyes sparkling. No corset, even on formal occasions. He allows that I might wear a light one very rarely. What else does Dr. Harrow say about stockings and garters? Amelia asked, clearly entertained. You may ask him yourself, Wynne said. Leo and I brought him back with us. Lovely. Does he have business here? Not that I know of. I suppose, since he's from London, he has relations and friends to visit. Yes, that's part of it, but... Wynne felt herself flush a little. Julian wants to spend time with me away from the clinic. Amelia's lips parted in surprise. Julian, she repeated. Does he mean to court you, Wynne? I think so. Do you like him? Wynne nodded without hesitation. Very much. Then I like him as well, and I'll be glad of the chance to thank him personally for what he has done. They grinned at each other, basking in the delight of being reunited. But after a moment, Wynne thought of Mary Penn, and her pulse began to throb, and nerves jumped everywhere in her body. How is he, Amelia? She finally brought herself to whisper. There was no need for Amelia to ask who he was. What Mary Penn has accomplished with the estate is no less than astounding, she said. He's managed an army of carpenters, masons, plumbers, and the like. When necessary, he'll strip off his coat and lend his own back to a task. He's earned the respect of the workers. They do their best for him. I'm not surprised, Wynne said with bittersweet pride. He's always been very capable. Yes, Amelia let out a taut sigh. He's changed a bit. What do you mean? He's remote and quiet, and seems to take no satisfaction in his success. An uncomfortable pause. Perhaps it may help him to see you again. You were always a good influence. Wynne eased her hands away, and frowned down at her own lap. I doubt I have any influence on Mary Penn whatsoever. He made his lack of interest in me very clear. Lack of interest, Amelia repeated, and gave a strange little laugh. I wouldn't say that at all. Any mention of you earns his closest attention. One may judge a man's feelings by his actions. Wynne sighed and rubbed her weary eyes. At first, I was hurt by the way he ignored my letters. Then I was angry. Now, I merely feel foolish. Why, dear? Amelia asked, her blue eyes filled with concern. For loving, and having that love tossed back in her face. For wasting an ocean's worth of tears on a big, hard-hearted brute. And for still wanting to see him despite all that. Wynne shook her head. The talk of Mary Penn had made her agitated and melancholy. I'm weary after the long journey, Amelia, she said with a half-smile. Would you mind if I... No, no, go at once, her sister said, drawing Wynne up from the settee and putting a protective arm around her. Leo, do take Wynne to her room. You're both exhausted. We'll have time for talking tomorrow. Ah, oh, that lovely tone of command, Leo reminisced. I'd hoped by now you'd have cured her habit of barking out orders like a drill, Sergeant Rowan. I enjoy all her habits, Cam replied, smiling at his wife. What room is Mary Penn in? Wynne whispered to Amelia. Third floor, number 21, Amelia whispered back. But you mustn't go tonight, dear. Of course. Wynne smiled at her. The only thing I intend to do tonight is go to bed without delay. Chapter 7 
Third floor, number 21. Wynne pulled the hood of her cloak down to conceal her face as she walked along the quiet hallway. She had to find Mary Penn, of course. She had come too far. She had crossed miles of earth and ocean and had climbed the equivalent of a thousand ladders in a clinic gymnasium, all to reach him. Now that they were in the same building, she was hardly going to end her journey prematurely. The hotel hallways were bracketed at each end with colonnaded light wells to admit the sun in the daytime hours. Wynne could hear strains of music from deep within the hotel. There must be a private party in the ballroom, or an event in the famous dining room. Harry Rutledge was called the Hotelier to Royalty, welcoming the famous, the powerful, and the fashionable to his establishment. Glancing at the gilded numbers on each door, Wynne finally found twenty-one. Her stomach plunged, and every muscle clenched with anxiety. She felt a light sweat break out on her forehead. Fumbling a little with her gloves, she managed to pull them off and tuck them into the pockets of her cloak. A tremulous knock at the door with her knuckles, and she waited in frozen stillness, head bent, hardly able to breathe for nerves. She gripped her arms around herself beneath the concealing cloak. She was not certain how much time passed, only that it seemed an eternity before the door was unlocked and opened. Before she could bring herself to look up, she heard Mary Penn's voice. She had forgotten how deep and dark it was, how it seemed to reach down to the centre of her. I didn't send for a woman tonight. That last word forestalled Wynne's reply. Tonight implied that there had been other nights when he had indeed sent for a woman, and although Wynne was unworldly, she certainly understood what happened when a woman was sent for and received by a man at a hotel. Her brain swarmed with thoughts. She had no right to object if Mary Penn wanted a woman to service him. She did not own him. They had made no promises or agreements. He did not owe her fidelity. But she couldn't help wondering. How many women? How many nights? No matter, he said brusquely. Come in. A large hand reached out and gripped Wynne's shoulder, hauling her past the threshold without giving her the opportunity to object. She was silent with consternation. Somehow, it didn't seem appropriate simply to throw back her hood and cry, Surprise! Kev had mistaken her for a prostitute, and the reunion she had dreamed of for so long had abruptly turned into a farce. I'm a rom, he said. Does that bother you? Her face still concealed by the hood, Wynne shook her head. He left her momentarily, striding to the window to close the heavy velvet curtains against the smoke-hazed lights of London, a single lamp strained to illuminate the dimness of the room. Wynne glanced at him quickly. As Amelia had said, Kev was altered. He had lost weight, perhaps a stone. He was huge but lean, almost raw-boned. The neck of his shirt hung open, revealing the brown, hairless chest, the gleaming curves of powerful muscle. She thought at first it was a trick of the light, the size of his shoulders and upper arms. Good Lord, how strong he'd become! But none of that intrigued or startled her as much as his face. He was still as handsome as the devil— with those dark eyes and brooding mouth. There were new lines, however, deep, bitter grooves that ran from nose to mouth, and the trace of a permanent frown between his thick brows, and most disturbing of all, a hint of cruelty in his expression. He looked capable of things her Mary Penn never could have done. Kev, she thought in despair and wonder, what's happened to you? He came to her. Wynne had forgotten the fluid way he moved, the breathtaking vitality that seemed to charge the air. Hastily, she lowered her head. Kev reached out for her. Feeling the tremors that ran through her frame, he said quietly, You're new at this. She managed a hoarse whisper. Yes. I won't hurt you. Mary Penn guided her to a nearby table. As she stood facing away from him, 
he reached around to the fastenings of her cloak. The heavy garment fell away, revealing her straight blonde hair, which was falling from its combs. She heard his breath catch. A moment of stillness. Wynne closed her eyes as Mary Penn's hands skimmed her sides. Her body was fuller, more curved, strong in the places she had once been frail. She wore no corset, when decent women always wore corsets. There was only one conclusion a man could have drawn from that. As he leaned over to lay her cloak at the side of the table, Wynne felt the unyielding surface of his body brush against hers. The scent of him, clean and rich and male, unlocked a flood of memories. He smelled like the outdoors, like dry leaves and clean, rain-soaked earth. He smelled like Kev. She didn't want to be so undone by him. But it shouldn't have been a surprise. Something about him had always reached through her composure, down to the vein of purest feeling. This raw exhilaration was terrible and sweet, and no man had ever done this to her except him. Don't you want to see my face? she asked huskily. A cool, level reply. It doesn't matter if you're plain or fair. But his breath hastened as his hand settled on her, one sliding up her spine, urging her to bend forward, and his next words fell on her ears like black velvet. Put your hands on the table. Wynne obeyed blindly, trying to understand herself, the sudden sting of tears, the excitement that throbbed all through her. Kev stood behind her. His hand continued to move over her back in slow paths, and she wanted to arch upward like a cat. His touch awakened sensations that had lain dormant for so long. These hands had soothed and cared for her all during her illness. They had pulled her from the very brink of death. He wasn't touching her with love, but impersonal skill. One hand closed in her skirts, easing them upward. Wynne felt the touch of a cold draught on her ankle, and she couldn't help but imagine what it would be like if she let him go on. Aroused and panicking, she stared down at her fists and choked out, Is this how you treat women now, Kev? Everything stopped. The world halted on its axis. Her skirt hem dropped, and she was seized in a fierce grip and spun around. Caught helplessly, she looked up into his dark face. Kev was expressionless, save for the widening of his eyes. As he stared at her, a flush burned across his cheeks and the bridge of his nose. Win. Her name was carried on a shaken breath. She tried to smile, to say something, but her mouth was trembling, and she was blinded by tears. To be with him again, it overwhelmed her in every way. One of his hands came upward. The calloused tip of his thumb smoothed over the gloss of wetness beneath her eye. His hand cradled the side of her face so gently that her lashes fluttered down, and she didn't resist as she felt him bring her closer. His parted lips touched the tear track and followed it along her cheek. The gentleness evaporated. With a swift, greedy move, he reached for her back, her hips, clutching her hard against him. His mouth found hers with hot, urgent pressure. She reached up to his cheeks and shaped her fingers over the scrape of bristle. A sound came from low in his throat, a masculine growl of pleasure and need. His arms clasped around her in an unbreakable hold, for which she was grateful. Her knees threatened to give way entirely. Lifting his head, Mary Penn looked down at her dazedly. How can you be here? I came back early. Shivers went through her as his hot breath fanned against her lips. I wanted to see you. Wanted you. He took her mouth again, sinking his tongue deep, aggressively searching. Both his hands came up to her head, angling it to make her mouth fully accessible. She reached around him, gripping the powerful stretch of his back, the hard muscles that went on and on. Kev groaned as he felt her hands on him. He tugged the combs from her hair and tangled his fingers in the uncoiling locks. Pulling her head back, he sought her throat and dragged his mouth along her skin. 
His hunger escalated and drove his breath faster and his pulse harder. He scooped her up with shocking ease and carried her to the bed. After lowering her swiftly to the mattress, his lips found hers with hot, seeking kisses. Wynne felt him unfastening the front of her travelling gown with such urgency she feared the fabric might tear. The thick cloth resisted his efforts. As Kev cupped the soft shape of her breast over the gown, the tip ached and hardened. His head bent. To Wynne's astonishment, she felt him biting against the cloth until her nipple was caught in the light clamp of his teeth. A whimper escaped her, and her hips jerked upward reflexively. Kev levered himself over her. His nostrils flared from the force of his breathing. The front of her skirts had ridden up between them. He tugged them higher and settled between her thighs until she felt the thick ridge of his erection between the layers of her drawers and his trousers. Her eyes flew open. She stared up into his intent face as he moved against her, letting her feel every inch of what he wanted to put inside her, and she moaned and opened to him. Kev, her voice was shaking. Kev, his mouth covered hers, penetrating deeply, while his hips continued to caress her in slow strokes. Desperately, she lifted against the demanding hardness, craving each wicked thrust as sensations spread and unfolded. Something was happening, her muscles tightening, her senses opening in readiness for... for what? He reached beneath her cupped her squirming bottom and pulled her higher, right against the pumping, sliding pressure. She whimpered at the exquisite feeling, arching upward and spreading her legs. Suddenly, Kev flung himself away from her, going to the opposite side of the room. Bracing his hands against the wall, he hung his head and panted and shivered. Dazed and trembling, Wynne moved slowly to restore her clothing. She felt desperate and painfully empty, needing something she had no name for. When she was covered again, she left the bed on unsteady legs. She approached Kev cautiously. It was obvious he was aroused, painfully so. She wanted to touch him again. Most of all, she wanted him to put his arms around her and tell her how overjoyed he was to have her back. But he spoke before she reached him. Please don't, he said thickly. If you touch me, I'm going to drag you back to that bed. Wynne stopped, plaiting her fingers. Eventually, Kev recovered his breath. He gave her an unfathomable glance as he spoke. Next time, he said flatly, some advance warning of your arrival might be a good idea. I did send notice. Wynne was amazed that she could even speak. It must have been lost. She paused. That was a f far warmer welcome than I expected, considering the way you've ignored me for the past two years. I haven't ignored you. You wrote to me once in two years. Kev turned and rested his back against the wall. You didn't need letters from me. I needed any small sign of affection, and you gave me none. She stared at him incredulously as he remained silent. For heaven's sake, Kev, aren't you even going to say that you're glad I'm well again? I'm glad you're well again. Then why are you behaving this way? Because nothing else has changed. You've changed, she shot back. I feel as if I don't know you any more. That's as it should be. Kev, she said in bewilderment, I went away to get well. Surely you don't blame me for that. No, of course not. But the devil knows what you could want from me now. I want you to love me, she wanted to cry out. She had travelled so far, and yet there was more distance between them than ever. I can tell you what I don't want, Kev, and that's to be estranged from you. Kev's expression was stony. We're not estranged. He picked up her cloak and handed it to her. Put this on. I'll take you to your room. Wynne pulled the garment around herself, stealing discreet glances at him as he tucked his shirt into his trousers. The X of the braces over his back highlighted his magnificent build. You needn't walk with me to my room, 
she said in a subdued voice. I can find my way back without— You're to go nowhere in this hotel alone. It's not safe. You're right, she said sullenly. I would hate to be mistaken for a streetwalker and accosted. The shot hit its mark. Kev's mouth hardened, and he gave her a dangerous glance as he shrugged into his coat. Kev, she said softly, can't we resume our friendship? I'm still your friend. But nothing more. No. Wynne couldn't help glancing at the bed and at the rumpled counterpane that covered it, and a new surge of heat went through her. Kev went still as he followed the direction of her gaze. That shouldn't have happened, he said roughly. I shouldn't have... He stopped and swallowed audibly. I haven't had a woman in a while. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. He went to the door and opened it to glance in both directions along the hallway. Come. I want to stay. I need to talk with you. Not alone. Not at this hour. He paused. Please. Come. This last was said with a softness that made her knees weak. But she obeyed. As Wynne reached him, Kev pulled the hood of her cloak up to conceal her face. After checking the hallway once more, he guided her outside the room and closed the door. They were silent as they went to the staircase at the end of the hallway. Wynne was acutely conscious of his hand resting lightly on her back. Reaching the top step, she was surprised when he stopped her. Take my arm. She realized he intended to help her down the stairs, as he had always done when she was ill. Stairs had been a particular trial for her. The entire family had been terrified that she would faint while going up or down the steps and perhaps break her neck. Kev had often carried her rather than let her take the risk. No, thank you, she said. I'm able to do it on my own now. Take it, he repeated, reaching for her hand. Wynne snatched it back, while her chest tightened with annoyance. I don't want your help. I'm no longer an invalid, though it seems you preferred me that way. Although she couldn't see his face, she heard his sharply indrawn breath. She felt ashamed at the petty accusation, even as she wondered if there wasn't a grain of truth in it. Kev didn't reply, however. They descended the stairs separately, in silence. Wynne was utterly confused. She had pictured this night a hundred different ways, every possible way but this. She led the way to her door and reached in her pocket for the key. Kev took the key from her and opened the door. Go and light the lamp. Conscious of his large, dark form waiting at the threshold, Wynne went to the bedside table. Carefully, she lifted the glass globe of the lamp, lit the wick, and replaced the glass. After inserting the key into the other side of the door, Kev said, Lock it behind me. Turning to look at him, Wynne felt a miserable laugh knotting in her throat. This is where we left off, isn't it? Me throwing myself at you, you turning me away. I thought I understood before. I wasn't well enough for the kind of relationship I wanted with you. But now I don't understand, because there's nothing to stop us from finding out if... if we are meant to... Distressed and mortified, she couldn't find words for what she wanted. Unless I was mistaken about how you once felt for me. Did you ever desire me, Kev? It was only friendship. His voice was barely audible. Wynne's eyes and nose prickled. A hot tear leaked down her cheek. Liar, she said, and turned away. The door closed gently. Kev never remembered walking back to his room, only that he eventually found himself standing beside his bed. Groaning a curse, he sank to his knees and gripped handfuls of the counterpane and buried his face in it. He was in hell. Holy Christ, how wind devastated him. He had starved for her for so long, dreamed of her so many nights, and woken alone on so many bitter mornings that at first he hadn't believed she was real. 
He thought of the softness of her mouth against his, and the way she had arched beneath his hands. She had felt different, her body supple and strong, but her radiant spirit was the same. It had taken all his strength not to go to his knees before her. Wynne had asked for friendship. Impossible. How could he separate any part of the unwieldy tangle of his feelings and hand over such a small piece? And she knew better than to ask. Even in the Hathaway's eccentric world, some things were forbidden. Kev had nothing to offer Wynne except degradation. Even Cam had been able to provide Amelia with his considerable wealth. But Kev had no worldly possessions, no grace of character, no education, no advantageous connections, nothing Gudger valued. If Wynne was indeed well enough to marry some day, it would have to be to a gentleman, to a gentle man. Chapter 8 in the morning, Leo met the governess. Poppy and Beatrix had both written about having acquired a governess a year earlier. Her name was Miss Marks, and they both liked her, although their descriptions didn't exactly convey why they should like such a creature. Apparently she was slight and quiet and stern. She was helping not only the sisters, but the entire family learn to acquit itself in society. Leo thought this social instruction was probably a good thing. For everyone else, not him. When it came to polite behaviour, society was far more exacting of women than men, and if a man had a title and held his liquor reasonably well, he could do or say nearly anything he liked and still be invited everywhere. Through a quirk of fate, Leo had inherited a title— which had solved the first part of the equation. Now, after the long stay in France, he limited his nightly drinking to a glass of wine or two at supper, which meant he was relatively certain of being received at any dull and respectable event in London he had no desire to attend. He only hoped the formidable Miss Marks would try to correct him. It might be amusing to set her back on her heels. Leo knew next to nothing about governesses, save for the drab creatures in novels who tended to fall in love with the lord of the manor, always with bad results. However, Miss Marks was entirely safe from him. For a change, he had no interest in seducing anyone. His former dissipated pursuits had lost their power to enthrall him. On one of Leo's ambles around Provence to visit some Gallo-Roman architectural remains, he'd encountered one of his old professors from the École des Beaux-Arts. The chance meeting had resulted in a renewed acquaintanceship. In the months to come, Leo had spent many an afternoon sketching, reading, and studying in the professor's atelier, or workshop. Leo had arrived at some conclusions that he intended to put to the test now that he was back in England. As he strolled nonchalantly along the long hallway that led to the Hathaway suite, he heard rapid footsteps. Someone was running toward him from the other direction. Moving to the side, Leo waited with his hands tucked in his trouser pockets. "'Come here, you little fiend!' he heard a woman snarl. You oversized rat! When I get my hands on you, I'll rip out your innards! The bloodthirsty tone was unladylike, appalling. Leo was vastly entertained. The footsteps drew closer, but there was only one set. Who on earth could she be chasing? It quickly became clear that she was not pursuing a who, but a what— the slender, furry body of a ferret came loping along the hallway with a frilly object clamped in his mouth. Most hotel guests would have been disconcerted by the sight of a small, carnivorous mammal streaking toward them. However, Leo had lived for years with Beatrix's creatures, mice appearing in his pockets, baby rabbits in his shoes, hedgehogs wandering casually past the dining table. Smiling, he watched the ferret hurry past him. The woman came soon after, 
a mass of rustling grey skirts as she ran full bore after the creature. But if there was one thing Lady's clothing was not designed to do, it was to facilitate ease of movement. Weighted by layers and layers of fabric, she stumbled and fell a few yards away from Leo. A pair of spectacles went flying to the side. Leo was at her side in an instant, crouching on the floor as he sorted through the hissing tangle of limbs and skirts. Are you hurt? I feel certain there's a woman in here somewhere. Ah, oh, there you are. Easy now. Let me— Don't touch me, she snapped, batting at him with her fists. I'm not touching you. That is, I'm only touching you with the— Ow! Damn it! With the intention of helping. Her hat, a little scrap of wool felt with cheap corded trim, had fallen over her face. Leo managed to push it back to the top of her head, narrowly missing a sharp blow to his jaw. Christ! Would you stop flailing for a moment? Straggling to a sitting position, she glared at him. Leo crawled to retrieve the spectacles and returned to hand them to her. She snatched them from him without a word of thanks. She was a lean, anxious-looking woman, a young woman with narrowed eyes from which bad temper flashed out. Her light brown hair was pulled back with a gallows rope tightness that made Leo wince just to see it. One would have hoped for some compensating feature, a soft pair of lips, perhaps, or a pretty bosom. But no, there was only a stern mouth, a flat chest, and gaunt cheeks. If Leo were compelled to spend any time with her, which, thankfully, he wasn't, he would have started by feeding her. If you want to help, she said coldly, hooking the spectacles around her ears, retrieve that blasted ferret for me. Perhaps I've tired him enough that you might be able to run him to ground. Still crouching on the floor, Leo glanced at the ferret, which had paused ten yards away and was watching them both with bright, beady eyes. What's his name? Dodger. Leo gave a low whistle and a few clicks of his tongue. Come, Dodger, you've caused enough trouble for the morning, though I can't fault your taste in ladies' garters. Is that what you're holding? The woman watched, stupefied, as the ferret wriggled toward Leo. Chattering busily, Dodger crawled onto Leo's thigh. Good fellow, Leo said, stroking the sleek fur. How did you do that? the woman asked in annoyance. I have a way with animals. They tend to acknowledge me as one of their own. Leo gently pried a frilly bit of lace and ribbon from the long front teeth. It was definitely a garter, deliciously feminine and impractical. He gave the woman a mocking smile as he handed it to her. Yours? He hadn't really thought that, of course. He'd assumed the garter belonged to someone else. It was impossible to fathom this stern female wearing something so frivolous. But as he saw a blush spread across the young woman's cheeks, he realized it actually was hers. He gestured with a ferret hanging relaxed in his hand and said, I take it this animal doesn't belong to you? No, to one of my charges. Are you by chance a governess? That is no concern of yours. Because if you are, one of your charges is most definitely Miss Beatrix Hathaway. She scowled. How do you know that? My sister is the only person I know of who would bring a garter-stealing ferret to the Rutledge Hotel. Your sister? He smiled into her astonished face. Lord Ramsay, at your service. And your Miss Marks, the governess? Yes. She ignored the hand he reached down for her and rose to her feet unassisted. Leo felt an irresistible urge to provoke her. How gratifying! I've always wanted a family governess to Harris. The comment seemed to incense her beyond all expectation. I'm aware of your reputation as a skirt chaser, my lord. I find no cause for humour in it. Leo didn't think she found cause for humour in much of anything. My reputation has lasted in spite of a two-year absence, he asked, 
affecting a tone of pleased surprise. You're proud of it? Well, of course. It's easy to have a good reputation. You merely have to do nothing. But earning a bad reputation? Well, that takes some effort. A contemptuous stare burned through the spectacle lenses. I despise you, she announced. Turning on her heel, she walked away from him. Leo followed, carrying the ferret. We've only just met. You can't despise me until you really get to know me. She ignored him as he followed her to the Hathaway suite. She ignored him as he knocked at the door, and she continued to ignore him as they were welcomed inside by the maid. Some kind of commotion was going on in the suite, which shouldn't have been a surprise, considering it belonged to the Hathaways. The air was filled with cursing, exclamations, and grunts of physical combat. Leo! Beatrix appeared from the main receiving room and hurried over to them. Beatrix, darling! Leo was amazed by the difference the past two and a half years had made in his youngest sister. How you've grown! Yes, never mind that, she said impatiently, snatching the ferret from him. Go in there and help Mr. Rowan. Help him with what? He's trying to stop Mary Penn from killing Dr. Harrow. Already? Leo asked blankly, and rushed into the receiving room. Chapter 9 after attempting to sleep on a bed one could have mistaken for a torture rack, Kev awakened with a heavy heart and other more urgent discomforts. He'd been plagued with dreams in which Wynne's naked body had been writhing against him, beneath him. All the desires he kept at bay in the daylight hours had expressed themselves in those dreams. He had been holding Wynne, thrusting inside her and taking her cries into his mouth, kissing her from head to toe and back again, and in those same dreams she had behaved in a most unwin like manner, delicately feasting on him with a wanton mouth, exploring him with inquisitive little hands. Washing in frigid water had improved his condition marginally, but Kev was still aware of heat burning far too close to the surface. He was going to have to face Wynne today and talk with her in front of everyone, as if everything were ordinary. He was going to have to look at her and not think about the softness between her thighs and how she had cradled him as he had thrust against her and how he had felt her warmth even through the layers of their clothes and how he had lied to her and made her cry. Feeling wretched and explosive, Kev dressed in the town clothes that the family insisted he wear when in London. You know the value Gaja place on appearance, Cam had told him, dragging him to Savile Row. You have to look respectable, or it will reflect badly on your sisters to be seen with you. Kev had submitted to the indignity of having measurements taken, being draped with countless fabrics and going for endless fittings. Cam and the Hathaway sisters had all seemed delighted with the results, but Kev couldn't see any difference between his new attire and the old. Scowling, he donned a white pleated shirt and black cravat, a vest with a notched collar and narrow-legged trousers. He pulled on a wool town coat with front flap pockets and a split at the back. Following his usual habit, Kev went to the Hathaway suite for breakfast. He kept his face expressionless, even though his pulse was rampaging all at the thought of seeing Wynne, but he would manage the situation adeptly. He would be calm and quiet, and Wynne would be her usual, composed self, and they would get past this first unholy, awkward meeting. All his intentions, however, vanished as he entered the suite, went to the receiving room, and saw Wynne on the floor, in her underclothes. She was lying prostrate on her stomach, trying to push upward, while a man leaned over her, touching her. The sight exploded inside Kev. With a bloodthirsty roar, he reached Wynne in a flash, snatching her up in possessive arms. Wait! she gasped. What are you... Oh, don't! Let me explain... No! He deposited her unceremoniously on a sofa behind him, 
and turned to face the other man. The only thought in Kev's mind was swift and effective dismemberment, starting by ripping the bastard's head off. Prudently, the man had rushed behind a heavy chair, placing it between them. You must be merry, Pen, he said, and I'm a dead man, Kev growled, starting for him. He's my doctor, Wynne cried. He's Dr. Harrow, and Mary Penn, don't you dare hurt him. Ignoring her, Kev went forward about two strides before he felt a leg hook around his, sending him hurtling to the floor. It was Cam Rowan, who pounced on him, knelt on his arms, and gripped the back of his neck. Mary Penn, you idiot, Cam said, struggling to keep him down. He's the damned doctor. What do you think you're doing? Killing him! Kev grunted, lurching upward despite Cam's restraining weight. Bloody hell! Cam exclaimed. Leo, help me hold him, now! Leo rushed over to help. It took both of them to keep Mary Penn down. I love our family gatherings, he heard Leo say. Mary Penn, what the devil is your problem? Wynne is in her underclothes, and that man— These are not my underclothes came Wynne's exasperated voice. This is an exercise costume. Mary Penn twisted to look in her direction. Since Cam and Leo were still pinning him down, he couldn't look all the way up. But he saw that Wynne was clad in loose-fitting drawers and a bodice with bare arms. I know underclothes when I see them, he snapped. These are Turkish trousers and a perfectly respectable bodice. Every woman at the clinic wears this same costume. Exercising is necessary for my health, and I'm certainly not going to do it in a gown and course. He was touching you, Kev interrupted harshly. He was making certain I had the correct form. The doctor approached cautiously. There was a flicker of humour in his alert grey eyes. It's a Hindu exercise, actually. Part of a strength training system I've developed. All my patients have incorporated it into their daily schedules. Please believe that my attentions to Miss Hathaway were entirely respectful. He paused and asked Riley, Am I safe now? Leo and Cam, still struggling with Kev, both answered simultaneously, No. By this time, Poppy, Beatrix, and Miss Marks had hurried into the room. Mary Penn, Poppy said, Dr. Harrow wasn't hurting Wynne, truly. He's really very nice, Mary Penn, Beatrix chimed in. Even my animals like him. Easy, Cam said quietly to Kev, speaking in Romany so that no one else could understand. This is no good for anyone. Kev went still. He was touching her, he replied in the old language, even though he hated using it and he knew Cam understood that Arom found it difficult, even impossible, to tolerate any other man putting a hand on his woman for any reason. She's not yours, Frau, Cam said in Romany, not without sympathy. Slowly, Kev forced himself to relax. May I climb off him now? Leo asked. There's only one kind of exertion I enjoy before breakfast, and this is not it. Cam allowed Kev to stand, but kept one arm twisted behind his back. Wynne went to stand beside Harrow. The sight of her wearing so little and being so near another man caused muscles to twitch all over Kev's body. He could see the shape of her hips and legs. The entire family had gone insane, letting her dress that way in front of an outsider and acting as though it were appropriate. Turkish trousers! as if giving them such a name made them anything but underdraws. I insist that you apologize, Wynne said. You've been rude to my guest, Mary Penn. Her guest? Kev stared at her in outrage. No need, Harrow said hastily. I know how it must have appeared. Wynne glared at Kev. He made me well again, and this is the way you repay him, she demanded. You made yourself well. Harrow said. It was a result of your own efforts, Miss Hathaway. Wynne's expression softened as she glanced at the doctor. Thank you. 
but when she looked back at Kev, the frown returned. Are you going to apologize, Mary Pen? Cam twisted his arm a bit more tightly. Do it, damn you, he muttered, for the sake of the family. Glaring at the doctor, Kev spoke in Romany, calling him the equivalent of an outhouse hole. Which means, Cam said hastily, please forgive the misunderstanding. Let's part as friends. For good measure, Kev expressed his hopes the man would die of a malignant wasting disease. Roughly translated, Cam said, that means may your garden be filled with fat hedgehogs, which I might add is quite a blessing among the rom. Harrow looked sceptical, but he murmured, I accept your apology. No harm done. Excuse us, Cam said pleasantly, still twisting Kev's arm. Go on with breakfast, please. We have some errands to accomplish. Please tell Amelia when she rises that I'll return at approximately midday. And he steered Kev from the room, with Leo at their heels. As soon as they were out of the suite and in the hallway, Cam released Kev's arm and turned to face him. Raking his hand through his hair, Cam asked with mild exasperation, What did you hope to get out of killing Wynne's doctor? Enjoyment. Wynne didn't seem to be enjoying it. Why is Harrow here? Kev asked fiercely. I can answer that one, Leo said, leaning a shoulder against the wall with casual ease. Harrow wants to become better acquainted with the Hathaways, because he and my sister are close. Kev abruptly felt a sickening weight in his stomach, as if he'd swallowed a handful of river stones. What do you mean? he asked, even though he knew. No man could be exposed to win and not fall in love with her. Harrow is a widower, Leo said, a decent enough fellow, more attached to his clinic and patients than anything else. But he's a sophisticated man, widely travelled, and wealthy as the devil. He's a collector of beautiful objects, a connoisseur of fine things. It was difficult to ask the next question, but Kev forced himself to. Does Wynne care for him? I don't believe Wynne knows how much of what she feels for him is gratitude, and how much is true affection. Leo gave Kev a pointed glance. And there are still a few unresolved questions she has to answer for herself. I'll talk to her. I wouldn't if I were you. Not until she cools a bit. She's rather incensed with you. Why? Kev asked wondering if she had confided to her brother about the events of the previous night. Why? Leo's mouth twisted. There's such a dazzling array of choices. I find myself in a quandary about which one to start with. Putting the subject of this morning aside, what about the fact that you never wrote to her? I did, Kev said indignantly. One letter, Leo allowed. The farm report. She showed it to me. How could one forget the soaring prose you wrote about fertilizing the field near the East Gate? I'll tell you, the part about sheep dung nearly brought a tear to my eye. It was so sentimental, and what did she expect me to write about? Kev demanded. Don't bother to explain, my lord, Cam interceded, as Leo opened his mouth. It's not the way of a rom to put his private thoughts on paper. It's not the way of a rom to run an estate the way he does either, Leo said sardonically. Meripen, you've made compromises right and left since you came to this family. You've done whatever was necessary to be close to win. So don't be a bloody hypocrite and turn old Romany now that you finally have a chance to— Leo stopped and lifted his eyes heavenward. Never mind. Forget I said anything. This is too much even for me, and I thought I was inured to drama. He gave Cam a sour look. You talk to him. I'm going to have my tea. He went back into the suite, leaving them in the hallway. I didn't write about sheep dung, Kev muttered. It was another kind of fertilizer. Cam tried unsuccessfully to smother a grin and started down the hallway. Come with me. There actually is an errand I want you for. Not interested. 
It's dangerous, Cam coaxed. You might get to hit someone. Maybe even start a brawl. Ah, uh, I knew that would convince you. One of the qualities Kev found most annoying about Cam Rowan was his persistence in trying to find out about the tattoos. He'd pursued the mystery for two years. Despite the multitude of responsibilities he shouldered, Cam never missed an opportunity to delve further into the matter. He'd searched diligently for his own tribe, asking for information from every passing Vardo and going to every Romany camp. But his family seemed to have disappeared from the face of the earth. He'd probably never find them. There was no limit to how far a tribe might travel, and no guarantee they would ever return to England. Cam had searched marriage records, birth and death records, to find any mention of his mother, Sonia, or himself. Nothing so far. He had also consulted heraldic experts and Irish historians about the significance of the puka symbol. All they'd been able to do was dredge up the familiar legends of the nightmare horse, that he spoke in a human voice, that he appeared at midnight and called for you to come with him, and you could never refuse. And when you went with him, if you survived the ride, you were changed forever when you returned. Cam also hadn't been able to find a meaningful connection between the Rowan and Mary Penn names, which were common among Roma. Therefore, Cam's latest tactic was to search for Kev's tribe, or anyone who knew about it. Kev was understandably hostile about the plan, which Cam revealed to him as they walked to the hotel mews. They left me for dead, Kev said. I don't want to find them. And if I see the Rom Bar ever again... I'll kill him with my bare hands. Fine, Cam returned equably, after they tell us about the tattoo. All they'll say is what I've already told you. It's the mark of a curse. And if you ever find out what it means, yes, yes, I know, we're doomed. But if I'm wearing a curse on my arm, Mary Penn, I want to know about it. Kev gave him a glance that should have felled him on the spot. He stopped at a corner of the stables, where hoof-picks, clippers, and files had been neatly organized on shelves. I'm not going. You'll have to look for my tribe without me. I need you, Cam countered. For one thing, we're going to no man's land. Kev stared at him in disbelief. No man's land was a squalid plain located on the Surrey side of the Thames. The open, muddy ground was scattered with ragged tents, crates, and piles of refuse. An array of destitute humanity lived there, Roma among them, most concerned only with survival. But there were also small, ferocious gangs of rogues and outcasts, mainly Saxon in origin. Roma called them Corridis, a name to convey how low and contemptible they were, without customs or manners. Going anywhere near them was virtually asking to be attacked or robbed, it was hard to imagine a more dangerous place in London. Why do you think anyone from my tribe could be in such a place? Kev asked, more than a little shocked by the idea. Not long ago, I met a man from the Bosville tribe. He said his youngest sister Shuri was married long ago to your Uncle Pov. I remember her, Kev said, recalling a slender girl with lustrous black eyes. Cam stared at him intently. He knew the story of how you were abandoned. It's been told all through Romagna. I don't see why, Kev muttered, feeling suffocated. It's not important. Roma take care of their own. No tribe would ever voluntarily leave an injured boy behind, no matter what the circumstances. When your Uncle Pov decided to leave you the way he did, it brought a curse on the tribe, and most of them came to ruin. I would never have wanted that for them, Kev began, but his voice fractured with emotion, forcing him to fall silent. Cam spoke with quiet understanding. It's a strange life, isn't it? A rom with no family. No matter how hard you look, you can never find a home, because to us, family is home. Kev had a difficult time meeting Cam's gaze. The words cut too close to his heart 
In all the time he had known Cam, Kev had never felt a kinship with him until now. But Kev could no longer ignore the fact that they had too damn much in common. They were two outsiders with pasts full of unanswered questions, and each of them had been drawn to the Hathaways. I'll go with you, damn it, Kev said gruffly, but only because I know what Amelia would do to me if I let something happen to you. Chapter 10 Somewhere in England, Cam thought wistfully, spring had covered the ground with green velvet and coaxed flowers from the hedgerows. Somewhere the sky was blue and the air was sweet, but not in no man's land, where smoke from millions of chimney pipes had soured the complexion of the city with a yellow fog that daylight could barely penetrate. There was little but mud and misery in this barren place. It was located approximately a quarter mile from the river and bordered by a hill and a railway. He and Mary Penn led their horses past scattered tents, pausing here and there to ask where Shuri was. As they'd expected, they were met with suspicion and curiosity. Eventually, however, they were directed to a small encampment, where an older boy sat by a tent on an overturned pail. He carved buttons with a small knife. We're looking for Shuri, Mary Penn said in Romany. The boy gave them a long, measuring glance before he called over his shoulder to someone in the tent. There are two men to see you. Roma dressed like Gaja. A small woman came to the entrance. She was thin and haggard from a life of hardship, but she had large, beautiful dark eyes. At first, she stared at Mary Penn without much interest. Then her eyes widened. Kev, you must be a spirit. Cam looked at him sharply. Kev, he repeated. That's your tribal name. Mary Penn ignored him. It's me, Shuri, he said gently. She shook her head in disbelief. Show me the mark. Mary Penn frowned. May I do it inside? Shuri nodded and gestured for them to go in the tent. Cam paused at the entrance and gave the boy a few coins. Make certain the horses aren't stolen. The interior of the tent was heated by a small coke fire glowing in a three-legged pan. At Shuri's direction, Cam sat cross-legged on a pallet by the fire pan. He stifled a grin as the woman insisted on seeing Mary Penn's tattoo— which provoked a long-suffering glance from him. Being modest by nature, Mary Penn was undoubtedly cringing inside at having to undress in front of them, but he set his jaw and tugged off his coat and unbuttoned his vest. Rather than remove his shirt entirely, Mary Penn unfastened the top placket and let the garment fall to reveal his upper back and shoulders. His dark head lowered, and he breathed quietly, as Shuri looked closely at the puka design inked on the muscled surface. Cam's amusement faded. For him, it would have been a joy and relief to encounter someone from his past. For Mary Penn, the experience was pure misery, but he bore it with a stoic endurance that touched Cam. Shuri moved away from Mary Penn. Who is he? she asked, nodding in Cam's direction. A friend. Mary Penn muttered, pulling his shirt back into place. What happened to the tribe? Shuri, where's Uncle Pov? In the ground, the woman said, with a pointed lack of respect for her husband. He was hanged by Gacha after he was caught making counterfeit coins. She glanced at Cam. Pov used to enter Kev in fighting matches at fairs or on street corners, she explained. It brought in a lot of money for the tribe. Pov used to call Kev his fighting dog, and that was how he treated him. Even made him sleep on a bed of straw, with no blanket. Her attention returned to Kev. He hated you for something that wasn't your fault, she said. It wasn't right. Mary Penn shook his head, clearly longing for her to shut up. It's in the past, he said curtly. Why did Pov treat him that way? Cam asked Shuri. Because he hated Gadja, 
she said simply. Mary Penn looked bewildered. But I'm a rom. Only half. The other half is Gadjo. She smiled faintly as she saw his bewilderment. You never guessed. Mary Penn shook his head, dumbstruck. Holy hell, Cam whispered. Your mother married a Gadjo, Shuri told Mary Penn. The puka is a mark of your father's family, but your father left her. And after we thought you died, Pov said, now there's only one. Only one what? Cam managed to ask. Brother. Shuri moved to stir the contents of the fire pan, sending a brighter glow through the tent. Kev had a younger brother. Emotion flooded Cam. He felt a dazzling change in his awareness, a new inflection in every thought. After spending his life thinking he was alone, here was someone who shared his blood. A true brother. Cam stared at Mary Penn, watching the realization dawn in the coffee-dark eyes. The grandmother took care of both boys for a while, Shuri continued. But she said Gadja would come to kill them some day. So she kept one boy while Kev was sent into the care of his uncle Pov. She never would have done it if she'd known how Pov would treat him. Do you know my father's name? Kev asked tersely. Or why my grandmother thought Gadja would harm his sons? Shuri looked regretful and shook her head. Mommy, came the boy's voice from outside. Corridies are coming. They want the horses, Mary Penn said, rising swiftly to his feet. He pressed a few coins into Shuri's hand. Luck and good health, he said, and strode out of the tent with Cam. Three ragged men were approaching. The biggest of them held a jagged, makeshift knife. Well, Cam said beneath his breath, this should be entertaining. Leave it to me, Mary Penn said. Go right ahead, Cam said agreeably. One of them spoke in an English dialect so thick it was incomprehensible to Cam. But the bastard gestured to Cam's horse, and that he understood perfectly well. Like hell. Cam said. The trio began to close around them. Mary Penn appeared relaxed, but his fingers flexed, and Cam saw the way his posture altered in subtle readiness for attack. The Corridi lunged forward with the knife, aiming for the mid to lower torso, but Mary Penn turned in a nimble sidestep. Efficiently, he grabbed the man's attacking arm and jerked him off balance, using momentum against him. Before another heartbeat had passed, Mary Penn had flipped his opponent to the ground, twisting the bastard's arm in the process. An audible fracture caused all of them, even Cam, to flinch. The Corridi howled in agony. Prying the knife from the man's limp hand, Mary Penn tossed it to Cam, who caught it reflexively. Mary Penn glanced at the remaining two men. Who's next? he asked coldly. They fled without a backward glance, leaving their companion to stagger away with loud groans. Very nice, Cam said in admiration. We're leaving, Mary Penn informed him curtly, before more of them come. Let's go to a tavern, Cam said. I need a drink. Mary Penn went to his horse without a word. For once, it seemed, they were in agreement. The Hell and Bucket, located in one of the more disreputable areas of London, was a place that would serve two Roma without blinking an eye. The ale was good, twelve bushel strength, and although the barmaids were somewhat surly, they did an adequate job of keeping the tankards full and the floor swept. Cam and Kev sat at a small table, lit by a turnip carved into a candle holder, with tallow runnelling over its purple-tinged sides. Kev took a few swallows of ale and set the vessel down. He rarely drank anything except wine, and that in moderation. He didn't like the loss of control that came with drinking. Cam, however, drained his own tankard. He leaned back in his chair and surveyed Kev with a slight smile. I've always been amused by your inability to hold your liquor, 
Cam remarked. A rom your size should be able to drink a quarter barrel to the pitching. But now that I know you're half Irish as well, it's inexcusable, Frau. We'll have to work on your drinking skills. We're not going to tell anyone, Kev told him grimly, about the fact that we're brothers. Cam seemed to enjoy Kev's visible wince. It's not so bad being half gajo, he told Kev kindly, and snickered at his expression. Not one word, Kev said. Not even to the family. Cam sobered a little. I don't keep secrets from my wife. Not even for her safety. Cam appeared to think that over, gazing through one of the narrow windows of the tavern. The streets thronged with costermongers, the wheels of their barrows rattling over the cobblestones. Their cries rose thick in the air as they tried to interest customers in bonnet boxes, toys, lucifer matches, umbrellas and brooms. On the opposite side of the street, a butcher shop window gleamed crimson and white with freshly cut meat. You think our father's family might still want us dead? Cam asked. It's possible. Absently, Cam rubbed over his own sleeve, over the place where the puka mark was located. Our father must have been a man of some worth. Otherwise Gajo wouldn't give a damn about a pair of half-breed children. I wonder why he left our mother. I wonder... I don't care. I'm going to do a new search of parish birth records. Perhaps our father... Let it lie! Let it lie? Cam gave him an incredulous glance. Do you actually plan to ignore what we found out today? Deny the kinship between us? Yes. Shaking his head slowly, Cam turned one of the gold rings on his fingers. After today, brother, I understand much more about you. The way you don't call me that, I imagine being raised like a pit animal doesn't inspire fond feelings for the human race. I'm sorry you were the unlucky one, being sent to our uncle. But you can't let that stop you from leading a full life now. And that includes finding out who you are. Finding out who I am won't get me what I want. Nothing will. What is it you want? Cam asked softly. Clamping his mouth shut, Kev glared at Cam. You can't even bring yourself to say it, Cam prodded. When Kev remained obstinately silent, Cam reached over for his tankard. Are you going to finish this? No. Cam drank the ale in a few expedient gulps. He set the tankard down and waited a moment before asking quietly, Did you suspect anything? Did you think the tie between us might be this close? No. I think I did. I always knew I wasn't supposed to be alone. Kev gave him a dour look. This changes nothing. I'm not your family. Blood counts for something, Cam replied affably. And since the rest of my tribe has disappeared, you're all I've got, Frau. Just try and get rid of me. Chapter 11 Wind descended the main staircase of the hotel, while one of the Hathaway's footmen, Charles, followed closely. Careful, Miss Hathaway, he cautioned. One slip and you could break your neck on these stairs. Thank you, Charles, she said, without moderating her speed. But there's no need to worry. She was quite adept at stairs, having gone up and down long staircases at the clinic in France as part of her daily exercise. I should warn you, Charles, that I must walk at a vigorous pace. Yes, miss, he said, sounding disgruntled. Charles was somewhat stout and not fond of walking. Although he was getting on in years, the Hathaways were loath to dismiss him before he wished to retire. Wynne bit back a smile. Just to Hyde Park and back, Charles. As they neared the entrance to the hotel, Wynne saw a tall, dark form moving through the lobby. It was Kev, looking moody and distracted. But as he approached the stairs and glanced upward, his expression changed as he saw her. 
she saw the mingled pleasure and longing in his face before he managed to extinguish it, and her spirits lifted. After the scene that morning, Wynne had apologised to Julian for Kev's behaviour. The doctor had been amused rather than disconcerted. He is exactly as you described, Julian had said, adding ruefully, only more. More was a fitting word to apply to Kev, she thought. There was nothing understated about him. She stopped and waited, smiling as he came to her. His gaze swept over her, not missing a detail of the simple pink walking gown and matching jacket. You're dressed now, Mary Penn remarked, as if surprised she wasn't parading naked through the lobby. This is a walking dress, she said. I'm going out for my daily constitutional. Who's escorting you? he asked, even though he could see the footman standing a few feet away. Charles, she replied. Only Charles? Mary Penn looked outraged. You need more protection than that. We're only walking to Marble Arch and back, she said, amused. Have you lost your mind? Do you have any idea what could happen to you at Hyde Park? There are pickpockets and thieves waiting to pluck a nice little pigeon like you. Do you think the sight of Charles is going to ward them off? Rather than take offence, the footman said eagerly, Perhaps Mr. Mary Penn has a point, Miss Hathaway. It is rather far, and one never knows. Are you offering to go in his stead? Wynne asked Mary Penn. As she had expected, he put on a show of grumbling reluctance. I suppose so. He frowned at Charles. You needn't go. I'd rather not have to look after you too. Yes, sir, came the footman's grateful reply, and he went back up the stairs with considerably more enthusiasm than he had shown while descending. Wynne slipped her hand through Kev's arm and felt the fierce tension in his muscles. Something had upset him, she realised, Something far more than her exercise costume or the prospective walk to Hyde Park. They left the hotel, Kev's long strides easily keeping measure with her brisk ones. Wynne kept her tone casual and cheerful. I smell smoke. It's London, he said, steering her around a puddle as if it might cause mortal harm to get her feet wet. The air always smells this way. Actually. It's your coat. Where did you and Cam go this morning? To a place called No Man's Land, where he thought we might find someone from my tribe. And did you? She asked softly, knowing the subject was a sensitive one, a restless shift of the muscle beneath her hand. At his lack of response, she urged, Tell me. Seeing how closely she was studying him, Kev sighed. In my tribe... There was a girl named Shuri. Wynne felt a pang of jealousy. A girl he'd known and never mentioned. We found her today in the camp, Kev continued. She hardly looks the same. Much older than her years. Oh, that's too bad, Wynne said, trying to sound sincere. Her husband, the Rombaro, was my uncle. He was not a good man. That was hardly a surprise, considering the condition Kev had been in when Wynne had first met him. Wynne was filled with compassion and tenderness. She wished they were in some private place, where she could coax Kev to tell her everything. She wished she could embrace him, not as a lover, but as a loving friend. A pair of street sellers, one bearing bundles of watercress, the other carrying umbrellas, approached them hopefully. One glance from Kev caused them to retreat. Wynne didn't say anything for a minute or two, just held Kev's arm as he guided her along with exasperating bossiness, muttering, Don't step there, or Come this way, or Tread carefully here, as if stepping on broken or uneven pavement might result in severe injury. Kev, she finally protested, I'm not fragile. I know that. You must stop trying to protect me. Not while I live. Wynne was quiet, gripping his arm more tightly. 
The passion buried beneath the rough, simple words filled her with almost indecent pleasure. So easily he could touch the depths of her heart. I'd rather not be put on a pedestal, she finally said. You're not on a pedestal. You're... But Kev checked the words with a vaguely impatient shake of his head, struggling for his usual self-possession. Whatever had happened that day, it had rattled him. I know Cam's been searching for someone from his past, or yours, she said thoughtfully, to see if anyone can explain why you and he have matching tattoos. Did the woman you met today reveal anything about the connection between you? What did you and Cam find out from this woman? she asked. She said, well, she told me, he hesitated, more unnerved than Wynne had ever seen him. Kev. Wynne eased her pace, forcing him to go more slowly as well. Before I left for France, I had little to do except observe the people in my sphere. I noticed things no one else had time to notice or think about, especially when it came to you. And I've always been struck by the similarities between you and Cam. The tilt of his head, that half-smile he has, the way he gestures with his hands, just like you. Mary Penn stopped completely. He turned to face her, standing right there on the street, while other pedestrians were forced to go around them, muttering about how inconsiderate it was for people to block a public footpath. Gripping her hands, he spoke so quietly she could barely hear him. He's my younger brother. Wynne stared up at him in wonder. I'm so glad for you, for both of you. All those times you thought you were alone in the world, he was out there. You just didn't know it. Kev broke out into a wry grin. It would have to be him. He pulled her arm through his, and they began walking again. If you and Cam are brothers, Wynne said, you're half Gajo, just like he is. Yes. He paused to mull over the discovery. I'm not surprised. I've always felt I was Romany and something other. When are you going to talk to the family about it? she asked softly. Knowing Kev, he would keep the information private until he'd sorted through all its implications. I'm not sure. Cam and I have to find out a few things first, including why our father, or his family, wanted to kill us. They did? My God, why? My guess is that it was probably some question of inheritance. With Gaja, it usually comes down to money. So bitter, Wynne said, clinging more tightly to his arm. I have reason. You have reason to be happy as well. You have found a brother today. And you found out that you're half Irish. That actually drew a rumble of amusement from him. That should make me happy. The Irish are a remarkable race. And I see it in you. Your love of land. Your tenacity. My love of brawling. Yes. Well, perhaps you should continue to keep that part under wraps. As Wynne saw the smile on his face, she felt a ripple of delight spread all through her. You should smile more, Kev. Should I? he asked softly. Oh, yes. It's good for your health. Dr. Harrow says his cheerful patients tend to recover much faster than the sour ones. The mention of Dr. Harrow caused the elusive smile to vanish. Ramsay says you've become close with him. Dr. Harrow is a friend, she allowed. Only a friend? So far. Would you object if he wished to court me? Of course not, Mary Penn muttered. What right would I have to object? None at all. Unless you had staked some prior claim, which you certainly have not. She sensed Kev's inner struggle to let the matter drop. A struggle he lost, for he said abruptly, You could do better. Wynne fought to hold back a satisfied grin. The small display of jealousy was a balm to her spirits. Dr. Harrow's a man of substance and character. He's a watery-eyed, pale-faced gajo. He's very attractive, 
and his eyes aren't at all watery. Has he kissed you? Kev, we're on a public thoroughfare. Has he? Once, she admitted, and waited as he digested the information. He scowled ferociously at the pavement before them. When it became apparent he wasn't going to say anything, Wynne volunteered. It was a gesture of affection. Still no response. Stubborn ox, she thought in annoyance. It wasn't like your kisses. And we've never, she felt a blush rising. We've never done anything similar to what you and I, the other night. We're not going to discuss that. Why can we discuss Dr. Harrow's kisses but not yours? Because my kisses won't lead to courtship. That hurt. It also puzzled and frustrated her. Before all was said and done, Wynne intended to make Kev admit just why he wouldn't pursue her. But not here and not now. Well, I do have a chance of courtship with Dr. Harrow, she said, attempting a pragmatic tone. And at my age, I must consider any marriage prospect quite seriously. Your age, he scoffed. You're only twenty-five. Twenty-six. And even at twenty-five, I would be considered long in the tooth. I lost several years, my best ones, perhaps, because of my illness. You're more beautiful now than you ever were. Any man would be mad or blind not to want you. The compliment was given with a sincerity that heightened her blush. Thank you, Kev. He slid her a guarded look. You want to marry? Wynne's willful, treacherous heart gave a few painfully excited thuds, because it sounded very much like, You want to marry me? But no, he was merely asking her opinion of marriage as, well, as her scholarly father would have said, as a concept with the potential for realization. Yes, of course, she said. I want children to love. I want a husband to grow old with. I want a family of my own. And Harrow says all of that's possible now? Wynne hesitated a bit too long. Yes, completely. But Kev knew her too well. What aren't you telling me? I'm well enough to do anything I choose now, she said firmly. What does he... I don't wish to discuss it. You have your forbidden topics, I have mine. You know I'll find out, he said quietly. Wynne ignored that, casting her gaze to the park before them. Her eyes widened as she saw something that had not been there when she had left for France. A huge, magnificent structure of glass and iron. Is that the Crystal Palace? Oh, it must be. It's so beautiful. The building, which covered an area of more than nine acres, housed an international show of art and science called the Great Exhibition. Wynne had read about it in the French newspapers, which had called the exhibition one of the great wonders of the world. How long has it been since it was completed? she asked, her step quickening as they headed toward the glittering building. Not quite a month. Have you been inside? Have you seen any exhibits? I've visited once, Kev said, smiling at her eagerness. And I saw a few of the exhibits, but not all. It would take three days or more to look at everything. Which part did you go to? The machinery court, mostly. I do wish I could see even a small part of it, she said wistfully, watching the throngs of visitors exiting and entering the remarkable building. Won't you take me? We won't have time to see anything. It's already afternoon. I'll bring you tomorrow. No, please. She tugged impatiently on his arm. Oh, Kev, don't say no. As Kev looked down at her, he was so handsome that she felt a pleasant little ache at the pit of her stomach. How could I say no to you? He asked softly. As he took her to the towering, arched entrance of the Crystal Palace and paid a shilling each for their admission, Wynne gazed at her surroundings in awe. The driving force behind the exhibition of industrial design had been Prince Albert, a man of vision and wisdom. 
According to the tiny printed map given out with the tickets, the building itself was constructed of over a thousand iron columns and three hundred thousand panes of glass. Parts of it were tall enough to encompass full-grown elm trees. All totaled, there were one hundred thousand exhibits from around the world. The exhibition was important in a social sense as well as a scientific one. It provided an opportunity for all classes and regions, the high and low, to mingle freely beneath one roof in a way that seldom happened. People with all manner of dress and appearance crowded inside the building. After scrutinizing the list of courts and displays, Wynne said decisively, "Fabrics and textiles." He escorted her through a crowded glass hallway into a room of astonishing size and breadth. The air chattered with the sounds of looms and textile machinery, with carpet bales arranged around the room and down the centre. Goods from Kidderminster, America, Spain, France, the Orient, filled the room with a rainbow of hues and textures. Wynne removed her gloves and ran her hands over the gorgeous offerings. Kev, look at this! She exclaimed. It's a Wilton carpet, similar to Brussels, but the pile is sheared. It feels like velvet, doesn't it? The manufacturer's representative, who was standing nearby, said, "Wilton has become quite affordable now that we're able to produce it on steam-powered looms." Where is the factory located? Mary Penn asked, running a bare hand over the soft carpet pile. Kidderminster, I assume. There and another in Glasgow. As the men talked, Wynne wandered along the rows of samples and displays. There were more machines. Bewildering in their size and complexity, some made to weave fabrics, some to print patterns, some to spin tufts of wool into yarn and worsted. One of them was used in a demonstration of how stuffing mattresses and pillows would some day be mechanized. Watching in fascination, Wynne was aware of Mary Penn coming to stand beside her. This makes me wonder if everything in the world will eventually be done by machine, she told him. He smiled slightly. If we had time, I would take you to the agricultural exhibits. A man can grow twice as much food with a fraction of the time and labor it would take to do by hand. We've already acquired a threshing machine for the Ramsay estate tenants. I'll show it to you when we go there. You approve of these technological advances? Wynne asked with a touch of surprise. Yes. Why wouldn't I? The Rom doesn't believe in such things. He shrugged. Regardless of what the Rom believes, I can't ignore progress that will improve life for everyone else. Mechanization will make it easier for common people to afford clothing, food, soap, even a carpet for the floor. But what about the men who will lose their livelihood when a machine takes their place? New industries and more jobs are being created. Why put a man to work doing mindless tasks instead of educating him to do something more? Win smiled. You speak like a reformist, she whispered impishly. Economic change is always accompanied by social change. No one can stop that. What an adept mind he had, Win thought. Her father would have been pleased by how his gypsy foundling had turned out. A large workforce will be required to support all this industry," she commented. "Do you suppose?" She was interrupted by an explosive puff and a few cries of surprise from the visitors around them. A flurry of down filled the air in a choking gust. It seemed the pillow stuffing machine had malfunctioned, sending eddies of feathers and down over everyone in sight. Reacting swiftly. Mary Penn stripped off his coat and pulled it over Win. In a moment, he reached in to clamp a handkerchief over her mouth and nose. "Breathe through this," he muttered, and hauled her through the room. The crowd was scattering, some people coughing, some swearing, some laughing, as great volumes of fluffy white down settled over the scene. Cries of delight came from children who had come from the next room. Dancing and hopping to try to catch the elusive floating clumps. Mary Penn didn't stop. 
until they'd reached another nave that housed a fabric court. Enormous woodcases had been built for flowing displays of fabric. Emerging from beneath Mary Penn's coat, Wynne took one look at him and began to gasp with laughter. White down had covered his black hair and clung to his clothes like new-fallen snow. Mary Penn's expression of concern changed to a scowl. I was going to ask if you had breathed any of the feather dust, he said, but judging from all the noise you're making, your lungs seem quite clear. Wynne couldn't reply. She was laughing too hard. As Mary Penn raked his hand through the midnight locks of his hair, the down became even more enmeshed. Don't, Wynne managed, struggling to restrain her laughter. You'll never. No, let me help you. You're making it worse. And you called me a pigeon to be plucked. Chortling, she snatched his hand and tugged him into a narrow corridor formed of vertical fabric bolts. They stopped at the end, where they were partially concealed from view. Here, before anyone sees us. Oh, you're too tall for me. She urged him to the floor with her, where he lowered to his haunches. Wynne knelt amid the mass of her skirts. Untying her bonnet, she tossed it to the side. Mary Penn watched Wynne's face as she went to work, brushing at his shoulders and hair. You can't be enjoying this, he said. Silly man, you're covered in feathers. Of course I'm enjoying it. And she was. He looked so adorable, frowning while she de-feathered him and it was lovely to play with the thick, shiny layers of his hair, which he never would have allowed in other circumstances. Her giggles kept frothing up, impossible to suppress. But as a minute passed, and then another, the laughter left her throat, and she felt relaxed and almost dreamlike as she continued to pull the fluff from his hair. The sound of the crowds was muffled by the velvet and chiffon draped all around them, like curtains of night and clouds and mist. Kev held still, the contours of his face stern and beautiful. Almost done, Wynne whispered, although she was already finished. Her fingers sifted gently through his hair. So vibrant, heavy, the shorn locks like velvet pile at the back of his neck. Her breath caught as Kev moved, at first, she thought he was rising to his feet, but he tugged her closer and took her head in his hands. His mouth was so close, his exhalations like steam against her lips. I have nothing to offer you, he finally said in a guttural voice. Nothing. Wynne's lips had turned dry. She moistened them and tried to speak through a thrill of anxious trembling. You have yourself, she whispered. You don't know me. You and your family. All you know of life comes from books. If you understood anything... Make me understand. Tell me what's so terrible that you keep pushing me away. He shook his head. Then stop torturing the both of us, she said unsteadily. Leave me. Or let me go. I can't he snapped. I can't damn you! And before she could make a sound, he kissed her. Her heart thundered, and she opened to him with a low, despairing moan. Her nostrils were filled with the fragrance of smoke and man and the earthy autumn spice of him. His mouth shaped to hers with primitive hunger, his tongue stabbing deep, searching hungrily. They knelt together more tightly, as Wynne rose to press her torso against his, closer, harder, and every place they touched, she ached. She wanted to feel his skin, his muscles bunched and hard beneath her hands. The desire fled high and wild, leaving no room for sanity. If only he would press her back among all this velvet, here and now, and have his way with her. She thought of taking him inside her body, and she flushed beneath her clothes until the crawling heat made her squirm. His mouth searched her throat, and her head tipped back to give him free access. He found the throb of her pulse, his tongue stroking the vulnerable spot until she gasped. 
Reaching up to his face, she shaped her fingers over his jaw, the heavy grain of shaven beard scraping deliciously against her palms. She guided his mouth back to hers. Pleasure filled her as she was blindfolded by the darkness and the sensation of him all around her. Kev, she whispered in between kisses, I've loved you for so long. He crushed her mouth with his desperately, as if he could smother not only the words but the emotion itself. He stole as deep a taste of her as possible, ardently determined to leave nothing unclaimed. She clung to him, her body racked with sustained shivers, her nerves singing with incandescent heat. He was all she had ever wanted, all she would ever need. But a sharp breath was torn from her throat as he pushed her back, breaking the warm, necessary contact between their bodies. For a long moment, neither of them moved, both striving to recover equilibrium. And as the glow of desire faded, Wynne heard Kev say roughly, I can't be alone with you. This can't happen again. This, Wynne decided with a surge of anger, was an impossible situation. Kev refused to acknowledge his feelings for her and wouldn't explain why. Surely she deserved more trust from him than that. Very well, she said stiffly, struggling to her feet. As Kev stood and reached for her, she pushed impatiently at his hand. No, I don't want help. She began to shake out her skirts. You are absolutely right, Kev. We shouldn't be alone together, since the pattern is always the same. You make an advance, I respond, and then you push me away. I'm not a child's toy to be pulled back and forth on a string. He found her bonnet and handed it to her. I know you're not. You say I don't know you, she said furiously. Apparently, it hasn't occurred to you that you don't know me either. I've changed during the past two years. You might at least make the effort to find out what kind of woman I've become. She went to the end of the fabric corridor, made certain the coast was clear, and stepped out into the main part of the court. Kev was at her heels. Where are you going? Glancing at him, Wynne was satisfied to see that he looked as rumpled and exasperated as she felt. I'm leaving. I'm too cross to enjoy any of the displays now. Go the other direction. Wynne was silent as Kev led her from the Crystal Palace. She had never felt so unsettled or peevish. It annoyed her that he didn't say a word. It annoyed her that he kept pace so easily with her brisk, ground-digging strides, and that when she had begun to breathe hard from exertion, he wasn't even affected by the exercise. Only when they approached the Rutledge did Wynne break the silence. I've been given a rare opportunity, Kev, a second chance at life. I intend to make the most of it. I'm not going to waste my love on a man who doesn't want or need it. I won't bother you again. When Cam entered the bedroom of their suite, he found Amelia standing before a towering pile of parcels and boxes overflowing with ribbons and silk and feminine adornments. She turned with a sheepish smile as he closed the door, her heart tripping a little at the sight of him. His collarless shirt was open at the throat, his body almost feline in its lithe muscularity, his face riveting in its sensuous male beauty. Not long ago, she would never have envisioned being married at all, much less to such an exotic creature. His gaze chased lightly over her, the pink velvet dressing gown open to reveal her chemise and naked thighs. I see the shopping expedition was a success. I don't know what came over me, Amelia replied, a touch apologetically. You know I'm never extravagant. I only meant to purchase some handkerchiefs and some stockings, but... She gestured lamely to the piles of fripperies. I seem to have been in an acquisitive mood today. A grin flashed across his face. As I've told you before, love, spend as much as you like. You couldn't beggar me if you tried. I bought some things for you, too, she said, rummaging through the pile. 
some cravats and books and French shaving soap, although I've been meaning to discuss that with you. Discuss what? Cam approached her from behind, kissing the side of her throat. Amelia drew in a breath at the hot imprint of his mouth and nearly forgot what she'd been saying. You're shaving, she said vaguely. Beards are becoming quite fashionable of late. I think you should try a goatee. You would look very dashing and... Her voice faded as he worked his way down her neck. It might tickle, Cam murmured and laughed as she shivered. Gently turning her to face him, he stared into her eyes. There was something different about him, she thought, a curious vulnerability she had never seen before. Cam, she said carefully, how did your errand with Mary Pen go? The amber eyes were soft and alive with excitement. Quite well. I have a secret, Monisha. Shall I tell you? He drew her against him, wrapping his arms around her, and he whispered into her ear. Chapter 12 Kev was in a devil of a temper that evening, for many reasons, most especially that Wynne was being friendly to him, polite, courteous, damnably nice, and he was in no position to object, since this was precisely what he'd wanted but he hadn't expected there was one thing even worse than having Wynne glance at him with longing. And that was indifference. To Kev, she was affable, even affectionate, in the same way she was with Leo or Cam. She treated Kev as if he were a brother. He could hardly bear it. The Hathaways gathered in the eating area of their suite, laughing and joking about the close quarters as they sat at the table. It was the first time in years they'd all been able to dine together. Kev, Leo, Amelia, Wynne, Poppy and Beatrix, with the additions of Cam, Miss Marks and Dr. Harrow. Although Miss Marks had tried to demur, they had insisted that she dine with the family. After all, Poppy had said, laughing, how else will we know how to behave? Someone must save us from ourselves. Miss Marks had relented, although it was clear that she would have preferred to be elsewhere. She took up as small a space as possible, a narrow, colourless figure wedged between Beatrix and Dr. Harrow. The governess rarely looked up from her plate, except when Leo was speaking. Although her eyes were partially concealed by the spectacles, Kev suspected they held nothing but dislike for the Hathaway's brother. It seemed that Miss Marks and Leo had found in each other the personification of everything they disliked most. Leo couldn't stand humorless or judgmental people, and he'd immediately taken to referring to the governess as Satan in petticoats. And Miss Marks, for her part, despised rakes. The more charming they were, the deeper her loathing. Most of the dinner conversation centred on the subject of Harrow's clinic, which the Hathaways regarded as a miraculous enterprise. The women fawned on Harrow to a nauseating degree, delighting in his commonplace remarks. Kev loathed Harrow, although he wasn't certain if it was because of the man himself or because Wynne's affections were at stake. The man was obnoxiously perfect, a good-humoured sort who seemed never to take himself too seriously. He shouldered heavy responsibility that of life and death itself, and yet carried it lightly. He was witty and insightful, but never tried to draw attention to himself. Kev watched Wynne circumspectly, unable to tell exactly what her feelings for Harrow were. Her face gave away nothing. But Kev recognised something in the doctor's expression, a haunting echo of his own fascination for Wynne. Midway through the gruesomely pleasant dinner, Kev became aware that Amelia, who was seated at the end of the table, was unusually quiet. He looked at her closely, realising her colour was off and her cheeks were sweaty. Since he was seated at her immediate left, Kev leaned close and whispered, What is it? Amelia gave him a distracted glance. Ill, she whispered back, swallowing weakly. I feel so. Oh, Mary Penn, do help me away from the table. Without another word, 
Kev pushed his chair back and helped her up. Cam, who was at the other end of the long table, looked at them sharply. Amelia, she's ill, Kev said. Cam reached them in a flash, his face taut with anxiety. As he took Amelia from Kev and carried her, protesting from the room, one would think she'd suffered a severe injury rather than a probable case of indigestion. Perhaps I might be of service, Dr. Harrow said with quiet concern, laying his napkin on the table as he made to follow. Thank you, Wynne said, smiling at him gratefully. I'm so glad you're here. Kev could barely keep from gnashing his teeth in jealousy as Harrow left the room. The rest of the meal was largely neglected, the family going to the main receiving room to wait for a report on Amelia. It took an unnervingly long time for anyone to appear. What could be the matter? Beatrix asked plaintively. Amelia's never ill. She'll be fine, Wynne soothed. Dr. Harrow will take excellent care of her. Perhaps I should go to their room. Poppy said, and ask how she is. But before anyone could offer an opinion, Cam appeared in the doorway of the receiving room. He looked bemused, his hazel eyes vivid as he glanced at the assorted family members around him. He appeared to search for words. Then a dazzling smile appeared, despite his obvious effort to moderate it. Amelia's with child! A chorus of happy exclamations greeted the revelation. Leo laughed quietly. She'll adore having someone new to manage. Kev watched Wynne from across the room. He was fascinated by the momentary wistfulness that hazed her expression. If he had ever doubted how much she wanted children of her own, it was clear to him then. As he stared at her, a flush of warmth rose in him, strengthening and thickening, until he realized what it was. He was aroused his body yearning to give her what she wanted. He longed to hold her, love her, take her to bed. The reaction was so barbaric and inappropriate, it mortified him. Seeming to feel his gaze, Wynne glanced in his direction. She gave him an arrested stare, as if she could see down to all the raw heat inside him. And then she looked away in swift rejection. Excusing himself from the receiving room, Cam went back to Amelia, who was sitting on the edge of the bed. Dr. Harrow had left the bedchamber to allow them privacy. Cam closed the door and leaned back against it, letting his caressing gaze fall on the small, tense form of his wife. He knew little of these matters. Pregnancy and childbirth were a strictly female domain. But he did know his wife was uneasy in situations she had no control over, he also knew that women in her condition needed reassurance and tenderness, and he had an inexhaustible supply of both for her. Nervous, Cam asked softly, approaching her. Oh, no, not in the least. It's an ordinary circumstance, and only to be expected after— Amelia broke off with a little gasp as he sat and pulled her into his arms. Yes, I'm nervous. I wish— I wish I could talk to my mother. Of course, Amelia liked to manage everything, to be authoritative and competent no matter what she did. But the process of childbearing would be one of increasing dependence and helplessness, until the final stage when nature took over entirely. Cam pressed his lips into her gleaming dark hair, which smelled like sweetbriar. He began to rub her back in the way he knew she liked best. We'll find some experienced women for you to talk to. Lady Westcliff, perhaps. You like her, and God knows she would be forthright. And for the next nine months, you'll let me take care of you, and spoil you, and give you anything you want. He felt her relax a little. Amelia, love, he murmured. I've wanted this for so long. Have you? She smiled and snuggled tightly against him. So have I although I'd hoped it would happen at a more convenient time, when Ramsay House was finished, and Poppy was betrothed, and the family was settled. Trust me, with the Hathaways there will never be a convenient time. Cam eased her back to lie on the bed with him. What a pretty little mother you'll be, he whispered, cuddling her. 
with your blue eyes and your pink cheeks, and your belly round with my child. When I grow large, I hope you won't strut and swagger, and point to me as an example of your virility. I do that already, Monisha. Amelia looked up into his smiling eyes. I can't imagine how this happened. You can't. She chuckled and put her arms around his neck. I meant since I've been taking preventative measures. All those cups of nasty-tasting tea. And I still ended up conceiving. Rom, Cam said by way of explanation, and kissed her passionately. When Amelia felt well enough to join the other women for tea in the receiving room, the men went downstairs to the Rutledge's gentlemen's room. Although the room was ostensibly for the use of hotel guests, it had become a favourite haunt of the peerage, who wished to share the company of the Rutledge's many notable foreign visitors. The ceilings were comfortably dark and low, panelled in glowing rosewood, the floors covered in thick Wilton carpeting. The gentleman's room was cornered with large, deep apses that provided private spaces for reading, drinking, and conversing. The main space was furnished with velvet upholstered chairs and tables laden with cigar boxes and newspapers. Servants moved unobtrusively through the room, bringing snifters of warmed brandy and glasses of port. Settling in one of the unoccupied octagonal apses, Kev requested brandy for the table. Yes, Mr. Merripin, the servant said, hastening to comply. What well-trained staff, Dr. Harrow remarked. I find it commendable that they provide service to you. Kev slanted him a questioning glance. Why wouldn't they? I assume a gentleman of your origin, he began, and stopped with obvious chagrin. I apologize. I'm not usually so tactless. Kev gave him a short nod, to indicate no offence had been taken. Harrow turned to Cam, seeking to change the subject. If you like, I could recommend a colleague to attend Mrs. Rowan during the remainder of your stay in London. I'm acquainted with many excellent physicians here. I'd appreciate that, Cam said, accepting a brandy from a servant. Although I don't think we'll remain in London much longer. Winifred seems to be very fond of children. Harrow mused. In light of her condition, it's fortunate that she'll have nieces and nephews to dote on. The other three men looked at him sharply. Cam had paused in the act of lifting the brandy to his lips. Condition? he asked. Being unable to have children of her own, Harrow clarified. What the devil do you mean, Harrow? Leo asked. Haven't we all been trumpeting about my sister's miraculous recovery— Due to your stellar efforts. She's recovered indeed, my lord. Harrow frowned thoughtfully as he stared into his brandy snifter. But she'll always be somewhat fragile. In my opinion, she should never try to conceive. In all likelihood, the process would result in her death. A heavy silence followed the pronouncement. Even Leo, who usually affected an air of insouciance, couldn't manage to conceal his reaction. Have you made my sister aware of this? he asked. Because she gave me the impression she fully expects to marry and have her own family some day. I've discussed it with her, of course, Harrow replied. I told her if she marries, it would have to be a childless union. He paused. However, Winifred isn't yet ready to accept the idea. In time, I hope to persuade her to adjust her expectations. He smiled slightly. Motherhood, after all, isn't necessary for every woman's happiness, much as society glorifies the notion. Cam stared at him intently. My sister-in-law will find that a disappointment, to say the least. Yes, but she'll live longer and enjoy a higher quality of life as a childless woman. She'll learn to accept her altered circumstances. That's her strength. He sipped some brandy before continuing. She was probably never destined for childbearing, even before the scarlet fever. Such a narrow frame. Elegant, but hardly ideal for breeding purposes. Kev tossed back his brandy, letting the amber fire wash down his throat. 
He pushed back from the table and stood, unable to bear another moment of the bastard's proximity. The mention of Wynne's narrow frame was the last straw. Excusing himself with a rough mutter, he walked out of the hotel and into the night. His senses drew in the cool air, the foul, sharp city smells, the stirring of a London evening coming to life. Christ! He wanted to be away from this place. He wanted to take Wynne to the country with him, to some place that was fresh and wholesome, away from the gleaming Dr. Harrow, whose fastidious perfection filled Kev with dread. Every instinct warned that Wynne wasn't safe from Harrow. But she wasn't safe from him either. His own mother had died giving birth. The thought of killing Wynne with his own body his spawn swelling inside her until his entire being shied at the thought. His deepest terror was harming her, losing her. Kev wanted to talk to Wynne, listen to her feelings, help her somehow to come to terms with the limitations she'd been given. But he'd put a barrier between them, and now he didn't dare cross it. Because if Harrow's flaw was a lack of empathy, Kev's was just the opposite. Too much feeling too much need, enough to kill her. Later that evening, Cam came to Kev's room. Kev had just returned from his walk, a glaze of evening mist still clinging to his coat and hair. Answering the knock at the door, Kev stood at the threshold and scowled. What is it? I had a private talk with Harrow, Cam said, his face expressionless. And... He wants to marry Wynne. He intends the marriage to be in name only. She doesn't know it yet. Bloody hell, Kev muttered. She'll be the latest addition to his collection of fine objects. She'll stay chaste while he has his affairs. I don't think she'll marry him, Cam murmured. Especially if you offer her an alternative, Ral. There's only one alternative, and that's to stay safe with her family. You could offer for her. That's not possible. Why not? Kev felt his face burn. I couldn't stay celibate with her. I could never hold to it. There are ways to prevent conception. That elicited a contemptuous snort from Kev. That worked well for you, didn't it? He rubbed his face wearily. You know the other reasons I can't offer for her. I know the way you once lived. Cam said, choosing his words with obvious care. I understand your fear of harming her, but in spite of all that, I find it hard to believe that you would really let her go to another man. I would if that was best for her. Can you actually say the best Winifred Hathaway deserves is someone like Harrow? Better him, Kev managed to say, than someone like me. Although the social season wasn't yet over, it was agreed the family would go to Hampshire. There was Amelia's condition to consider. She'd be better off in the healthful surroundings, and Wynne and Leo wanted to see the Ramsay estate. The only question was the fairness of depriving Poppy and Beatrix of the remainder of the season, but they both claimed to be quite happy to quit London. This attitude was not unexpected coming from Beatrix, who still seemed far more interested in books and animals and romping through the countryside. But Leo was surprised that Poppy, who was candid about wanting to find a husband, would be so willing to depart. I've seen all this season's prospects, Poppy told Leo grimly as they rode through Hyde Park in an open carriage. Not one of them is worth staying in town for. Beatrix sat in the opposite seat, with Dodger the ferret curled in her lap, Miss Marks had wedged herself in the corner, an accumulation of pointy elbows and angular bones. Her bespectacled gaze stayed fixed on the scenery. Clearly, Catherine Marks hated men, which Leo wouldn't have blamed her for, since he was well aware of the faults of his gender. Except that she didn't seem to like women very much either. The only people she seemed to unbend with were Poppy and Beatrix, who had reported that Miss Marks was exceptionally intelligent and could be witty at times, and she had a lovely smile. 
Leo had a difficult time imagining the tight little seam of Miss Marx's mouth curving in a smile. He rather doubted she even had teeth, since he'd never seen them. She'll ruin the view, he had complained that morning, when Poppy and Beatrix had told him they were bringing her on their drive. I won't enjoy the scenery, with the grim reaper casting her shadow over it. Don't call her horrid names, Leo, Beatrix had protested. I like her very much, and she's very nice when you're not around. I believe she was treated very wrongly by a man in her past, Poppy said sotto voce. In fact, I've heard a rumour or two that Miss Marks became a governess because she was involved in a scandal. Leo was interested despite himself. What kind of scandal? Poppy lowered her voice to a whisper. They say she squandered her favours. She doesn't seem like a woman who would squander her favours, Beatrix said in a normal voice. Hush, be, Poppy exclaimed. I don't want Miss Marks to overhear. She might think we were gossiping about her. But we are gossiping about her. Besides, I don't believe she would do, you know, that with anyone. She doesn't seem at all that sort of woman. As the carriage passed Marble Arch and proceeded to Park Lane, Miss Marks glued her gaze to the spring floral displays. Glancing at her idly, Leo noted that she had a decent profile, a sweet little tip of a nose supporting the spectacles, a gently rounded chin. Too bad the clenched mouth and frowning forehead ruined the rest of it. He turned his attention back to Poppy, pondering her lack of desire to stay in London. Surely any other girl her age would have been begging to finish the season and enjoy all the balls and parties. Tell me about this season's prospects, he said to Poppy. She shook her head. I've met a few whom I do like, such as Lord Bromley or... Bromley? Leo repeated, his brows lifting. But he's twice your age. What about someone born in this century? Well, there's Mr. Radstock. Portly and plodding, Leo said. Who else? There is Lord Woolscourt. Very gentle and friendly, but he's a rabbit. Curious and cuddly, Beatrix asked, having a high opinion of rabbits. Poppy smiled. No, I meant he was rather colourless and, oh, just rabbity, which is a fine thing in a pet, but not a husband. I'm sorry, Poppy, Leo said gently. I wish I knew a fellow to recommend to you, but the only ones I know are ne'er-do-wells and drunkards. Excellent friends, but I'd rather shoot one of them than have him as a brother-in-law. That leads to something I've wanted to ask you. Oh? He looked into her sweet, serious face, this perfectly lovely sister who aspired so desperately to have a calm and ordinary life. Now that I've been out in society, Poppy said, I've heard rumours. Leo's smile turned rueful as he understood what she wanted to know. About me? Yes. Are you really as wicked as some people say? Despite the private nature of the query, Leah was aware of both Miss Marks and Beatrix turning their full attention to him. I'm afraid so, darling, he said, while a sordid parade of his past sins swept through his mind. Why? Poppy asked, with a frankness he ordinarily would have found endearing, but not with Miss Marks's sanctimonious gaze fastened on him. I often find no compelling reason to be good. What about earning a place in heaven? Catherine Marks asked. He would have thought she had a pretty voice if it hadn't come from such an unappealing source. Isn't that reason enough to conduct yourself with basic decency? That depends, he said sardonically. What's heaven to you, Miss Marks? She considered the question with more care than he would have expected. Peace? Serenity? A place where there is no sin, gossip, or conflict. Well, Miss Marks, I'm afraid your idea of heaven is my idea of hell. Turning back to Poppy, he spoke far more kindly. Don't lose hope, sis. There's someone out there waiting for you. Some day you'll find him, 
and he'll be everything you were hoping for. Do you really think so? Poppy asked. No, but I've always thought that was a nice thing to say to someone in your circumstances. Poppy snickered and poked Leo in the side, while Miss Marks gave him a stare of pure disgust. Chapter 13 On their last evening in London, the family attended a private ball given at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Simon Hunt in Mayfair. Mr. Hunt, a railway entrepreneur and part owner of a British locomotive works, was a self-made man, the son of a London butcher. He was part of a new and growing class of investors, businessmen and managers who were unsettling the long-held traditions and authority of the peerage itself. The Hunt Mansion could well have been described as the symbol of the success of private enterprise. Large, luxurious, and technologically advanced, the house was lit with gas in every room and filled with plasterwork made from modern, flexible moulds that were currently being displayed at the Crystal Palace. Floor-length windows gave access to broad walks and gardens outside, not to mention a remarkable, glass-roofed conservatory heated with a complex system of underfloor pipework. Just before the Hathaways arrived at the Hunt Mansion, Miss Marks whispered a few last-minute reminders to her charges, telling them not to fill their dance cards too quickly in case a prepossessing gentleman might arrive later at the ball, and never to be seen without their gloves, and never to refuse a gentleman who asked them to dance unless they were already engaged to dance with another. But by all means, they must never allow one gentleman more than three dances. Such excessive familiarity would cause gossip. Wynne was touched by the careful way in which Miss Marks relayed the instructions, and the earnest attention Poppy and Beatrix gave her. Clearly, the three of them had labored long and hard on the intricate labyrinth of etiquette. Wynne was at a disadvantage compared to her two younger sisters, having spent so much time away from London. I hope I won't embarrass any of you, she said lightly, though I should warn you that the chances of my making a social misstep are quite high. I hope you'll undertake to teach me as well, Miss Marks. The governess smiled a little, revealing even white teeth and soft lips. Wynne couldn't help thinking that if Miss Marks were a bit more filled out, she would be quite pretty. You have such a natural sense of propriety, she told Wynne. I can't imagine you being less than a perfect lady. Oh, Wynne never does anything wrong, Beatrix told Miss Marks. Wynne's a saint, Poppy agreed. It's very trying, but one must tolerate her. Wynne smiled at them. For your information, she told them lightly. I intend to break at least three rules of etiquette before the ball is over. Which ones? Poppy and Beatrix asked in unison. Miss Marks merely looked perplexed, as if she was trying to understand why anyone would deliberately do such a thing. I haven't decided yet. Wynne folded her gloved hands in her lap. I'll have to wait for the opportunities to present themselves. As the guests entered the mansion... Domestics came to take the cloaks and shawls and the gentlemen's hats and coats. Seeing Cam and Kev standing near each other, shrugging off their coats with the same gestures, Wynne smiled. She wondered why everyone couldn't see they were brothers. Their kinship was so clear to her, even though they weren't identical. The same wavy, dark hair, although Cam's was longer and Kev kept his neatly cropped. The same long, athletic build— although Cam was slimmer and more supple, whereas Kev had the sturdier, more muscular build of a boxer. Their greatest difference, however, was not that of their external appearances, but the way each approached the world. Cam, with a sense of amused tolerance and charm and shrewd confidence, and Kev, with his battered dignity and smouldering intensity and uncompromising sense of responsibility. Oh, how she wanted him! But he would not be easily won, if ever. Wynne thought it was rather like trying to coax a wild creature to come to her hand. The endless advances and retreats, the hunger and need for connection warring with fear. She wanted him even more 
as she saw him here among this glittering crowd, his aloof and powerful form dressed in the austere evening scheme of black and white. Kev did not consider himself inferior to the people around him, but he was well aware that he wasn't one of them. He understood their values, even though he didn't always agree with them. And he had learned how to acquit himself well in their world. He was the kind of man who would adapt to any circumstances. Melancholy swept over her as she glanced at the beautiful interior of the mansion, the guests laughing and chatting while music floated lightly over the scene. So much to enjoy and appreciate. And yet all Wynn wanted was to be alone with the most unavailable man in the room. However, she wasn't going to play the wallflower. She was going to dance and laugh and do all the things she had imagined for years while lying in her sickbed. And if it displeased Kev or made him jealous, so much the better. Divested of her cloak, Wynne went forward with her sisters. She was wearing a ball gown with a low bodice and wide triple skirts caught up in flounces. Underneath, she wore a light corset that straightened her back and pushed her breasts artificially high. But the mild discomfort was worth it when she saw Kev's reaction. His gaze travelled from the tip of one satin slipper peeking from beneath the hem to her face. A responsive shiver chased beneath the framework of Wynne's corset. With difficulty, she looked away from him. The Hathaways went farther into the entrance hall, where a chandelier shed sparkling light over the parquetry floor. They approached the hostess, Mrs. Annabel Hunt, who was greeting guests. Mrs. Hunt had been described as one of the great beauties of London, and Wynne instantly agreed. The woman had a beautifully turned figure and heavily lashed blue eyes and hair that gleamed with rich shades of honey and gold. But it was her lively and expressive countenance that made her truly bewitching. That's her husband standing next to her, Poppy murmured, glancing at the tall, powerful form of Simon Hunt, He's intimidating, but very nice. I beg to differ, Leo said. You don't think he's intimidating? Wynne asked. I don't think he's nice. Whenever I happen to be in the same room as his wife, he looks at me as if he'd like to dismember me. Well, Poppy said prosaically, one can't fault his judgment. She leaned toward Wynne and said, Mr. Hunt is besotted with his wife. A love match, you see. How unfashionable, Dr. Harrow commented with a grin. See how small her waist is, Poppy murmured to Win. And that's after three children. I'll have to lecture Mrs. Hunt on the evils of tight lacing, Dr. Harrow said sotto voce, and Wynne laughed. Not tonight, she told him. You're only allowed to be frivolous and have fun. As you wish, he said, his grey eyes twinkling. The group approached Mrs. Hunt, who greeted them all, and took both Wynne's hands. The mysterious missing Hathaway sister, she exclaimed. How happy I am to meet you at last, and find you in such good health. Thank you, Mrs. Hunt, Wynne said shyly. I'm honoured to be here. Mrs. Hunt's husband joined the conversation. Welcome back, my lord, he said to Leo. The news of your return is being celebrated throughout London. His gaze glinted with friendly mockery as he remarked, The gaming and hospitality industries have suffered from your absence. I'll do my best to reinvigorate the economy, Leo promised, and they exchanged a grin. Hunt reached out to shake hands with Kev, who was standing unobtrusively at the side of the group. Later this evening, Mary Penn, I want to hear your thoughts on the steam thresher you bought for the estate— I'm considering expanding my business into agricultural machinery. Have you seen the prototypes at the Great Exhibition? Kev asked. Indeed. We'll have to talk about them. Leo broke in then, bringing Julian Harrow forward. Mr. Hunt, I'd like to introduce Dr. Harrow, the physician who helped my sister to recover her health. A pleasure, sir, Dr. Harrow said, and shook Hunt's hand. Likewise. Hunt replied cordially, returning the shake, but he gave the doctor an odd, speculative look. 
You are the Harrow who runs the clinic in France. I am. And you reside there still? Yes. Although I try to visit friends and family in England as often as my schedule allows, I'm acquainted with your late wife's family, Hunt murmured. After a quick double blink, Harrow responded with a regretful smile. The Lanhams, estimable people. I haven't seen them for years. The memories, you understand. I understand, Hunt said. Wynne was puzzled by the long, awkward pause that followed, and the sense of confrontation between the two men. She glanced at her family, and Mrs. Hunt, none of whom seemed to understand either. Well, Mr. Hunt, Mrs. Hunt said brightly, shall we shock everyone by dancing together? They're going to play a waltz soon. Hunt's attention was immediately distracted by the flirtatious note in his wife's voice. He grinned at her. Always a pleasure, love. Harrow caught Wynne's gaze with his own. I haven't waltzed in far too long, he said. Might you save a place for me on your dance card? Of course, she replied, and placed a light hand on his proffered arm. They followed the hunts to the drawing room. It was a lovely ball, or would have been, if Kev had behaved like a reasonable human being. He watched Wynne constantly, and glared at every man who approached her, intimidating some of them into slinking away. Eventually, she went to him and whispered sharply, What do you think you're doing? If you're trying to ruin my evening, you're doing a splendid job of it. I want to dance, and you're frightening off everyone who approaches me. Leave me alone. She turned away and forced a smile to her lips as Julian Harrow approached. Miss Hathaway, he said, will you do me the honour? Yes, she said, before he could even finish the sentence. Taking his arm, she let him lead her toward the mass of swirling, waltzing couples. As she glanced over her shoulder, she saw Kev staring after her, and she sent him a narrow-eyed glance. He was the most infuriating man alive, a dog in the manger, refusing to have a relationship with her, and yet not allowing her to be with anyone else. Winifred, Julian Harrow said, his grey eyes concerned, this is far too splendid a night for you to be distressed. Were you arguing with Merripen? It was nothing, she said lightly, just another of our tiffs. She curtsied and Julian bowed, and he took her in his arms. His hand was firm on her back, guiding her easily as they danced. Julian's touch reawakened memories of the clinic, the way he had encouraged and helped her, the times he had been stern when she had needed it, and the times they had celebrated when she had reached another milestone in her progress. He was a good, kind, high-minded man, a handsome man. I could marry him she thought. He'd made it clear that all it would take was a bit of encouragement on her part. She could become a doctor's wife and live in the south of France and perhaps help with his work at the clinic. To do something positive and worthwhile with her life, wouldn't that be better than this? Anything was preferable to the pain of loving a man she couldn't have. Living in close proximity with Kev, she might become bitter and frustrated, she might even come to hate him. Julian swept her around the drawing room, guiding her carefully among the dancing couples. Wynne felt herself relaxing in his arms. This is what I dreamed of, she told him. Being able to do this, just like everyone else. His hand tightened on her waist. You're not at all like everyone else. You're the most beautiful, graceful woman here. You'll embarrass me. Wynne said, laughing. Perhaps I should. I'd like you to see me as someone other than predictable, tedious old Dr. Harrow. You're none of those things, she assured him. The waltz ended, and gentlemen began to lead their partners out of the dancing area, while others took their places. It's too crowded in here, Julian said. Come slip away with me for a moment. I would love to. He took her to a corner partially screened by some massive potted plants. At an opportune moment, he led her out of the drawing-room 
and into a huge glass conservatory filled with paths and indoor trees. Beyond the conservatory, the city bristled with chimneys that frosted the midnight sky with smoke. They sat on a bench, with wind skirts billowing around them. Julian turned partially to face her. Winifred, he murmured, and the timbre of his voice was low and intimate. Staring into his grey eyes, Wynne realised he was going to kiss her. You know why I've come to England, he said softly. I want to know you much better, my dear, in a way that wasn't possible at the clinic. I want... He paused at a sound from nearby. Together, he and Wynne glanced at the intruder. It was Kev, of course, huge and dark and aggressive as he strode toward them. Wynne's jaw sagged in disbelief. She felt like a hunted creature. For heaven's sake, was there no place she could evade his outrageous stalking? Go away, she said, enunciating each word. You're not my chaperone. You should be with your chaperone, Kev said. Not with him. Wynne had never found it so difficult to master her emotions. Her voice vibrated with tension as she turned to Julian. Would you be so kind as to leave us, Dr. Harrow? There's something I must settle with Mary Penn. Julian glanced from Kev's set face to hers. I'm not sure I should, he said slowly. He's been plaguing me all evening, Wynne said. I'm the only one who can put a stop to it. Very well. Julian stood from the bench. Where shall I wait for you? Back in the drawing room, Wynne replied, grateful that there was no argument from Julian. Clearly he respected her, and her abilities, enough to allow her to manage the situation. Thank you. She was barely aware of Julian's departure. She was so focused on Kev. She stormed over to him with a furious scowl. You're driving me mad! she exclaimed. I want you to stop this, Kev. Do you have any idea how ridiculous you're being? How badly you've behaved tonight? I've behaved badly. You were about to let yourself be compromised. Perhaps I want to be compromised. That's too bad, he said, reaching for her. I'm going to keep you safe. Don't touch me, Wynne snapped. I've been safe for years tucked safely in bed, watching everyone around me enjoying their lives. I've had enough safety to last a lifetime, Kev. And if you want me to spend the rest of my days alone and unloved, then you can go to the devil. You were never alone, he said harshly. You've never been unloved. I want to be loved as a woman, not as a child or a sister or an invalid. That's not how I... You're not even capable of such love. In the blaze of frustration, Wynne experienced something she had never felt before. The desire to hurt someone. You don't have it in you. Mary Penn moved through a shaft of moonlight that had slipped through the conservatory glass, and Wynne felt a little shock as she saw his expression. In just a few words, she had managed to cut him deeply, opening a vein of dark and furious feeling. He pulled her against him. All the fires of hell could burn for a thousand years, and it wouldn't equal what I feel for you in one minute of the day. I love you so much. There's no pleasure in it. Nothing but torment. Because if I could dilute what I feel for you to the millionth part, it would still be enough to kill you. And even if it drives me mad, I'd rather see you live in the arms of that cold, soulless bastard than die in mine. Before she could begin to comprehend what he'd said, and all the implications, he took her mouth with wild hunger. For a full minute, perhaps two, she couldn't even move, could only stand there helplessly, falling apart, every rational thought dissolving. She felt faint, but not from illness. Her hand fluttered to the back of his neck, the muscles rigid above the crisp edge of his collar, the locks of his hair like raw silk. Her fingers unconsciously caressed his nape, trying to soothe his hard, breathing fervour. His mouth slanted deeper over hers, his taste drugging and sweet. 
And then something quieted his frenzy, and he became gentle. His hand trembled as he touched her face, his fingers smoothing over her cheek, his palm cradling her jaw. The hungry pressure of his mouth lifted from hers, and he kissed her eyelids and nose and forehead. In his drive to press close, he had urged her back against the conservatory wall. She gasped as her bare upper shoulders were flattened on a pane of glass, causing goose flesh to rise. Cold glass. But his body was so warm, his scalding soft mouth travelling down to her throat, her chest, the hint of cleavage. Mary Penn slipped two fingers inside her bodice, stroking the cool cushion of her breast. It wasn't enough. He tugged impatiently at the edge of the bodice and the shallow cup of the corset beneath. Wynne closed her eyes, offering not so much as a word of protest, still except for the heaves of her breathing. Mary Penn gave a soft grunt of satisfaction as her breast popped free. He lifted her higher against the glass, nearly lifting her off her feet, and he closed his mouth over the tip of her breast. Wynne bit her lip to keep from crying out. Each swirling lick of his tongue sent darts of heat down to her toes. She slid her hands into his hair, one gloved, one ungloved, her body arching against the tender stimulation of his mouth. When her nipple was taut and throbbing, he moved back up to her neck, dragging his mouth along the delicate skin. When his voice was ragged, I want to... But he bit back the words and kissed her again, deep and feverish, while he took the hard peak of her breast in his fingers. He squeezed and rolled it softly, until she writhed and sobbed in pleasure. Then it all ended with cruel suddenness. He froze inexplicably, and jerked her away from the window, pulling the front of her body into his, as if he was trying to hide her from something. A quiet curse escaped him. What? Wynne found it difficult to speak. She was as dazed as if she were emerging from a deep sleep, her thoughts tumbling over on themselves. What is it? I saw movement on the terrace. Someone may have seen us. That startled Wynne back into a semblance of normalcy. She turned from him, clumsily pulling her bodice back into place. I... I'm going to the ladies' dressing room, she said shakily. I'll put myself to rights and return to the drawing room as soon as I'm able. She wasn't altogether certain what had just happened, what it had meant. Mary Penn had admitted he loved her. He'd finally said it. But she'd always imagined it as a joyful confession, not wrenched unwillingly from him like that. Everything seemed so terribly wrong. If only she could go back to the hotel now and be alone in her room. She needed privacy to think. What was it he'd said? I'd rather see you live in the arms of that cold, soulless bastard than die in mine. But that made no sense. Why had he said such a thing? She wanted to confront him, but this was not the time or place. This would have to be handled with great care. We must talk later, Kev, she said. He gave a short nod, his shoulders and neck set, as if he were carrying an unbearable burden. Wynne went as discreetly as possible to the ladies' dressing room upstairs, where maids were busy repairing torn flounces, helping to blot the shine from perspiring faces, and anchoring coiffures with extra hairpins. Women had gathered in small groups giggling and gossiping about things they'd seen and overheard. Wynne sat before a looking-glass and inspected her reflection. Her cheeks were flushed, a marked contrast to her usual composed paleness, and her lips were red and swollen. Her colour deepened, as she wondered if everyone could see what she had been doing. A maid came to blot Wynne's face and dust it with rice powder, and she murmured her thanks. She took several calming breaths and tried inconspicuously to make certain her bodice was fully covering her breasts. By the time Wynne felt ready to go downstairs once more, approximately thirty minutes had passed. 
She smiled as Poppy entered the lady's dressing room and came to her. Hello, dear, Wynne said, standing from the chair. Here, take my chair. Do you need hairpins? Powder? No, thank you. Poppy wore a tense, anxious expression, looking nearly as flushed as Wynne had been earlier. Are you enjoying yourself? Wynne asked with a touch of concern. Not really, Poppy said, drawing her to the corner to keep from being overheard. I was looking forward to meeting someone other than the usual crowd of stuffy old peers, or worse, the stuffy young ones. But the only new men I met were vulgar or dull or both. And Beatrix, how is she faring? She's quite popular, actually. She goes around saying outrageous things, and people laugh and think she's being witty, when they don't realise she's perfectly serious. Wynne smiled. Shall we go downstairs and find her? Not yet. Poppy reached out to take her hand and gripped it tightly. Wynne, dear, I've come to find you because there's something happening downstairs, and it involves you. Wynne shook her head, feeling cold in the marrow of her bones. Her stomach gave a sick plunge. I don't understand. A rumour is spreading very fast that you were seen in the conservatory in a compromising position, a very compromising one. Wynne felt her face turn white. It only just happened, she whispered. This is London society, Poppy said grimly. Gossip travels at full throttle. A pair of young women entered the dressing room, saw Wynne, and immediately whispered to each other. Wynne's stricken gaze met Poppy's. There's going to be a scandal, isn't there? She asked faintly. Not if it's managed right away. Poppy squeezed her hand. I'm to take you to the library, dear. Amelia and Cam are there. We're going to meet them and put our heads together and decide what to do. Wynne almost wished she could go back to being an invalid with fainting spells, because at the moment a good long swoon sounded quite appealing. Oh, what have I done? she whispered. That elicited a faint, sympathetic smile from Poppy. That seems to be what everyone wants to know. Chapter 14 The Hunt's library was a handsome room lined with mahogany bookcases. Cam Rowan and Simon Hunt were standing beside a large inlaid sideboard laden with glittering spirit decanters. Holding a glass half filled with amber liquid, Hunt gave Wynne an inscrutable glance as she entered the library. Amelia, Mrs. Hunt, and Dr. Harrow were also there. Wynne had the curious feeling that it couldn't really be happening. She'd never been involved in a scandal before, and it wasn't nearly as exciting or interesting as she had imagined while lying in her sickbed. It was frightening. In spite of her earlier words to Mary Penn about wanting to be compromised, she hadn't meant any of it. No sane woman would wish for such a thing. Causing a scandal meant ruining not only Wynne's prospects, but those of her younger sisters. It would cast a shadow over the entire family. Her carelessness was going to harm all the people she loved. Wynne, Amelia came to her at once, embracing her firmly. It's all right, dear. We'll manage this. Had Wynne not been so distressed, she would have smiled. Her older sister was famous for her confidence in her ability to manage anything, including natural disasters, foreign invasions, and stampeding wildlife. None of those, however, could come close to the destructive power of a London society scandal. Where's Miss Marks? Wynne asked in a muffled voice. In the drawing room with Beatrix. We're trying to keep appearances as normal as possible. Amelia sent a tense, rueful smile to the hunts. Unfortunately, our family has never been especially good at that. Wynne stiffened as she saw Leo and Kev enter the room. Leo came straight to her, while Mary Penn went to lurk in the corner. He wouldn't meet her gaze. 
The room was filled with a charged silence that caused the down on the back of her neck to rise. She hadn't gotten herself into this all alone, Wynne thought with a flare of anger. Kev would have to help her now. He would have to protect her with any means at his disposal, including his name. Her heart began to pound so heavily it almost hurt. It appears you've been making up for lost time, sis, Leo said flippantly, but there was a flicker of concern in his light eyes. We have to be quick about this. Tongues are wagging so fast they've created a strong breeze in the drawing room. Mrs. Hunt approached Amelia and Wynne. Winifred, her voice was very gentle. If this rumour isn't true, I'll take action at once to deny it on your behalf. Wynne drew in a trembling breath. It is true, she said. Mrs. Hunt patted her arm and gave her a reassuring glance. Trust me, you're not the first, nor will you be the last to find yourself in this predicament. In fact came Mr. Hunt's lazy drawl. Mrs. Hunt has first-hand experience with this kind of situation. Mr. Hunt, his wife said indignantly, and he grinned at her. Turning back to Wynne, Mrs. Hunt said, Winifred, may I ask whom you were seen with? Wynne couldn't answer. She let her gaze fall to the carpet, and she studied the pattern of medallions and flowers dazedly as she waited for Kev to speak. The silence only lasted a matter of seconds, but it seemed like hours. Say something, she thought desperately. Tell them it was you. It was, she heard Kev begin to say. But at that same moment, Julian Harrow stepped forward and said firmly, I'm the gentleman in question. Wynne's head jerked up. She saw that Kev had fallen silent, his murderous gaze fastened on Julian. I apologize to all of you, Julian continued, and especially to Winifred. I didn't intend to expose her to gossip or censure, but this has precipitated something I'd already resolved to do, which was to ask for her hand in marriage. Wynne stopped breathing. She looked directly at Kev, and a silent cry of anguish seared through her heart. Kev's hard face and coal-black eyes revealed nothing. She realized he was going to let Julian turn the situation to his advantage. He believed Julian would be better for her. He wouldn't fight for her. The betrayal was worse than any illness or pain she had ever experienced before. Wynne hated him. She would hate him until her dying day and beyond. What choice did she have but to accept Julian? It was either that, or allow herself and her sisters to be ruined. Wynne felt her face drain of colour, but she summoned a paper-thin smile as she glanced at her brother. Well, my lord, she asked Leo, do we have your blessing? Naturally, her brother said dryly. After all... I certainly don't want my pristine reputation to be marred by your sordid scandals. Wynne turned to face Julian. Then, yes, Dr. Harrow, she said in a steady voice. I will marry you. A frown notched between Mrs. Hunt's fine, dark brows as she stared at Wynne. She nodded in a businesslike manner. I'll go out and explain quietly to the appropriate parties that what they saw was a newly engaged couple embracing, a bit intemperate, perhaps, but quite forgivable in light of a betrothal. I'll go with you, Mr. Hunt said, coming to his wife's side. He extended a hand to Dr. Harrow and shook it. My congratulations, sir. His tone was cordial, but far from enthusiastic. You're most fortunate to have won Miss Hathaway's hand. As the Hunts left, Cam approached Wynne. She forced herself to stare directly into his perceptive hazel eyes, though it cost her. Is this what you want, little sister? he asked softly. His sympathy nearly undid her. Oh, yes. She set her jaw against a wretched quiver and managed to smile. I'm the luckiest woman in the world. 
when she brought herself to glance in Kev's direction, he was gone. What a ghastly evening, Amelia muttered, after everyone had left the library. Yes. Cam led her into the hallway. Where are we going? Back to the drawing room to make an appearance. Try to look pleased. Oh, good God! Amelia pulled away from him and strode to a large arched wall niche, where a Palladian window revealed a view of the street below. She pressed her forehead against the glass and sighed heavily. A repeated tapping noise echoed through the hallway. Serious as the situation was, Cam couldn't prevent a quick grin. Whenever Amelia was worried or angry, her nervous habit asserted itself. As he'd once told her, she reminded him of a hummingbird tamping down her nest with one foot. Cam went to her and rested his warm palms on the cool slopes of her shoulders. He felt her shiver at his touch. Hummingbird, he whispered, and slid his hands up to the back of her neck to knead the small, frozen muscles there. As her tension ebbed, the foot tapping died away, and she told him her thoughts. Everyone in that library knew Mary Penn was the one who compromised her, she said curtly. He started to confess when Harrow interrupted. I can't believe it. After all Wynne has gone through, it comes to this. She'll marry a man she doesn't love and go to France, while Mary Penn won't lift a finger to stop her. What's the matter with him? More than can be explained here and now. Calm yourself, love. It won't help Wynne for you to appear upset. I can't help it. This is all wrong. Oh, the look on my sister's face. We have time to sort it out, Cam murmured. A betrothal isn't the same as marriage. But it's binding, Amelia said with miserable impatience. You know people regard it as a contract that can't be broken easily. Maybe semi-binding, he allowed. Oh, Cam, her shoulders drooped. You would never let anything come between us, would you? You'd never let us be parted. The question was so patently ridiculous, Cam hardly knew what to say. He turned Amelia to face him and saw with a jolt of surprise that his practical, sensible wife was close to tears. The pregnancy was making her emotional, he thought. The glitter in her eyes sent a rush of fierce tenderness through him. He curved a protective arm around her and used his free hand to grip the back of her hair, not caring that it must her coiffure. You're the reason I live, he said in a low voice, holding her close. You're everything to me. Nothing could ever make me leave you. If anyone ever tried to separate us, I'd kill him. He covered her mouth with his and kissed her with devastating sensuality, not stopping until she was weak and flushed and leaning hard against him. Now, he said, only half joking, where is that conservatory? That provoked a watery chuckle from her. I think there's been enough gossip fodder for one night. Are you going to talk to Mary Penn? Of course. He won't listen, but that's never stopped me before. Do you think... Amelia broke off as she heard footsteps coming along the hallway, along with the crisp, abundant rustling of heavy skirts. She shrank farther into the niche with Cam, burrowing into his arms. She felt him smile against her hair. Together they were still and silent as they listened to a pair of ladies chattering. In heaven's name did the Hunts invite them? One of them was asking indignantly. Amelia thought she recognized the voice. It belonged to one of the prune-faced chaperones who had been sitting at the side of the drawing-room. Someone's maiden aunt, relegated to spinster status. Lord Ramsay is a viscount after all. But still, gypsies in the family. The very thought of it. One can never expect them to behave in a civilized manner. And we're expected to hobnob with such people as if they're our equals. The Hunts are bourgeois themselves, you know. No matter that Simon Hunt owns half of London by now, he is still a butcher's son. So many of the guests here aren't at all suitable calibre for us to associate with. I agree. A pause, 
and then the second woman added, Still, I hope we'll be invited back next year. As the voices faded, Cam looked down at his wife with a frown. He didn't give a damn what anyone said. By now he was inured to anything that could be said about Roma, but he hated that the arrows were directed at Amelia because of him. To his surprise, she was smiling up at him steadily. His expression turned quizzical. What's so amusing? Amelia toyed with a button on his coat. I was just thinking. Tonight, those two old hens will probably go to their beds, cold and alone. An impish grin curved her lips. Whereas I'll be with a big, handsome rom who'll keep me warm. All night, he promised, and bent to kiss her. Kev watched and waited until he found an opportunity to approach Simon Hunt, who had just managed to extricate himself from a conversation with a pair of giggling women. May I have a word with you? he asked quietly. Hunt didn't appear at all surprised. Let's go to the back terrace. They made their way to a side door of the drawing room, which opened directly onto the terrace. A group of gentlemen were gathered at one corner of the terrace, enjoying cigars. The rich scent of tobacco drifted on the cool breeze. Simon Hunt smiled pleasantly and shook his head as the men beckoned for him and Kev to join them. Leaning casually against the iron balustrade, he regarded Kev with assessing dark eyes. On the occasions when they'd met in Hampshire at Stony Cross Park, the estate that bordered the Ramsey lands, Kev had liked Hunt. He was a man's man who spoke in a straightforward manner. I assume you're going to ask what I know about Harrow, Hunt said. Yes. In light of recent events, this seems like shutting the door after the house is robbed. Furthermore, I have no proof of what I'm about to tell you, but the accusations the Lanhams have made against Harrow merit serious consideration. What accusations? Kev growled. Before Harrow built the clinic in France, he married the Lanham's eldest daughter, Louise. She was said to be an unusually beautiful girl, a bit spoiled and willful, but on the whole an advantageous match for Harrow. She came with a large dowry and a well-connected family. Reaching into his coat, Hunt extracted a slender silver cigar case. Care for one? he asked. Kev shook his head. Hunt pulled out a cigar, deftly bit off the tip and lit it. The end of the cigar glowed as Hunt drew on it. According to the Lanhams, Hunt continued, exhaling a stream of aromatic smoke, a year into the marriage Louise changed. She became docile and distant, and lost interest in her former pursuits. When the Lanhams approached Harrow with their concerns, he claimed the changes in her were simply evidence of maturity and marital contentment. But they didn't believe it. No. When they questioned Louise, however, she claimed to be happy and she asked them not to interfere. Hunt raised the cigar to his lips again and stared thoughtfully at the lights of London winking through the night haze. Sometime during the second year, Louise went into a decline. Kev felt a discomforting chill at the word decline, commonly used for any illness a doctor couldn't diagnose or comprehend. She became dispirited and bedridden. No one could do anything for her. The Lanhams insisted on bringing their own doctor to attend her, but he couldn't find any cause for illness. Louise's condition deteriorated over a month or so, until she died. The family blamed Harrow. Before the marriage, Louise had been a healthy, high-spirited girl, and not quite two years later, she was gone. Sometimes declines happen, Kev remarked, feeling the need to play devil's advocate. It wasn't necessarily Harrow's doing. No, but it was Harrow's reaction that convinced the family that he was responsible in some way for Louise's death. He was too composed, dispassionate, a few crocodile tears for appearance's sake, and that was it. And after that, he went to France with the dowry money? Yes. Hunt's broad shoulders lifted in a shrug. 
I despise gossip, Mary Penn, but the Lanhams are respectable people and not given to dramatics. Frowning, he tapped the ash from his cigar over the edge of the balustrade. And despite all the good Harrow has reportedly done for his patients, I can't help but feel there's something amiss with him. It's nothing I can put into words. Kev was relieved to have his own thoughts echoed by a man like Hunt. I've had the same feeling about Harrow, ever since I first met him, he said. But everyone else seems to revere him, and I'm not impartial. There was a wry glint in Hunt's black eyes. So I've gathered. He tilted his head and regarded Kev with friendly sympathy. I won't dispense unwanted advice, my friend, but I think anyone who cares for Miss Hathaway should be concerned for her sake. Chapter 15 Kev was gone by morning. He'd checked out of the Rutledge and left word that he would travel alone to the Ramsey estate. Wynne had awakened, feeling heavy and weary and sullen. Kev had been a part of her for too long. She had carried him in her heart, had absorbed him into the marrow of her bones. To let go of him now would feel like amputating part of herself. And yet it had to be done. Kev himself had made it impossible for her to choose otherwise. She washed and dressed with the help of a maid, and arranged her hair in a plaited chignon. There would be no meaningful talks with anyone in her family, she decided numbly. No weeping or regrets. She was going to marry Dr. Julian Harrow and live far away from Hampshire, and she would try to find a measure of peace. I want to be married as quickly as possible, she told Julian later that morning, as they had tea in the family suite. I miss France. I want to return there without delay, as your wife. Julian smiled and touched the curve of her cheek with smooth, tapered fingertips. Very well, my dear. He took her hand in his. I have some business in London, and then I'll join you in Hampshire in a few days. We'll make our plans there. We can marry at the estate chapel, if you like. The chapel that Kev had rebuilt. Perfect, Wynne said thinly. I'll buy a ring for you today, Julian said. What kind of stone would you like? A sapphire to match your eyes? Anything you choose will be lovely. Wynne kept her hand in his as they both fell silent. Julian, she murmured, you haven't yet asked what... what happened between Mary Penn and me last night. There's no need. Julian replied. I'm far too pleased by the result. I, I want you to understand that I'll be a good wife to you, Wynne said earnestly. I, my former attachment to Mary Penn. That will fade in time, Julian said gently. Yes. And I warn you, Winifred, I'm going to launch quite a battle for your affections. I'll prove such a devoted and generous husband There'll be no room in your heart for anyone else. She thought about bringing up the subject of children, asking if he might relent some day if her health kept improving even more. But she wasn't certain it mattered. She was trapped. Whatever life held in store for her now, she would have to make the best of it. After two days of packing, the family was on its way back to Hampshire. Cam, Amelia, Poppy, and Beatrix rode in the first carriage, while Leo, Wynne, and Miss Marks rode in the second. They had departed before daybreak to gain as much headway as possible on the twelve-hour journey. God knew what was being discussed in the second carriage. Cam only hoped Wynne's presence would help to blunt the animosity between Leo and Miss Marks. The conversation in the first carriage, as Cam had expected, was nothing but animated. It both touched and amused him that Poppy and Beatrix had launched a campaign to put Mary Penn forth as a candidate to be Wynne's husband. Naively, the girls had assumed the only thing standing in the way was Mary Penn's lack of fortune. So, if you could give him some of your money, Beatrix was saying eagerly, 
Or give him part of Leo's fortune, Poppy interceded. Leo would only waste it. Make Mary Penn understand that it would be Wynne's dowry, Beatrix said. So it wouldn't hurt his pride. And they wouldn't need very much, Poppy said. Neither of them gives a fig for mansions or fine carriages or... Wait, both of you, Cam said, lifting his hands in a defensive gesture. The problem is more complex than a matter of money. And uh, no, stop chirping for a moment and hear me out. He smiled into the two pairs of blue eyes regarding him so anxiously. He found their concern for Mary Penn and Wynne vastly endearing. Mary Penn has ample means to offer for Wynne. What he earns as the Ramsey estate manager is a handsome living in itself, and he also has unlimited access to the Ramsey accounts. Then why is Wynne going to marry Dr. Harrow and not Mary Penn? Beatrix demanded. For reasons Mary Penn wants to keep private, he thinks he wouldn't be an appropriate husband for her. But he loves her, and she loves him, Poppy added. It's complicated, Amelia told them. It seems simple enough to me, Beatrix said. Wynne should marry Mary Penn. How could anyone disagree? It's not our choice, Amelia replied. And it's not Wynne's either, unless the big dunderhead offers her an alternative. There's nothing Wynne can do if he won't propose. Wouldn't it be nice if ladies could propose to gentlemen? Beatrix mused. Heavens no, Amelia said promptly. That would make it far too easy for the gentlemen. In the animal kingdom, Beatrix commented, males and females have equal status. A female may do anything she wishes. The animal kingdom allows many behaviours we humans can't emulate, dear. Scratching in public, for example. Regurgitating food. Flaunting themselves to attract a mate. I needn't go on. I wish you would, Cam said with a grin. He settled Amelia more comfortably against his side and spoke to Beatrix and Poppy. Listen, you two. Neither of you is to bedevil Mary Penn about the situation. I know you want to help, but you'll only provoke him. They both grumbled and nodded reluctantly and snuggled in their respective corners. It was still dark outside, and the rocking motion of the carriage was soothing. In a matter of minutes, both sisters were drowsing. Glancing at Amelia, Cam saw that she was still awake. He stroked the fine-grained skin of her face and throat, looking down into her pure blue eyes. Why didn't he step forward, Cam? she whispered. Why did he give win to Dr. Harrow? Cam took his time about answering. He's afraid. Of what? Harming her. Amelia frowned in bewilderment. That makes no sense. Mary Penn would never hurt her. Not intentionally. You mean if she conceives a child? But Wynne doesn't agree with Dr. Harrow's opinion. She says if her health keeps getting better... It's not just that. Cam sighed and settled her more closely against him. Did Mary Penn ever tell you that he was Asherib? No. What does that mean? It's a word used to describe a Romany warrior. They're trained to be aggressive from early childhood, and never yield to fear or human weakness. I've seen Asherib fight with fractured and broken bones, sometimes to their death. Absently, Cam smoothed Amelia's hair as he continued. Living that way was even worse for Mary Penn, because the man who raised him... Cam usually so articulate, found it difficult to go on. Your uncle, Amelia prompted. Cam had already told her that he and Mary Penn were brothers, but he hadn't yet confided the rest of what Shuri had said. Uncle Pov wanted to punish Mary Penn for being an outsider. He treated him... Cam cleared his throat and forced himself to finish, like a fighting dog. Amelia turned pale. What do you mean? Shuri said he made Mary Penn sleep on a straw bed with no blanket. God knows what other humiliations my brother had to endure. Enough to break him. It's a good thing Pov is already dead, or I'd have to go find the bastard and murder him. 
I don't say that in jest. You're capable of many things, Amelia said, smoothing a hand over his chest. But not cold-blooded murder. There'd be nothing cold about it, he assured her grimly. Amelia sighed and pressed her cheek against his shoulder. Poor Mary Penn, she murmured. This explains much about the way he was when he first came to us. But that was such a long time ago. His life has been very different since then. Having once suffered so terribly, doesn't he want to be loved now? Doesn't he want to be happy? It doesn't work that way, sweetheart. Cam smiled into her puzzled face. It was no surprise that Amelia, who had been brought up in a large and affectionate family, should find it difficult to understand a man who feared his own needs as if they were his worst enemy. What if you were taught, all during your childhood, that the only reason for your existence was to inflict pain on others, that violence was all you were good for? How do you unlearn that? You can't. You cover it as best you can, always aware of what lies beneath the surface. But Mary Penn's a fine, honourable man now. He wouldn't agree. Well, Wynne made it clear she'd have him regardless. It doesn't matter if she'd have him. He believes he has to protect her from himself. Amelia hated being confronted with problems that had no definite solution. Then what can we do? Cam lowered his head to kiss the tip of her nose. I know how you hate to hear this, love. But not much. It's in their hands. The last time Wynne and Leo had seen Ramsay House, it had been dilapidated and half-burned, the grounds covered in weeds and rubble. Unlike the rest of the family, they hadn't seen the stages of its progress as it was being rebuilt. The affluent southern county of Hampshire encompassed coastal land, heathland, and ancient forests filled with abundant wildlife. Hampshire had a milder, sunnier climate than most other parts of England owing to the stabilising effect of its location. Although Wynne hadn't lived in Hampshire for very long before she had gone to Dr. Harrow's clinic, she had the feeling of coming home. It seemed the Hampshire weather had decided to present the estate to its best effect, with abundant sunshine and a few picturesque clouds in the distance. The carriage passed the gatekeeper's lodge, constructed of greyish-blue bricks. They refer to that as the Blue House. Miss Marks said, for obvious reasons. How lovely, Wynne exclaimed. I've never seen bricks that colour in Hampshire before. It's from Staffordshire, Leo said, craning his neck to see the other side of the house. Now that they're able to transport brick from other places on the railway, there's no need for the builder to make them on site. They proceeded along the drive to the house, which was surrounded by velvety green lawn and white graveled walking paths and young hedges and rose bushes. My God, Leo murmured as they approached the house itself. It was a multi-gabled cream stone structure with cheerful dormers. The blue slate roof featured hips and bays outlined with contrasting terracotta tiles. What remained of the original structure had been so lovingly restored one could hardly tell the old sections from the new. Leo didn't take his gaze off the place. Mary Penn said they'd kept some of the odd-shaped rooms and nooks. I see many more windows, and they've added a service wing. People were working everywhere. Carters, stockmen, sawyers and masons, gardeners clipping hedges, stable boys and footmen coming out to the arriving carriages. The estate had not only come to life, it was thriving. Watching her brother's intent profile, Wynne felt a surge of gratitude toward Kev, who'd made all this happen. It was good for Leo to come home to this. It was an auspicious beginning to a new life. Wynne descended from the carriage with a footman's help. They approached a set of double doors with leaded glass panes, as soon as Wynne reached the top step, the doors opened to reveal a middle-aged woman with ginger hair and a fair, freckled complexion. Her figure was shapely and sturdy in a high-necked black dress. 
Welcome, Miss Hathaway, she said warmly, curtsying. I'm Mrs. Barnstable, the housekeeper. After following her into the entrance hall, Wynne stopped in amazement at the sight of the place, airy and sparkling, the two-story high hall lined with creamy white panelling. A grey stone staircase was set in the back of the hall, its iron balustrades gleaming. Everywhere it smelled of soap and fresh wax. It's not the same place at all, Wynne said in wonder. Leo came up beside her. For once he had no glib remark to make, nor did he bother to hide his admiration. It's a bloody miracle, he said. I'm astonished. He turned to the housekeeper. Where's Mary Penn, Mrs. Barnstable? Out at the estate timber yard, my lord. He's helping to unload a wagon. The logs are quite heavy, and the workers sometimes need Mr. Mary Penn's help with a difficult load. We have a timber yard? Leo asked in bemusement. Miss Marks replied, Mr. Mary Penn is planning to construct houses for the new tenant farmers. This is the first I've heard of it. Why are we providing houses for them? Leo's tone was not at all censuring, merely interested. But Miss Marks's lips thinned, as if she had interpreted his question as a complaint. The most recent tenants to join the estate were lured by the promise of new houses. They are already successful farmers, educated and forward-looking, and Mr. Mary Penn believes their presence will add to the estate's prosperity. Other local estates, such as Stony Cross Park, are also building homes for their tenants and labourers. It's all right, Leo interrupted. No need to be defensive, Marx. God knows I wouldn't think of interfering with Mary Penn's plans after seeing all he's done so far. He glanced at the housekeeper. If you'll point the way, Mrs. Barnstable, I'll find Mary Penn. He may need some help unloading the timber wagon. A footman will show you the way, the housekeeper said at once. But the work is hazardous, my lord, and not fitting for a man of your station. Miss Marks added in a light but caustic tone, Besides, it's doubtful you could be of any help. The housekeeper's mouth fell open. Wynne had to bite back a grin. Miss Marks had spoken as if Leo were a small weed of a man instead of a strapping six-footer. Leo gave the governess a sardonic smile. I'm more physically capable than you suspect, Marx. You have no idea what lurks beneath this coat. I'm profoundly grateful for that. Miss Hathaway, the housekeeper broke in hurriedly, trying to smooth over the conflict. May I show you to your room? Yes, thank you. Hearing her sister's voices, Wynne turned to see them entering the hall along with Cam. Well, Amelia asked with a grin, spreading her hands to indicate their surroundings. Lovely beyond words, Wynne replied. Let's freshen ourselves and brush off the travel dust, and then I'll take you around. I'll only be a few minutes. Wynne went to the staircase with the housekeeper. How long have you been employed here, Mrs. Barnstable? she asked as they ascended to the second floor. A year, more or less, ever since the house became habitable. I was previously employed in London, but the old master passed on to his reward, and the new master dismissed most of the staff and replaced them with his own. I was in desperate need of a position. I'm sorry to hear that, but very pleased for the Hathaway's sake. It's been a challenging undertaking, the housekeeper said putting together a staff and training them all. I will confess I had a few trepidations, given the unusual circumstances of this position, but Mr. Mary Penn was very persuasive. Yes, Wynne said absently. It's difficult to say no to him. A strong and steady presence he has. I've marvelled to see him in the centre of a dozen simultaneous undertakings— the carpenters, the painters, the masons, all clamouring for his attention. But he always keeps a cool head. He's the fixed point of the estate. Wynne nodded morosely, glancing into the rooms they passed. More cream panelling and light cherry furniture, and upholsteries of soft-coloured velvet, rather than the gloomy dark shades that were currently fashionable. 
What a pity it was she'd never be able to enjoy this house, except for occasional visits. Mrs. Barnstable took her to a beautiful room with windows overlooking the gardens. This is yours, the housekeeper said. No one's occupied it before. The bed was covered with light blue upholstered panels, the bedclothes made from white linen. A graceful lady's writing desk occupied one corner, and on the other side of the room there was a satin maple wardrobe with a looking-glass set in the door. Mr. Mary Penn personally chose the wallpaper, Mrs. Barnstable said. He nearly drove the interior architect mad with his insistence on seeing hundreds of samples until he found this pattern. The wallpaper was white, with a delicate pattern of flowering branches, and at sparse intervals there was the motif of a little robin perched on one of the twigs. Slowly, Wynne went to one of the walls and touched one of the birds with her fingertips. Her vision blurred. During her long recuperation from scarlet fever, when she'd grown tired of holding a book in her hands and no one had been available to read to her, she'd stared out the window at a robin's nest in a nearby maple tree. She'd watched the fledglings hatch from their blue eggs and watched their feathers grow in, and later had watched the mother robin working to fill their ravenous beaks. And Wynne had watched as, one by one, they had flown from the nest while she remained in bed. Kev, despite his fear of heights, had often climbed a ladder to wash the second-floor window for her. He had wanted her view of the outside world to be clear. He'd said the sky should always be blue for her. You're fond of birds, Miss Hathaway? the housekeeper asked. Wynne nodded without looking around, afraid that her face was red with unexpressed emotion. Robins especially, she half whispered, blinking back tears. A footman will bring your trunks up soon, and one of the maids will unpack them. In the meantime, if you would like to wash, there is fresh water at the washstand. Thank you. Wynne went to the porcelain pitcher and basin and sluiced clumsy handfuls of cooling water on her face and throat, heedless of the drips that fell onto her bodice. Blotting her face with a cloth, she felt only momentary relief from the aching heat that had suffused her. Hearing the creak of a floorboard, Wynne turned sharply. Kev was at the threshold, watching her. The damnable flush wouldn't stop. She wanted to be on the other side of the world from him. She wanted never to see him again, but her senses pulled him in greedily. The sight of him in an open-throated shirt, white linen clinging to the long, hard lines of his torso. The short, dark layers of his hair were damp with sweat, the clean, salty scent of his exertions reaching her prickling nostrils. She was paralysed with need. She wanted the taste of his skin against her lips. She wanted the throb of his pulse against her own. If only he'd come to her just as he was this moment and crush her onto the bed with his body and take her, ruin her. How was the journey from London? he asked, his face expressionless. I'm not going to make pointless conversation with you. Wynne went to the window and focused blindly on the dark woodland in the distance. Is the room to your liking? She nodded without looking at him. If there is anything you need... I have everything I need, she interrupted. Thank you. I want to talk to you about the other... That's quite all right, she said, managing to sound composed. You don't need to come up with excuses about why you didn't offer for me. I want you to understand. I do understand, and I've already forgiven you. Perhaps it will ease your conscience to hear I'll be much better off this way. I don't want your forgiveness, he said curtly. Fine, you're not forgiven. Whatever pleases you. She couldn't bear to be alone with him for another moment. Her heart was breaking. She could feel it fracturing. Putting her head down, she began to walk past his motionless form. Wynne didn't intend to stop, but before she crossed the threshold, she halted within arm's length of him. There was one thing she wanted to tell him. The words would not be contained. Incidentally, she heard herself say tonelessly, 
I went to visit a London doctor yesterday, a highly respected one. I told him my medical history, and I asked if he would evaluate my general state of health. Aware of the intensity of Kev's gaze, Wynne continued evenly. In his professional opinion, there's no reason I shouldn't have children if I want them. He said there's no guarantee for any woman that childbirth will be free of risk. But I'm going to lead a full life. I'll have marital relations with my husband. And, God willing, I'll become a mother some day. She paused, and added in a bitter voice that didn't sound at all like her own. Julian will be so pleased when I tell him, don't you think? If the jab had pierced through Kev's guard, there was no sign of it. There's something you need to know about him, he said quietly. His first wife's family, the Lanhams, suspect he had something to do with her death. Wynne's head whipped around, and she stared at Kev with narrowed eyes. I can't believe you would sink so low. Julian told me all about it. He loved her. He did everything he could to bring her through the illness. When she died, he was devastated, and then he was victimized further by her family. In their grief, they needed someone to blame. Julian was a convenient scapegoat. The Lanhams claim he behaved suspiciously after her death. He didn't fit anyone's idea of a bereaved husband. Not all people show their grief in the same way, Wynne snapped. Julian's a doctor. He was trained to be impassive in the course of his work, because that's what's best for the patients. He would never let himself fall apart, no matter how deep his sorrow. How dare you judge him? Don't you realize you may be in danger? From Julian, the man who made me well? She shook her head with a disbelieving laugh. For the sake of our past friendship, I'm going to forget you said anything about this, Kev. But remember in the future that I won't tolerate any insults to Julian. Remember that he stood by me when you wouldn't. She brushed by him without waiting for his reaction, and saw her older sister coming along the hallway. Amelia, she said brightly, shall we begin the tour now? I want to see everything. Chapter 16 Although Mary Penn had made it clear to the Ramsay household that Leo, not he, was master, the servants and labourers still considered him the authority. He was the one they first approached with all concerns, and Leo was content to let it remain so while he familiarised himself with the estate and its inhabitants. I'm not a complete idiot, despite appearances to the contrary, Leo told Mary Penn dryly as they rode out to the east corner of the estate one morning. The arrangements you've made are obviously working. I don't intend to foul things up in an effort to prove I'm lord of the manor. That being said... I do have a few improvements to suggest regarding the tenant housing. Oh? A few inexpensive alterations in design would make the cottages more comfortable and attractive. And if the idea is to eventually establish a hamlet of sorts on the estate, it might behoove us to come up with a set of plans for a model village. You want to work on plans and elevations? Mary Penn asked surprised at the show of interest from the usually indolent lord. If you have no objections. Of course not. It's your estate. Mary Penn regarded him speculatively. Are you considering a return to your former profession? Yes, actually. I might start as a jobbing architect. We'll see where some earnest dabbling might lead. And it makes sense to cut my teeth on my own tenants' houses. Leo grinned. My reasoning is they'll be less likely than outsiders to sue me. On an estate with a crowded wood like the Ramsey lands, a thinning of the forest was necessary every ten years. By Mary Penn's calculation, the estate had missed at least two previous cycles, which meant there was a good thirty years' worth of dead, sickly or suppressed growth trees to be cleared from the Ramsey forests. To Leo's dismay, Mary Penn insisted on dragging him through the entire process, 
until Leo knew far more than he had ever wanted to know about trees. Correct thinning helps nature, Mary Penn said in response to Leo's grumbling. The estate wood will have healthier timber and far more value if the right trees are removed to help the others grow. I'd rather let the trees settle it amongst themselves, Leo said, which Mary Penn ignored. To educate himself and Leo further, Mary Penn arranged a meeting with the small staff of estate woodmen. They went out to examine some targeted standing trees, while the woodman explained how to measure the length and mean transverse area of a tree to determine its cubic contents. Using a girthing tape, a twenty-foot rod, and a ladder, they made some preliminary assessments. Before Leo quite knew how it had happened, he'd found himself atop a ladder, helping in the measurements. "'May I ask why?' he called down to Mary Penn. "'You happen to be standing down there while I'm up here risking my neck. "'Your tree,' Mary Penn pointed out succinctly. "'Also my neck.' Leo paused. "'I thought aristocratic landowners were supposed to sit in the library and drink port. "'That was before. Nowadays they have to work. "'Just my bloody luck,' Leo grumbled. Later, as they went over other items on a daily list that only seemed to get longer as the week progressed, Leo began to comprehend just how overwhelming a job Mary Penn had undertaken for the past three years. Most estate managers had undergone apprenticeships, and most sons of the peerage had been educated from a young age about the estates they would someday inherit. Mary Penn, on the other hand, had learned all of this livestock management, farming, forestry, construction, land improvement, wages, profits, and rents, with no preparation at all. But the man was ideally suited for it. He had an acute memory, an appetite for hard work, and a tireless interest in details. Admit something, Leo had said, after a particularly stultifying conversation on farming, you do find this tedious on occasion, don't you? You must be bored out of your skull after an hour of discussion on how intensive the crop rotation should be and how much arable land should be allocated to corn and beans. Mary Penn had considered the question carefully, as if it had never occurred to him that he should find anything about the estate work tedious. Not if it needs to be done. That was when Leo had finally understood. If Mary Penn had decided on a goal, no detail was too small, no task beneath him, no amount of adversity would deter him. The workmanlike quality that Leo had derided in the past had found its perfect outlet. God or the devil help anyone who got in Mary Penn's way. But Mary Penn had a weakness. By now, Everyone in the family had become aware of the impossible attachment between Mary Penn and Wynne. Leo had never seen two people battle mutual attraction so desperately, but saying anything about it to either of them would bring hell down on his head. Not long ago, Leo would have chosen Dr. Harrow for Wynne without a moment's hesitation. In the eyes of society, marrying a rom was a scandal or at the very least a come-down in the world. Although most women of Wynne's station resorted to finding love outside of marriage, that wasn't possible for her. She would never be happy that way. After having watched his sister's long struggle to get well, and knowing the grace of character that had never faltered, Leo thought it a damned shame she couldn't have the husband she wanted. On the third morning after their arrival in Hampshire, Amelia and Wynne went for a walk. It was a clear day, the path a bit muddy in places, the meadows covered with a wealth of white oxeye daisies that resembled new-fallen snow. Amelia, who had always loved walking, matched Wynne's brisk pace easily. I love Stony Cross, Wynne said, relishing the sweet, cool air. It feels like home even more than Primrose Place did. Yes, there's something special about Hampshire. Whenever we come back from London, I find it an indescribable relief. Removing her bonnet, 
Amelia held it by the ribbons and swung it lightly as they walked. She seemed absorbed in the scenery, the tumbles of flowers everywhere, the clicks and drones of insects busy among the trees. Win, she said pensively. You don't have to leave Hampshire, you know. Yes, I do. Our family can weather any scandal. Look at Leo. We survived all of his. In terms of scandal, Wynne interrupted Riley. I think I've actually managed to do worse than Leo. I don't think that's possible, dear. You know as well as I that the loss of a woman's virtue ruins a family far more than the loss of a man's honour. It's not fair, but there you have it. You didn't lose your virtue, Amelia said indignantly. Not for lack of trying. Believe me, I wanted to. Seeing her older sister's shocked expression, she smiled ruefully. Did you think I was above feeling that way, Amelia? Well, yes, I suppose I did. You were never one to moon over handsome boys, or talk about balls and parties, or dream about your future husband. That was because of Mary Penn, Wynne admitted. He was all I ever wanted. Oh, Wynne, Amelia whispered. I'm so sorry. Wynne stepped up onto a stile, leading through a narrow gap in a stone fence, and Amelia followed. They walked along a grassy footpath that led to a forest trail and continued to a footbridge that crossed a stream. Amelia linked her arm with Wynne's. In light of what you just said, I feel even more strongly that you shouldn't marry Dr. Harrow. What I mean is, you should marry him if you wish, but not out of fear over a scandal. I want to. I like him. I believe he's a good man, and if I stay here, it would result in endless misery for me and Mary Penn. One of us has to leave. Why does it have to be you? Mary Penn is needed here. He belongs here, and it truly doesn't matter to me where I am. In fact, I think it would be better for me to make a new beginning elsewhere. Cam's going to talk to him, Amelia said. Oh, no, he mustn't, not on my behalf. Wynne's pride bristled, and she turned to face Amelia. Don't let him, please. I couldn't stop Cam, no matter how I tried. He's not talking to Mary Penn for your sake, Wynne. It's for Mary Penn's own sake. We very much fear what will become of him once he's lost you for good. He's already lost me, Wynne said flatly. He lost me the moment he refused to fight for me. After I leave, he'll be no different than he's always been. He'll never allow softness in himself. In fact, I think he despises the things that give him pleasure. All the tiny muscles of her face felt frozen. Wynne reached up to massage her tense, pinching forehead. The more he cares for me, the more determined he is to push me away. Men, Amelia grumbled, crossing the footbridge. Mary Penn is convinced he has nothing to give me. There's a kind of arrogance in that, don't you think? Deciding what I need, disregarding my feelings, setting me so high on a pedestal that it absolves him of any responsibility. Not arrogance, Amelia said softly. Fear. Well, I won't live that way. I won't be bound by my fears or his. Wynne felt herself relaxing slightly calmness stealing over her as she admitted the truth. I love him, but I don't want him if he has to be dragged or trapped into marriage. I want a willing partner. Certainly no one could blame you for that. It's always irked me, really, the way people say a woman has caught a man, as if they're trout we've managed to hook and jerk out of the water. Despite her moroseness, Wynne couldn't help smiling. They pushed on through the damp, warm landscape. As they eventually approached Ramsay House, they saw a carriage coming to a stop before the entrance. It's Julian, Wynne said. He must have left London well before first light. She quickened her pace and reached him just as he stepped from the carriage. Julian's cool handsomeness had not been mussed one bit by the long journey from London. He took Wynne's hands and gripped them firmly and smiled down at her. Welcome to Hampshire, she said. Thank you, my dear. Have you been out walking? Briskly, she assured him, smiling. Very good. 
Here, I have something for you. He reached in his pocket and withdrew a small object. Wynne felt him slide a ring onto her finger. She looked down at a ruby, the shade of red known as pigeon's blood, set in gold and diamonds. It's said, Julian told her, that to own a ruby is to have contentment and peace. Thank you. It's lovely, Wynne murmured, leaning forward. Her eyes closed as she felt his lips press gently against her forehead. Contentment and peace. God willing, perhaps some day she would have those things. Cam doubted his own sanity, approaching Merrypin when he was working in the timber yard. He watched for a moment as Merrypin helped a trio of woodmen unload massive logs from the wagon. It was a dangerous job, with one mistake resulting in the possibility of severe injury or death. With the use of sloping planks and long levers, the men rolled the logs inch by inch to the ground. Grunting with effort, muscles straining, they fought to control the descending weight. Mary Penn, as the largest and strongest of the group, had taken the center position, making him the least likely to escape if anything went wrong. Concerned, Cam started forward to help. Get back! Mary Penn barked, seeing Cam out of the corner of his eye. Cam stopped at once. The woodman had worked out a method, he realized. Anyone who didn't know their procedures might inadvertently cause harm to them all. He waited and watched as the logs were eased safely to the ground. The woodman breathed heavily, leaning over and bracing their hands on their knees as they sought to recover from the dizzying effort. All except Mary Penn, who sank the tip of a deadly sharp handhook into one of the logs. He turned to face Cam while still holding a pair of tongs. Mary Penn's face was flushed and sweat streaked, his eyes bright with hellfire. Although Cam had come to know him well over the past three years, he had never seen Mary Penn like this. He looked like a damned soul. God help me, Cam thought. Once Wynne was married to Dr. Harrow, Mary Penn might careen out of control. Remembering all the trouble they'd had with Leo, Cam groaned inwardly. He was tempted to wash his hands of the entire damned mess, reasoning that he had far better things to do than fight for his brother's sanity. Let Mary Penn deal with the consequences of his own choices. But then Cam considered how he himself would behave if anyone or anything threatened to take Amelia away from him. No, better, surely. Possibly worse. Reluctant compassion stirred inside him. What do you want? Mary Penn asked curtly, setting the tongs aside. Cam approached slowly. Harrow's here. I saw. Are you going inside to welcome him? Mary Penn gave Cam a contemptuous glance. Leo's the master of the household. He can welcome the bastard. While you hide out here in the timber yard. The coffee black eyes narrowed. I'm not hiding. I'm working. And you're in the way. I want to talk to you, Fral. Don't call me that. And I don't need your interference. Someone has to try and talk some sense into you, Cam said softly. Look at you, Kev. You're behaving exactly like the brute Uncle Pov tried to make you into. Shut up, Mary Penn said hoarsely. You're letting him decide the rest of your life for you, Cam insisted. You're clutching those damned chains around you with all your strength. If you don't close your mouth, if you were only hurting yourself, I wouldn't say a word. But you're hurting her as well, and you don't seem to give a d Cam was interrupted as Mary Penn launched toward him, attacking him with a bloodthirsty force that sent them both to the ground. The impact was hard, even on the muddy ground. They rolled twice, thrice, each striving to gain the dominant position. Mary Penn was as heavy as hell. Realizing that being pinned was going to result in some serious damage to himself, Cam twisted free and sprang to his feet. Raising his guard, he blocked and sidestepped as Mary Penn leaped upward like a striking tiger. The woodmen all rushed forward, two of them grabbing Mary Penn and hauling him back, the other one pouncing on Cam. You're such an idiot! Cam snapped, glaring at Mary Penn. 
He shook free of the man who was trying to restrain him. You're determined to foul things up for yourself no matter what, aren't you? Mary Penn lunged, his face murderous, while the woodman fought to hold him back. Cam shook his head in disgust. I'd hoped for a minute or two of rational conversation, but apparently that's beyond you. He glanced at the woodman. Let him go. I can handle him. It's easy to win against a man who lets his emotions get the best of him. At that, Mary Penn made a visible effort to control his rage. Going still, the wildness in his eyes diminishing to a glint of cold hatred. Gradually, with the same care they had used to manage the heavy, crushing logs, the woodman released his arms. You've made your point, Cam told Mary Penn, and it seems you'll keep on making it until you've proven it to everyone. So let me spare you the effort. I agree with you. You aren't fit for her. And he left the timber yard, while Mary Penn glared after him. Mary Penn's absence cast a shadow over dinner that night. No matter how they all tried to behave naturally, the odd thing was Mary Penn had never been one to dominate a conversation or take the central role of the gathering, and yet removing his unobtrusive presence was the same as taking off the leg of a chair. Everything was off balance when he was gone. Julian filled the gap with charm and lightness, relaying amusing stories about his acquaintances in London, discussing his clinic, revealing the origins of the therapies that served his patients to such good effect. Wynne listened and smiled. She pretended interest in the scene around her, the table laden with china and crystal, platters of well-seasoned food, and a few pieces of good, serviceable silver. She was calm on the surface, but underneath she was nothing but seething emotion— Anger and desire and grief mixed so thoroughly she couldn't divine their proportions. Midway through the dinner, a footman went to the head of the table with a tiny silver tray. He gave a note to Leo. My lord, the footman murmured. The entire table fell silent as everyone watched Leo read the note. Casually, he tucked the slip of paper into his coat and murmured something to the footman about readying his horse. A smile touched Leo's lips as he saw their gazes fastened on him. My apologies all, he said calmly. I'm needed for a bit of business that can't wait. His light blue eyes held a sardonic glint as he glanced at Amelia. Perhaps you could have the kitchen save a plate of dessert for me? You know how I love trifle. As a dessert or verb, Amelia rejoined, and he grinned. Both, of course. He stood from the table. Excuse me, please. Wynne was gripped with worry. She knew this had something to do with Mary Penn. She felt it in her bones. My lord, she said in a suffocated voice. Is it all as well? He said at once. Shall I go? Cam asked, staring hard at Leo. It was a novel situation for all of them. Leo was a problem solver. Novel especially for Leo. Not a chance, Leo replied. I wouldn't be deprived of this for the world. The Stony Cross Jail was located on Fishmonger Lane. Locals referred to the two-room lockup as the pinfold. The antique word referred to a pen where stray animals were kept, hearkening back to medieval times when the open field system had still been practised. The owner of a lost cow, sheep, or goat had usually been able to find it at the pinfold, where he could claim it for a fee. Nowadays, drunkards and minor lawbreakers were claimed by their relatives in much the same way. Leo had spent more than a few nights in the pinfold himself, but to his knowledge, Mary Penn had never run afoul of the law, and had certainly never been guilty of drunkenness, public or private, until now. It was rather bemusing, this reversal of their situations. Mary Penn had always been the one to collect Leo from whatever jail or strongroom he'd managed to land himself in. Leo met briefly with the parish constable, who seemed similarly struck by the arse about of it all. May I ask the nature of the crime? Leo inquired diffidently. Got himself good and pickled at the tavern, 
the constable replied, and went into a real Tom and Jerry with a local. What were they fighting over? The local made some remark about gypsies and drink, and that set Mr. Mary Penn off like lit gunpowder. Scratching his head through his wiry hair, the constable said reflectively, Mary Penn had plenty of men jumping to defend him. He's well liked among the farmers here, but he fought them too. And even then they tried to pay his bail. They said it wasn't like him getting soused and brawling. From what I know of Mary Penn, he's a quiet sort, not like the others of his kind. But I said no, I wasn't taking bail money until he'd cooled his heels for a bit. Those fists are the size of Hampshire hams. I'm not releasing him until he's more than half sober. May I speak to him? Yes, my lord, he's in the first room. I'll take you there. You needn't trouble yourself, Leo said pleasantly. I know the way. The constable grinned at that. I suppose you do, my lord. The cell was unfurnished, except for a short-legged stool, an empty bucket, and a straw pallet. Mary Penn was sitting on the pallet, leaning his back against a timbered wall. One knee was propped up, his arm half curled around it. The black head was lowered in a posture of utter defeat. Mary Penn glanced up as Leo approached the row of iron bars that separated them. His face was drawn and saturnine. He looked as if he hated the world and all its inhabitants. Leo was certainly familiar with that feeling. Well, this is a change, he remarked cheerfully. Usually you're on this side, and I'm on that side. Sod off, Mary Penn growled. And that's what I usually say, Leo marveled. I'm going to kill you, Mary Penn said with guttural sincerity. That doesn't provide much incentive for me to get you out, does it? Leo folded his arms across his chest and regarded the other man with expert assessment. Mary Penn was no longer drunk, only mean as the devil, and suffering. Leo supposed, in light of his own past misdeeds, he should have more patience with the man. Nevertheless, Leo said, I'll have you set free, since you did the same for me on so many occasions. Then do it. Soon. But I have a few things to say. And it's obvious that if I let you out first, you'll bolt like a hare at a coursing, and then I won't have the chance. Say what you like. I'm not listening. Look at you. You're a filthy mess, and you're locked up in the pinfold, and you're about to receive a lecture on behavior from me, which is obviously as low as a man can sink. From all appearances, the words fell on deaf ears. Leo continued undaunted. You're not suited for this, Mary Penn. You can't hold your drink worth a damn. And unlike people such as me, who become quite amicable when they drink, you turn into a vile-tempered troll. Leo paused, considering how best to provoke him. Liquor brings out one's true inner nature, they say. That got him. Mary Penn flashed Leo a dark glance that contained both fury and anguish. Surprised by the strength of the reaction, Leo hesitated before continuing. He understood the situation more than Mary Penn would have believed or wanted to believe. Perhaps Leo didn't know the whole mysterious tangle of Mary Penn's past, or the complex twists and turns of character that made him unable to have the woman he loved. But Leo knew one simple truth that superseded all others. Life was too bloody short. Damn you, Leo muttered, pacing back and forth. He would have preferred to take a knife and lay open a portion of his own flesh rather than say what needed to be said. But he had the sense that he was somehow standing between Mary Penn and annihilation, that a brace of essential words, a crucial argument, had to be set forth. If you weren't such a stubborn ass, Leo said, I wouldn't have to do this. No response from Mary Penn, not even a glance. Leo turned to the side and rubbed the back of his neck and dug his fingers into his own rigid muscles. You know I never speak of Laura Dillard. In fact, this may be the first time I've said her full name since she died. But I'm going to say something about her. 
because not only do I owe you for what you've done for the Ramsay estate, but don't, Leo. The words were hard and cold. You're embarrassing yourself. Well, I'm good at that, and you've left me no bloody choice. Do you understand what you're in, Mary Pen? A prison of your making, and even after you're out of here, you'll still be trapped. Your entire life will be a prison. Leo thought of Laura, the physical details of her no longer precise in his mind, but she lingered inside him like the memory of sunlight in a world that had been bitterly cold since her death. Hell was not a pit of fire and brimstone, Leo thought. Hell was waking up alone, the sheets wet with your tears and your seed, knowing the woman you had dreamed of would never come back to you. Since I lost Laura, Leo said, everything I do is merely a way of passing the time. It's hard to give a damn about much of anything, but at least I can live with the knowledge that I fought for her. At least I took every bloody minute with her that was possible to have. She died knowing I loved her. He stopped pacing and stared at Mary Penn contemptuously. But you're throwing everything away and breaking my sister's heart because you're a damned coward. Either that or a fool. How can you... He broke off as Mary Penn hurled himself at the bars, shaking them like a lunatic. Shut up, damn it! What will either of you have once Wynne has gone with Harrow? Leo persisted. You'll stay in your self-made prison, that's obvious. But Wynne will be worse off. She'll be alone, away from her family, married to a man who regards her as nothing more than a decorative object to keep on a bloody shelf. And what happens when her beauty fades and she loses her value to him? How will he treat her then? Mary Penn went motionless his expression contorted, murder in his eyes. She's a strong girl, Leo said. I spent two years with Wynne, watching as she met one challenge after another. After all the struggles she's faced, she's bloody well entitled to make her own decisions. If she wants to risk having a child, if she feels strong enough, that's her right. And if you're the man she wants, don't be a sodding idiot by turning her away. Leo rubbed his forehead wearily. Neither of us are worth a damn, he muttered. Oh, you can work the estate and show me how to balance account books and inventory the stinking larder. I suppose we'll keep it running well enough, but neither of us will ever be more than half alive, like most men, and the only difference is we know it. Leo paused, vaguely surprised by the tightening sensation all around his neck, as if a noose had been cinched around it. Amelia told me once about a suspicion she had. It bothered her for years. She said when Wynne and I had fallen ill with scarlet fever, and you made the deadly nightshade syrup, you created far more than was necessary, and you kept a little cup of it on Wynne's bedside table, like some sort of macabre nightcap, Amelia said that if Wynne died, she was sure you would have taken the rest of that poison. And I've always hated you for that, because you forced me to stay alive without the woman I loved, while you had no bloody intention of doing the same. Mary Penn didn't answer, gave no sign that he even registered Leo's words. Christ, man, Leo said huskily, if you had the bollocks to die with her, don't you think you could work up the courage to live with her? There was nothing but silence as Leo walked away from the cell. He wondered what the hell he had done, what effect it would have. Leo went to the parish constable's office and told him to let Mary Penn out. Wait another five minutes, however, he added. I need a running start. After Leo had left, the talk at the dinner table had taken on a tone of determined cheerfulness. No one wanted to speculate aloud on the reason for Mary Penn's absence or why Leo had gone on a mysterious errand, but it seemed likely the two were connected. Wynne had worried silently and told herself sternly that it wasn't her place nor her right to worry about Mary Penn, and then she'd worried some more. 
As she'd forced a few bites of dinner down, the food had seemed to stick in her clenched throat. She'd gone to bed early, pleading a headache, and left the others playing games in the parlour. After Julian had escorted her to the main staircase, she'd let him kiss her. It was a lingering kiss, turning damp as he had searched just inside her lips. The patient sweetness of his mouth on hers had been, if not earth-shattering, very pleasant. Wynne thought that Julian would be a skilled and sensitive partner when she finally did manage to coax him into making love to her. But he didn't seem terribly driven in that regard, which was simultaneously a disappointment and a relief. Julian might desire her, but his feelings didn't begin to approach the all-encompassing level of Mary Penn's, and she found it difficult to imagine Julian losing his composure even during that most intimate of acts. She couldn't picture him sweating and groaning and holding her tightly. Julian would never allow himself to descend to that level of abandonment. Wynne bathed and donned a white nightgown and sat in bed reading for a while. After finishing two chapters, Wynne closed the book and turned out the lamp. She lay down to stare despondently through the darkness. Sleep claimed her eventually. She slept heavily welcoming the escape. But some time later, while it was still very dark, she found herself struggling upward through layers of dreams. Someone or something was in the room. Her first thought was that it might be Beatrix's ferret, who sometimes slipped past the door to collect objects that intrigued him. Rubbing her eyes, Wynne began to sit up, when there was a movement beside the bed. A large shadow crossed over her, before bewilderment could give way to fear, she heard a familiar murmur and felt a man's warm fingers press across her lips. It's me. Her lips moved soundlessly against his hand. Kev. Wynne's stomach constricted with an ache of pleasure, and her heartbeat hammered in her throat. But she was still angry with him. She was done with him, and if he had come here for a midnight talk, he was sadly mistaken. She started to tell him so, but to her astonishment, she felt a thick piece of cloth descend over her mouth, and then he was tying it deftly behind her head. In a few more seconds, he had bound her wrists in front of her. Wynne was rigid with shock. Kev would never do something like this. And yet it was him. She would know him if only by the touch of his hands. What did he want? What was going through his mind? His breath was faster than usual as it brushed against her hair. Now that her vision had adjusted to the darkness, she saw that his face was hard and austere. Kev drew the ruby ring off her finger and set it on the bedside table. Taking her head in his hands, he stared into her wide eyes. He said only two words, but they explained everything he was doing and everything he intended to do. You're mine. He picked her up easily, draping her over one powerful shoulder, and carried her from the room. Wynne closed her eyes, yielding, trembling. She pressed a few sobs against the gag covering her mouth, not of unhappiness or fear, but of wild relief. This was not an impulsive act. This was ritual. This was a courtship rite, and there would be nothing half-hearted about it. She was going to be kidnapped and claimed. Finally. Chapter 17 As far as abductions went, it was skillfully executed. One would have expected no less of Kev. Although Wynne had assumed he would carry her to his room, he surprised her by taking her outside, where his horse was waiting. Wrapping her in his coat, he held her against his chest and rode off with her, not to the gatehouse, but alongside the wood, through night mist and dense blackness that daylight would soon filter. Wynne stayed relaxed, trusting him, as he guided the horse expertly through a copse of oak and ash. A small white cottage appeared, ghost-coloured in the darkness. It was tidy and new-looking, with smoke curling from the chimney-stack. Dismounting, 
Kev tucked Wynne down into his arms, and he carried her to the front step. Don't move, he said. She stayed obediently still while he tethered the horse. Kev closed his hand over her bound wrists and led her inside. Wynne followed easily, a willing captive. The cottage was sparely furnished, and it smelled of fresh wood and paint. Not only was it empty of current residents, but it seemed that no one had ever lived there. Taking Wynne into the bedroom, Kev lifted her onto a bed covered with quilts and white linen. Her bare feet dangled over the edge of the mattress as she sat upright. Kev stood before her, the light from the hearth gilding one side of his face. His gaze was locked on her. Slowly, he removed his coat and dropped it to the floor, heedless of the fine fabric. As he pulled his open-necked shirt over his head, Wynne was startled by the powerful expanse of his torso, all ribbed muscle and swarthy brawn. His chest was hairless, the skin gleaming like satin, and Wynne's fingers twitched with the urge to touch it. She felt herself flush with anticipation, her face rouged with heat. Kev's intent gaze took in her reaction. She sensed that he understood what she wanted, needed, even more than she did. He removed his half-boots, kicked them aside, and came closer until she caught the scent of his skin. He touched the lace-edged collar of her nightgown, fingered it lightly. His hand slid over her chest and moulded the weight of her breast. The warm squeeze drew a shiver from her, sensation gathering at the hardening tip. She wanted him to kiss her there. She wanted it so badly that she fidgeted, her toes curling, her lips parting with a gasp beneath the binding cloth. To her relief, Kev reached around to the back of her head and untied the gag. Red and trembling, Wynne managed an unsteady whisper. You... you needn't have used that. I would have kept quiet. Kev's tone was grave, but there was a pagan gleam in the depths of his eyes. If I decide to do something, I do it properly. Yes. Her throat cinched around a sob of pleasure as he caressed her hair. I know that. He left the bed for a moment, went to a pitcher and jug on the nearby dresser, and poured a cup of water. After returning to her, he held the cup to her lips, and she drank thirstily, relishing the cold liquid as it slid down her throat. Kev set the cup aside, cradled her head in his hands, and bent to kiss her gently. As she responded to the hot, shallow laps of his tongue, he went deeper, demanding more. The kiss went on and on, making her gasp and strain, her own small tongue darting greedily past the edges of his teeth. She was so dazed by the current of arousal humming through her that it took her a little while to realize she was lying back on the bed with him, her bound hands flung over her head. His lips slid to her throat, savoring her with slow, open kisses. Where are we? she managed to ask, shivering as his mouth found a particularly sensitive place. Gamekeeper's cottage. He lingered on that vulnerable spot until she writhed. Where's the gamekeeper? Kev's voice was passion-thickened. We don't have one yet. Wynne rubbed her cheek and chin against the heavy locks of his hair, relishing the feel of him. How is it that I've never seen this place? His head lifted. It's far in the woods, he whispered, away from noise. He toyed with her breast, softly thumbing the tip. A gamekeeper needs peace and quiet to care for the birds. Wynne was feeling anything but peace and quiet inside, her nerves strung tight, her wrists pulling at the silk bonds. She was dying to touch him, to hold him. Kev, untie my arms. He shook his head. The leisurely pass of his hand along her front caused her to watch. Oh, please, she gasped. Kev! Hush, he murmured. Not yet. His mouth passed hungrily over hers. I've wanted you for too long. I need you too much. His teeth caught at her lower lip with a rousing delicacy. One touch of your hands, and I wouldn't last a second. But I want to hold you, 
she said plaintively. The look on his face sent a thrill through her. Before we're through, love, you're going to hold me with every part of your body. He covered her wild heartbeat with a gentle palm. Lowering his head, he kissed her hot cheek and whispered, Do you understand what I'm going to do, Wynne? She took a fitful breath. I think so. Amelia once explained the basic process to me. And of course, everyone sees the sheep and cattle in spring. That drew a rare grin from him. If that's the standard I'm being held to, we'll have no trouble at all. She captured him with her looped arms and struggled upward to reach his mouth. He kissed her, pushing her back down, sliding one of his knees carefully between her thighs, gently farther and farther, until she felt an intimate pressure against the part of her that had begun to ache. The subtle friction made her rise, a sort of squirmy, shivery delight surging from every slow prod. Night was dissolving into day, morning slanting into the room, the wood awakening with chirps and rustlings, red starts, swallows. She thought briefly of everyone back at Ramsey House, who would soon discover she was gone. A chill went through her, as she wondered if they would look for her. If she returned as a virgin, any future with Kev would be very much in peril. Kev, she whispered in agitation, perhaps you should hurry. Why? he asked against her throat. I'm afraid someone will stop us. His head lifted. No one will stop us. An entire army could surround the cottage. Explosions. Lightning strikes. It's still going to happen. I still think you should go a bit faster. Do you? Kev smiled in a way that made her heart stop. When he was relaxed and happy, she thought, he was the handsomest man who had ever lived. He courted her mouth skillfully, distracting her with deep kisses. At the same time, he took the front of her nightgown in his hands and pulled, tearing the garment in half as if it were no more substantial than paper lace. Wynne gave a discomforted gasp, but held still. Kev levered himself upward. Grasping her wrists, he pulled them over her head once more, exposing her body completely and causing her breasts to lift. He stared at her pale pink nipples. The soft growl that came from his throat caused her to quiver. He bent and opened his mouth over the tip of her right breast and held it against his tongue. So hot, she flinched as if the contact had scalded her. When he lifted his head, the nipple was redder and tighter than it had ever been. His eyes were passion-drowsed as he kissed her other breast. His tongue provoked the soft peak into a stinging bud and soothed it with warm strokes. She pressed upward into the wetness, her breath mixed with low sobs. He drew her nipple between his teeth, clamped it carefully, flicked it. Wynne moaned as his strong hands traced over her body, lingering to tease every vulnerable place he found. Reaching her thighs, he tried to part them, but Wynne held them bashfully closed. Her eagerness to proceed had been obliterated by the dawning awareness of lavish moisture, there, which she had never expected or been told about. I thought you said to hurry, Kev whispered near her ear. His lips wandered over her crimson face. Undo my hands, she begged, perturbed. I need to, well, to tidy up. Tidy up? Giving her a quizzical glance, Kev unwound the length of silk from around her wrists. You mean the room? No, my... myself. Perplexity worked a notch between his dark brows. He stroked the seam of her clamped-together thighs, and she tightened them reflexively. Perceiving the problem, he smiled slightly, while utter tenderness rushed through him. Is this what worries you? He pried her legs apart, finding the slick of moisture with gentle fingers. That you're wet here. She closed her eyes and nodded with a choked sound. No, he soothed. This is good. This is how it's supposed to be. It helps me to go inside you and... His breathing roughened. Oh, Wynne, 
You're so lovely. Let me touch you. Let me have you. In an agony of modesty, Wynne let him push her thighs open farther. She tried to stay quiet and still, but her hips jerked as he stroked the place that had become almost painfully sensitive. He murmured softly, passionately absorbed in the soft female flesh. More wetness, more heat, his touch skimming around and over her, tenderly nudging until one finger slid inside. She stiffened and gasped, and the touch was immediately withdrawn. Did I hurt you? Her lashes lifted. No, she said in wonder. In fact, I didn't feel any pain. She strained to look between them. Is there blood? Perhaps I should... No. Win. There was a near-comical expression of dismay on his face. What I just did isn't going to cause pain or blood. A brief pause. When I do it with my cock, however, it's probably going to hurt like hell. Oh. She pondered that for a moment. Is that the word men use for it? One of the words Gaucho use. What do Roma call it? Cory. What does that mean? Thorn. Wynne slid a bashful glance at the heavy ridge straining behind his trousers and inhaled sharply as his hand moved downward. He gently stroked and teased the clenching interior of her body, and her toes curled into the quilt. Kev, what should I do? Nothing. Only let me please you. All her life she'd hungered for this, without quite knowing what it was, this sweet dissolution of self this mutual surrender. She felt herself soaking up pleasure, her body infused with colour and heat. Kev wouldn't let her hide any part of herself from him. Gently he lifted her body, rolling her this way and that, always with care and yet with passionate insistence. He kissed beneath her arms and along her sides and all over, running his tongue along every curve and humid crease. Gradually, the accumulating pleasure shaped into something dark and raw, and she moaned from the pain of acute need. The drive of her heartbeat reverberated everywhere, in her breasts and limbs and stomach, even at the tips of her fingers and toes. It was too much, this wildness he had aroused. She begged him for a moment's respite. Not yet, he told her between ragged breaths, his tone rough with a triumph she didn't yet understand. Please, Kev, you're so close, I can feel it. Oh, God. He took her head in his hands, kissed her ravenously, and said against her lips, You don't want me to stop yet. Let me show you why. A whimper escaped her as he slid low between her thighs, his head bending to the swollen place he had been tormenting with his fingers. He put his mouth on her licking along the delicate, salty straight, spreading her with his thumbs. She tried to sit upright, but fell back against the pillows as he found what he wanted, his tongue strong and wet. She was spread beneath him as he worshipped her with hot, glassy licks. Moaning, she closed her legs around his head, and he turned deliberately to nibble and lick at one pale inner thigh, then the other, feasting on her wanting everything. Wynne curled her fingers desperately in his hair, lost to shame as she guided him back, her body arching wordlessly. Here, please, more, more, now. And she groaned as he fastened his mouth over her with a fast, flicking rhythm. Pleasure seized her, wrenching an astonished cry from her, holding her stiff and paralysed for excruciating seconds. Every movement and measure and pulse of the universe had distilled to the compelling, slippery heat, riveted there on that crucial place. And then it all released, the feeling and tension shattering exquisitely. Wynne relaxed helplessly as the spasms faded. She was filled with glowing weariness, a sense of peace too pervasive to allow movement. Kev let go of her just long enough to undress himself completely. Naked and aroused, he came back to her. She lifted her arms to him with a drowsy murmur. His back was tough and sleek beneath her fingers. 
the muscles twitching eagerly at her touch. His head descended, his shaven cheek rasping against hers. She welcomed him, flexing her knees and tilting her hips to cradle him. He pushed gently at first. The innocent flesh resisted, smarting at the intrusion. He thrust more strongly, and Wynne caught her breath at the burning pain of his entrance. Too much of him, too hard, too deep. She writhed in reaction, and he buried himself heavily and pinned her down, gasping for her to wait. He wouldn't move. It would be better. They both held still, breathing hard. Should I stop? Kev whispered raggedly, his face taut. Even now, in this flashpoint of need, he was concerned for her. Understanding how much he needed her, Wynne was overwhelmed with love. Don't even think of stopping now, she whispered back. Reaching down to his lean flanks, she stroked him in shy encouragement. He groaned and began to move, his entire body trembling as he pressed within her. Although every thrust caused a sharp burn where they were joined, Wynne tried to pull him even deeper. The feeling of having him inside her went far beyond pain or pleasure. It was necessary. Kev stared down at her, his eyes brilliant in his flushed face. He looked fierce and ravenous, and even a bit disoriented, as if he were experiencing something beyond the scope of ordinary men. Only now did Wynne grasp the enormity of his passion for her. The years it had accumulated, despite all his efforts to smother it, how hard he'd fought against their fate, for reasons she still didn't fully understand. But now he possessed her body with a reverence and intensity that eclipsed all other feeling. And yet he loved her as a woman, not some ethereal creature. His feelings for her were full-blooded, lusty, elemental, exactly as she'd wanted. She took him and took him, wrapping him in her slender legs, burying her face in his throat and shoulder. She loved the sounds he made, the soft growls, the harsh flow of his breath, the power of him around her and inside her. Tenderly, she stroked his back and sides and pressed kisses on his neck. He seemed electrified by her attentions, his movements quickening, his eyes closing tightly. And then he thrust upward and held, and shook all over as if he were dying. Win, he groaned, burying his face against her. Win. The single syllable contained the faith and passion of a thousand prayers. Minutes passed before either of them spoke. They stayed wrapped together, fused and damp and unwilling to part. Wynne smiled as she felt Kev's lips drift over her face. When he reached her chin, he gave it a little nip. Not a pedestal, he said gruffly. Hmm? She stirred, raising her hand to the shaven bristle of his cheek. What do you mean? You said I put you on a pedestal, remember? Yes. It was never that. I've always carried you in my heart. Always. I thought that would have to be enough. Moved, Wynne kissed him gently. What happened, Kev? Why did you change your mind? Chapter 18 Kev took care of her before answering. He left the bed and went to the small kitchen, which had been fitted with a cook stove with a brass water reservoir and pipes leading through the firebox to provide hot water instantly. Filling a hot water can, he brought it to the bedroom along with a clean tea towel. He paused at the sight of Wynne lying on her side, the flowing curves draped in white linen, her hair spilling over her shoulders in rivers of silvery gold, and best of all, the sated softness of her face. It was an image from his deepest dreams, seeing her in bed like that, waiting for him. He dampened the toweling with hot water and peeled back the sheet, enchanted by her beauty. He would have wanted her no matter what, virgin or no, but he privately acknowledged his satisfaction in having been her first lover. No one but he would touch her, pleasure her, see her, except... Wynne. 
he said, frowning as he washed her, pressing the steaming cloth between her thighs. At the clinic, did you ever wear less than your exercise costume? That is, did Harrow ever look at you? Her face was composed, but there was a glitter of amusement in her rich blue eyes. Are you asking if Julian ever saw me naked in a professional capacity? Kev was jealous, and they both knew it, but he couldn't stop from scowling. Yes. No, he didn't, she said primly. He was interested in my respiratory system, which, as you clearly know, is in a far different location than the reproductive organs. He's interested in more than your lungs, Kev said darkly. She smiled. If you're hoping to divert me from the question I asked earlier, it's not working. What happened to you last night, Kev? He rinsed the blood stains from the towel, wrung it out, and pressed another warm pad between her thighs. I was in the pinfold. Her eyes widened. The jail? Is that where Leo went? To get you out? Yes. Why in heaven's name were you behind bars? I was in a fight at the tavern. She clicked her tongue a few times. That's not like you. The statement was loaded with such unintentional irony that Kev nearly laughed. In fact, a few huffs came from deep in his chest, and he was so amused and miserable that he couldn't speak. His expression must have been odd indeed, because Wynne stared at him intently and sat up. She removed the compress and set it aside, and pulled the sheet up over her breasts. She ran a light hand across his bare shoulder, her touch soothing, as she continued to caress him, stroking his chest, his neck, his midriff. Each loving pass of her hand seemed to erode his self-restraint. Until I came to your family, he said hoarsely, it was the only reason I existed, to fight, to hurt people. I was monstrous. Looking into Wynne's eyes, he saw nothing but concern. Tell me, she whispered. He shook his head. A shiver chased across his back. Her hand slipped around the nape of his neck. Slowly, she drew his head down to her shoulder, so that his face was half hidden. Tell me, she urged again. Kev was lost, unable to withhold anything from her now, and he knew what he was about to confess would revolt her, but he found himself doing it anyway. He revealed it all mercilessly, trying to make her understand the violent bastard he'd been, and still was. He told her about the rage that had consumed him always. He revealed cruelties and humiliations inflicted on him that he should have had the pride and good sense to keep to himself. Kev had kept the confessions inside forever, but now they were spilling out like garbage. And he was appalled to realize he'd lost all control, that whenever he tried to stop, all it took was a gentle touch and a murmur from Wynne, and he continued to babble like a criminal with a gallows priest. How could I touch you with these hands? he asked, his tone shredded with anguish. How could you stand to let me? I love your hands, she murmured. I'm not good enough for you. But no one is. And most men, good or bad, have limits to what they would do, even for someone they love. I have none. No God, no moral code, no faith in anything except you. You're my religion. I would do anything you asked. I would fight, steal, kill for you. I would... Shh! Hush! My goodness! She sounded breathless. There's no need to break all the commandments, Kev. You don't understand, he said, drawing back to look at her. If you believed anything I've told you... I do understand. Her face was gentle and compassionate. And I believe what you've said but I don't agree at all with the conclusions you seem to have drawn. Her hands lifted, moulding against his lean cheeks. You're a good man, a loving one. Your uncle tried to kill all that inside you, but he couldn't succeed, because of your strength, because of your heart. She eased back onto the bed and drew him down to her. Be at ease, Kev, 
she whispered. Your uncle was an evil man, but what he did must be buried with him. Let the dead bury the dead. Do you know what that means? He shook his head. To leave the past behind and look only to the journey ahead. Only then can you find a new way, a new life. It's a Christian saying, but it would make sense to a Rom, I think. It made more sense than Wynne perhaps even realised. The Rom had certain rituals about death and the dead, destroying the possessions of those who had passed, mentioning the name of the deceased as seldom as possible. It was for the benefit of the dead as well as the living, to keep them from returning to the living world as wretched ghosts. Let the dead bury the dead. But he wasn't certain he could. Hard to let go, he said gruffly. Hard to forget. Yes, her arms tightened around him. But we'll fill your mind with much better things to think about. Kev was quiet for a long time, pressing his ear to Wynne's chest, listening to her heartbeat and the flow of her breathing. I knew when I first saw you what you would mean to me, Wynne murmured eventually. Wild, angry boy that you were, I loved you at once. You felt it too, didn't you? He nodded slightly, luxuriating in the feel of her. Her skin smelled sweet like plums, with an arousing hint of feminine musk. I wanted to be close to you from the very beginning. She threaded her fingers through his hair. Outrageous man! What possessed you to kidnap me, when you knew I would have come willingly? I was making a point he said in a muffled voice. She chuckled and stroked his scalp, the scrape of her oval fingernails nearly causing him to purr. Your point was well taken. Must we go back now? Do you want to? Wynne shook her head. Although, I wouldn't mind having something to eat. I brought food to the cottage before I went to fetch you. She ran a flirtatious fingertip around the rim of his ear, May we stay all day, then? Yes. Wynne wriggled with delight. Will anyone come for us? I doubt it. Kev drew the bed linens lower and nuzzled into the lush valley between her breasts. And I would kill the first person who approached the threshold. A quiet laugh caught in her throat. What is it? he asked without moving. Oh, I was just thinking of all the years I spent trying to get out of bed to be with you. And when I came home, all I wanted was to get back into bed with you. For breakfast, they had strong tea and rabbit. Cheese melted on thick slices of buttered toasted bread. Wrapped in Kev's shirt, Wynne perched on a low stool in the kitchen she took pleasure in watching the play of muscle on his back as he poured steaming water into a portable hip bath. Smiling, she popped the last morsel of rabbit into her mouth. There seemed a near magical aura about this ordinary place, this small and quiet cottage. Wynne was almost afraid she was dreaming, that she would wake alone in her chaste bed. But Kev's presence was too vital and real for it to be a dream and the small aches and twinges in her body offered further proof that she had been taken, possessed. They all know by now, Wynne said absently, thinking of everyone at Ramsey House. Poor Julian, he must be furious. What about heartbroken? Kev set the water can aside and came to her dressed only in trousers. Wynne frowned thoughtfully. He'll be disappointed, I think. And I believe he cares for me. But no, he won't be heartbroken. She leaned against Kev as he stroked her hair, and her cheek brushed the taut smoothness of his stomach. He never wanted me the way you do. Any man who didn't would have to be a eunuch. There was a hitch in his breath as Wynne kissed the rim of his navel. Did you tell him what the London doctor said? That you were healthy enough to bear children? Wynne nodded. What did Harrow say? Julian told me that I could visit a legion of doctors and get any number of differing opinions to support the conclusion I wanted. But in Julian's view, 
I should remain childless. Kev brought her to a standing position and looked down at her, his expression unfathomable. I don't want to put you at risk, but neither do I trust Harrow or his opinions. Because you think of him as a rival? That's part of it, he admitted, but it's also instinct. There's something lacking in him. There's something false. Men of his profession often seem aloof, Wynne suggested, shivering as Kev drew his shirt away from her. Superior, even. But that's necessary because— It's not that. Kev guided her to the hip bath and helped to lower her in. Wynne gasped not only from the heat of the water, but also from being naked in front of him. The hip bath obliged one to straddle the tub and relax into the water with the legs held apart, which was wonderfully comfortable in private, but rather mortifying with someone else present. Her modesty was further violated as Kev knelt beside the tub and washed her. But his manner was not at all lascivious, only caring, and she couldn't help but relax under the ministrations of those strong, soothing hands. You still suspect Julian of having harmed his first wife, I know, Wynne said, while Kev bathed her. But he's a healer. He would never hurt anyone, least of all his own wife. She paused as she read Kev's expression. You don't believe me. You're determined to think the worst of him. I think he feels entitled to play with life and death, like the gods of those mythology stories you and your sisters are so fond of. You don't know Julian as I do. Kev didn't reply, only continued to wash her. You'll never be disposed to think well of him, will you? She asked wryly. No, he admitted. And if you believed Julian was the better man, she asked, would you have allowed him to marry me? She saw the muscles in his throat tense before he answered. No, he said ruefully. I'm not that noble. I wouldn't let him marry you unless it was really what you wanted. Wynne wanted to tell him that she had no desire for him to be noble. She was happy, thrilled, to be loved this way, with a passion that left no room for anything else. But before she could say a word, Kev had taken up more soap, and his hand glided over the soreness between her thighs. He touched her with love and ownership, her eyes half-closed, his finger eased inside her, and his free arm slid behind her back, and she leaned weakly into the cradle of his hard chest and shoulder. Even this small invasion hurt. Her flesh was still too newly broached, unused to being entered. But the hot water soothed her, and Kev was so gentle that her thighs relaxed, supported in the buoyant warmth. She breathed in the morning air, luminous with steam, scented of soap and wood and hot copper, and the intoxicating fragrance of her lover. She brushed her lips against his shoulder, savouring the rich taste of skin salt. His warm, tickling fingers stroked against her like the idle sway of river reeds, cunning fingertips that quickly discovered where she most wanted them. He toyed with her, parting her slowly investigating the cambered softness and the sensitive places within. Blindly, she reached down to grip his strong wrist, feeling the intricate movements of bone and tendon. He slid two fingers inside her, his thumb gliding over her sex in tender circles. The water sloshed in the tub as she began to push up rhythmically, urging herself into his hand. A third finger worked inside, and she tightened and gasped out a protest. It was too much, she couldn't. But he whispered that she could, she must, and he stretched her carefully and took her groans into his mouth. Splayed and floating, Wynne felt herself loosening, opening to the sensuality of the fingers reaching inside her. She felt greedy and wild, undulating to capture more of the obliterating pleasure. She actually clawed him a little, her hands scrabbling against his hard, bare skin, and he growled as if it pleased him. An abbreviated cry left her lips at the first shock of release. She tried to stifle it, but another was torn from her, and another, and the bath water rippled as she shuddered, 
the climax lengthened by the delicately emphatic thrusting that continued until she was limp and panting. Settling her against the high-backed tub, Kev left her for a few minutes. She soaked in the steaming water, too replete to ask or notice where he'd gone. He returned with a length of toweling and lifted her from the bath. She stood passively before him, letting him dry her as if she were a child. As she leaned against him, she saw that she had scored little red marks on his skin. Not deep ones, but marks nonetheless. She should have been apologetic, horrified, but all she wanted was to do it again, to feast on him. Lowering her head, she drew the tip of her tongue over one of the marks and felt him shiver in response. Kev carried her back into the bedroom and tucked her into a freshly made bed. She slid deep beneath the quilts and waited for him, drowsing, while he went to wash himself and empty the tub. She was steeped in a feeling she hadn't experienced in years, the kind of incandescent joy she'd felt as a child waking on Christmas morning. She had stayed quietly in her bed, relishing the knowledge of all the good things that would soon happen, her heart alight with anticipation. Wynne's eyes half opened as she felt him climb into bed eventually. His weight depressed the mattress, his body startlingly warm against Wynne's coolness. Snuggling into the crook of his arm and shoulder, she sighed deeply. His hand made a slow, lovely pattern over her back. Will we have a cottage like this some day? she murmured. Being Kev, he had already come up with a plan. We'll live at Ramsey House for a year. More likely, too, until the restoration is complete and Leo is on his feet. Then I'll find a suitable property for a farm and build a house for you. A bit larger than this, I expect. His hand slid to her bottom, rubbing in slow circles. It won't be an extravagant life, but it will be comfortable. You'll have a cook maid and a footman and a driver, and we'll live near your family, so you can see them whenever you like. That sounds lovely, Wynne managed to say, so filled with happiness she could scarcely breathe. It will be heaven. She had no doubt of his ability to take care of her, nor did she doubt that she could make him happy. They would create a good life together, though she was fairly certain it would not be an ordinary one. His tone was sober. If you marry me, you'll never be a lady of position. There's no better position for me than being your wife. One of his big hands clasped over her skull, pressing her head against his shoulder. I always wanted more for you than this. Liar, she whispered. You always wanted me for yourself. Laughter stirred in his chest. Yes, he admitted. They were quiet then, relishing the sensation of lying together in the morning-filled room. They had been close in so many ways before this. They had known each other so well, and yet not at all. Physical intimacy had created a new dimension to Wynne's feelings, as if she had taken not only his body inside hers, but also a part of his soul. She wondered how it was that people could engage in this act without love, how empty and pointless it must be by comparison. Her bare foot explored the hairy surface of his leg, toes nudging against hard, sculpted muscle. Did you think about me when you were with them? She asked tentatively. Who? The women you slept with. She knew from the way Kev tensed that he didn't like the question. His reply was low and guilt-roughened. I didn't think about anything when I was with them. Wynne let her hand wander over his smooth chest, finding the small brown nipples, teasing them into points. Rising on her elbow, she said frankly, When I imagine you doing this with someone else, I can hardly bear it. His hand came over hers, securing it against his strong heartbeat. They meant nothing to me. It was always a transaction, something to be done with as quickly as possible. I think that makes it even worse, to use a woman in that way with no feeling. They were well compensated, 
he said, and always willing, and I was careful not to hurt anyone. You should have found someone you cared for, someone who cared for you. That would have been infinitely better than a loveless transaction. I couldn't. Couldn't what? Care about anyone else. You took up too much room in my heart. Wynne wondered what it said about her terrible selfishness that such an answer moved and pleased her. After you left, Kev said, I thought I'd go mad. There was no place I could go to feel better. No person I wanted to be with. I wanted you to get well. I would have given my life for it. But at the same time, I hated you for leaving. I hated everything, including my own heart for beating. I had only one reason to live, and that was to see you again. Did the women help? she asked softly. Did it ease you to lie with them? He shook his head. It made it worse, came his soft reply, because they weren't you. Wynne leaned farther over him, her hair falling in glinting light ribbons that went across his chest and throat and arms. I want us to be faithful to each other, she said gravely, from this day forward. There was a brief silence, a hesitation born not of doubt but awareness, as if their vows were being heard and witnessed by some unseen presence. Kev's chest rose and fell in a long, deep breath. I'll be faithful to you, he said, forever. So will I. Promise you'll never leave me again. Wynne lifted her hand from the centre of his chest and pressed a kiss there. I promise. She was entirely willing, eager to seal their vows then, but he wouldn't. He wanted her to rest, her body to have respite, and when she objected, he quieted her with gentle kisses. Sleep, he whispered, and she obeyed, sinking into the sweetest, darkest oblivion she had ever known. Daylight canted impatiently against the unlined curtains at the windows, turning them into bright, butter-coloured rectangles. Kev had held wind for hours. He had not slept at all in that time. The pleasure of staring at her eclipsed the need for rest. There had been other times in his life when he had watched over her like this, especially when she'd been ill. But it was different now that she belonged to him. He had always been consumed with longing, loving Wynne, and knowing nothing would ever come of it. Now, holding her, he felt something unfamiliar, a bloom of euphoric heat. He let himself kiss her, unable to resist following the glinting arc of her eyebrow with his lips. He moved on to the rosy curve of her cheek, the tip of a nose so adorable that it seemed worthy of an entire sonnet. He loved every part of her. It occurred to him that he had not yet kissed the spaces between her toes, an omission that desperately needed to be corrected. Wynne slept with one of her legs hitched over him, her knee tucked between his. Feeling the intimate brush of blonde curls against his hip, he went erect, his flesh alive with a hard, precise throbbing he could feel against the linen sheet that covered him. She stirred and moved her limbs in a trembling stretch, and her eyes half opened. He sensed her surprise at waking in his arms this way, and the slow dawning of satisfaction as she remembered what had gone before. Her hands crept over him, exploring softly. He was taut everywhere, aroused and unmoving, letting her discover him as she wished. Wynne reconnoitred his body with an innocent abandon that seduced him utterly. Her lips brushed the taut skin of his chest and side. Finding the edge of his lowest rib, she gnawed gently, like a fastidious little cannibal. One of her hands trailed over his thigh and wandered up to his groin. He said her name between fragmented breaths, reaching down to those tormenting fingers, but she swatted his hand away with an audible crack of skin against skin, and that aroused him beyond reason. Wynne cupped the mass of him below, the shifting weights heavy against her palm. She squeezed, gently rolled the roundness, 
while he set his teeth and endured her touch as if he were being drawn and quartered. Moving upward, she gripped the shaft lightly, too lightly. Kev would have begged her to do it harder had he been able to spare the breath. But he could only wait, gasping, her head bent over him, her golden hair trapping him in a glimmering net. Despite his will to remain still, he couldn't stop the vicious twitch of his cock, the length of it jutting upward. To his shock, he felt her lean down to kiss him, and she continued, working upward along the stiff shaft while he groaned with pleasure and disbelief. Her beautiful mouth on him. He was dying, losing his sanity. She was too inexperienced to know how to proceed. She didn't take him deep, only licked the tip as he had done to her before. Kev let out an anguished groan as he felt a sweet, wet tug and heard the sound of her suckling. He seized her hips, dragged them upward and buried his face in her, his tongue working voraciously until she writhed like a captured mermaid. Tasting her arousal, he sank his tongue deep again and again. Her legs stiffened, as if she were about to come. But he had to be inside her when it happened, had to feel her grip and clench around him. So he carefully eased her onto her front and pushed a pillow beneath her hips. She moaned and parted her knees wider. Needing no further invitation, he positioned himself, his cock slick with the moisture from her mouth. Reaching beneath her, he found the tiny swollen bud, and he massaged slowly while he pushed into her, his fingers stroking faster with every hard inch that entered, and when he'd finally buried his full length, she climaxed with a sobbing cry. Kev could have found his own release then, but he had to prolong it. If it had been possible, he would have gone on forever. He drew one hand along the elegant curve of her back. She arched into the caress, sighing his name. He lay over her, changing the angle between them, still cupping her sex as he thrust. She shuddered as a few more spasms were teased out, passion splotches rising on her shoulders and back. He put his mouth to the patches of colour, kissing every blushing place as he rocked slowly, working deeper in her tighter, until he finally went still and came with violent spurts. Rolling off her, Kev gathered Wynne against his ribs and struggled to catch his breath. His heartbeat hammered in his ears for some minutes, which was why he was slow to notice a knock at the door. Wynne reached up to his cheeks and guided his face to hers. Her eyes were round. Someone's here, she said. Chapter 19 Cursing beneath his breath, Kev dragged on his trousers and shirt and went barefoot to the door. Opening it, he saw Cam Rowan standing there nonchalantly, a valise in one hand and a covered basket in the other. Hello. Cam's hazel eyes danced with mischief. I've brought you a few things. How did you find us? Kev asked without heat. I knew you hadn't gone far. None of your clothes were missing, nor any bags or trunks. And since the front gatehouse was too obvious, this was the next place I thought of. Aren't you going to invite me in? No, Kev said shortly, and Cam grinned. If our positions were reversed, Fral, I suppose I'd be just as inhospitable. There's food in the basket and clothes for both of you in the valise. Thank you. Kev took the items and set them just inside the door. Straightening, he looked at his brother, searching for any sign of censure. There was none. Oviel o isi? Cam asked. It was a Romany phrase, meaning, is all well here? But it was literally translated as, is there heart here? Which seemed rather appropriate. Yes, Kev said softly. There is nothing you need. For the first time in my life, Kev admitted, there is nothing I need. Cam smiled. Good. Nonchalantly tucking his hands in his coat pockets, he braced a shoulder against the doorframe. What's the situation at Ramsey House? Kev asked, half dreading the answer. 
There were a few moments of chaos this morning, when it was discovered you were both gone. A diplomatic pause. Harrow's been insisting Wynne was taken against her will. At one point he threatened to go to the parish constable. Harrow says if you don't return with Wynne by nightfall, he'll take drastic action. What would that be? Kev inquired darkly. I don't know. But you might give a thought to the rest of us having to stay at Ramsay House with him while you're out here with his fiancée. She's my fiancée now, and I'll bring her back when I damn well please. Understood. Cam's lips twitched. You intend to marry her soon, I hope. Not soon, Kev said. Immediately. Thank God. Even for the Hathaways, this is a little too eccentric. Cam glanced over Kev's dishevelled form and smiled. It's good to see you at ease finally, Mary Penn. If it were anyone but you, I'd say you actually looked happy. Kev scrubbed his hand through his hair and asked guardedly, Are the Hathaways angry about what I've done? You mean carrying Wynne off? The only complaint I heard was that you took far too long. Do any of them know where we are? Not that I'm aware of. Cam's smile turned wry. I can buy you a few more hours, Frau, but have her back by nightfall, if for no other reason than to shut Harrow up. He frowned slightly. He's an odd one, that Gajo. Kev gave him an alert glance. Why do you say that? Cam shrugged. Most men in his position would have done something, anything by now, destroyed some furniture, gone for someone's throat. By this time... I would have turned all of Hampshire upside down to find my woman. But Harrow only talks. And talks. About what? He's said quite a lot about what his rights are, what he's entitled to, his sense of betrayal. But so far, it hasn't occurred to him to express any concern about Wynne's welfare, or consider what she wants. He acts like a child, whose toy has been taken from him, and wants it to be given back. Cam grimaced. Damned embarrassing, even for a gajo. He raised his voice and called to the unseen win. I'm leaving now. Good day, little sister. And to you, her cheerful voice floated back. They unpacked a feast from the basket. Cold roast fowl, a variety of salads, fruit, and thick slices of seed cake. After devouring the lot... They sat before the hearth on a quilt. Dressed only in Kev's shirt, Wynne sat between his thighs while he brushed the tangles from her hair. He ran his fingers repeatedly through the length of silk, which gleamed like moonlight in his hands. Shall we go for a walk, now that I have my clothes? Wynne asked. If you like. Kev held her hair aside and kissed the nape of her neck. And afterward, back to bed. She shivered and made a sound of amusement. I've never known you to spend so much time abed. Until now, I've never had a good reason. Setting the brush aside, he pulled her into his lap and cradled her. He kissed her lazily. She pushed upward with increasing demand, making him smile and pull back. Easy, he said, stroking her jaw. We're not going to start that again. But you just said you wanted to go back to bed. I meant to rest. We're not going to make love any more. Not today, he said gently. You've had enough. He brushed his thumb over her kiss-swollen lips. Any more and you wouldn't be able to walk tomorrow. But as he was discovering, any challenge to Wynne's physical stamina was met with immediate resistance. I'm quite well she said stubbornly, sitting up in his lap. She spread kisses over his face and throat, everywhere she could reach. Once more, before we go back, I need you, Kev. I need... He quieted her with his mouth and received such an ardently impatient response that he couldn't help chuckling against her lips. She drew back and demanded, Are you laughing at me? No, no. It's only... You're adorable. You please me so much. My eager little Gaji. He kissed her again, trying to calm her. But she was insistent, 
stripping off his shirt, pulling his hands to her naked body. Why are you so anxious? he whispered, lying back on the quilt with her. No, wait. Win, talk to me. She went still in his arms, her small, frowning face close to his. I'm afraid to go back, she admitted. I feel as if something bad will happen. We can't hide here forever, Kev murmured, stroking her hair. Nothing will happen, love. We've gone too far to turn back. You're mine now, and no one can change that. Are you afraid of Harrow? Is that it? Not afraid, exactly. But I'm not looking forward to facing him. Of course not, Kev said quietly. I'll help you through it. I'll talk to him first. I don't think that would be wise, she said uncertainly. I insist on it. I won't lose my temper. But I'm going to take responsibility for what I've done. I would hardly leave you to handle the consequences without me. Wynne lowered her cheek to his shoulder. Are you certain nothing will happen to change your mind about marrying me? Nothing in the world could do that. Feeling the tension in her body, he ran his hands over her, lingering on her chest, where every heartbeat was a hard, anxious collision. He rubbed a circle to soothe her. What can I do to make you feel better? he asked tenderly. I already told you, and you wouldn't, she said in a small, sullen voice, and that drew a smothered laugh from him. Then you'll have your way, he whispered, but slowly, so I won't hurt you. He kissed the spaces behind her earlobes and moved down to the smooth whiteness of her shoulders, the pulse at the base of her throat. More softly still, he kissed the plump curves of her breasts. Her nipples were bright and stung-looking from all his previous attentions. He was careful with them, his mouth gentle as he covered a swollen peak. Wynne made a little movement, gave a faint hiss, and he guessed the nipple was smarting. But her hands came to his head, holding him there. He used his tongue to make languid circles— sucking only enough to keep the tender flesh inside the clamp of his lips. He spent a long time at her breasts, keeping his mouth soft, until she moaned and stirred her hips, needing more than the faint, feathery stimulation. Dragging his lips down between her thighs, Kev rooted in the hot silk of her, finding the delicate, blunt point of her clitoris, using the velvet flat of his tongue to paint and caress. She clutched his head more tightly and sobbed his name, the throaty sound exciting him. When the responsive movements of her hips took on a regular rhythm, he pulled his mouth from her and pushed her knees wide and apart. He took an eternity to ease into the lush, clenching flesh. Fully seated, he wrapped his arms around her, securing her against his body. She wriggled, urging him to thrust— but he held still and fast and pressed his mouth to her ear and whispered that he would make her come just like this. He would stay hard inside her as long as it took. Her ear turned scarlet, and she tightened and throbbed around him. Please move, she whispered, and he gently said no. Please move, please. No, but after a while he began to flex his hips in a subtle rhythm. She whimpered and trembled as he drove her, nudging deeper, relentless in his restraint. The climax broke over her finally, tearing low cries from her lips, bringing wild shudders to the surface. Kev was quiet, experiencing a release so acute and paralyzing that it robbed him of all sound. Her slender body pulled at him milked him, enclosed him in delicate heat. The pleasure was so great it caused an unfamiliar stinging in his eyes and nose, and that shook him to his foundations. Bloody hell, Kev thought, realising that something had changed in him, something that could never be put back. All his defences had been reduced to one small woman. She was the world to him. The sun was descending into the basin of rich, wooded valleys by the time they had both dressed. 
the fires were extinguished, leaving the cottage cold and dark. Wynne clung to Kev's hand anxiously as he led her to the horse. I wonder why happiness always seems so fragile, she said. I think the things our family has experienced, losing our parents, Leo losing Laura, the fire, my illness, have made me aware of how easily the things we value can be snatched away. Life can change from one moment to the next. Some things last forever. Wynne stopped and turned to face him, wrapping her arms around his neck. He responded immediately, holding her secure and close, locking her against his powerful body. Wynne buried her face in his chest. I hope so, she said after a moment. Are you really mine now, Kev? I've always been yours, he said against her ear. Braced for the usual clamour of her sisters, Wynne was relieved when she and Kev returned to Ramsey House and found it serene and quiet, so unusually serene that it was clear everyone had agreed to behave as if nothing unusual had transpired. She found Amelia, Poppy, Miss Marks and Beatrix in the upstairs parlour, the first three doing needlework while Beatrix read aloud. As Wynne entered the room cautiously, Beatrix paused, and the women looked up with bright, curious gazes. Hello, dear, Amelia said warmly. Did you have a nice outing with Mary Penn? As if it had been nothing more than a picnic or carriage drive. Yes, thank you, Wynne smiled at Beatrix. Do go on, B. Whatever you're reading sounds lovely. It's a sensation novel, Beatrix said. Very exciting. There's a dark and gloomy mansion, and servants who behave oddly, and a secret door behind a tapestry. She lowered her voice dramatically. Someone's about to be murdered. While Beatrix continued, Wynne sat beside Amelia. Wynne felt her older sister's hand reach for hers, a small but capable hand, a comforting grip. So much was expressed in Amelia's loving clasp, and in the returning pressure of Wynne's fingers. Concern, acceptance, reassurance. Where is he? Amelia whispered. Wynne felt a pang of worry, though she kept her expression serene. He's gone to talk to Julian. Amelia's grip tightened. Well, she returned wryly, it should be a lively conversation. Dr. Harrow has been saving up quite a few things to say. You crude, stupid peasant! Julian Harrow was white-faced but controlled as he and Kev met in the library. You have no idea what you've done. In your haste to reach out and grab what you want, you've given no heed to the consequences. And you won't until it's too late, until you've killed her. Having a fairly good idea of what Harrow was going to say, Kev had already decided how he would deal with him. For Wynne's sake, Kev would tolerate any number of insults or accusations. The doctor would have his say, and Kev would let it all roll off his back. He had won. Wynne was his now, and nothing else mattered. It wasn't easy, however. Harrow was the perfect picture of an outraged romantic hero. Slim, elegant, his face pale and indignant. He made Kev feel like a swarthy, oafish villain by contrast. And those last words, until you've killed her, chilled him to the marrow. So many vulnerable creatures had suffered at his hands. No one with Kev's past could ever deserve win. And even though she had forgiven his history of brutality, he could never forget. No one's going to harm her, Kev said. It's obvious that as your wife, she would have been well cared for. But it wasn't what she wanted. She's made her choice. Under duress, I didn't force her. Of course you did, Harrow said with contempt. You carried her off in a display of brute strength. And being a woman, of course she thought it thrilling and romantic. And in the future, as she's dying in childbirth in grotesque pain, she won't blame you for it. But you'll know you were responsible. A harsh laugh escaped him as he saw Kev's expression. 
<laughs> Are you really so simple you don't understand what I'm saying? You believe she's too fragile to bear children, Kev said. But she consulted another doctor in London who... Yes, did Winifred tell you the name of this doctor? Harrow's eyes were frosty grey, his tone brittle with condescension. Kev shook his head. I persisted in asking, Harrow said, until she told me. I knew at once it was an invented name, a sham. But just to make certain, I checked the registers of every legitimate physician in London. The doctor she named doesn't exist. She was lying, Mary Penn. Harrow raked his hands through his hair and paced back and forth. Women are as devious as children when it comes to getting their way. My God, you're easily manipulated, aren't you? Kev couldn't answer. He'd believed Wynne for the simple reason that she never lied. As far as he knew, there was only one time in her life she'd ever willfully deceived him, and that had been to trick him into taking morphine when he'd been suffering from a burn wound. Later, he'd understood why she'd done it, and he'd forgiven her at once. But if she'd lied about this, anguish burned like acid in his blood. Now he understood why Wynne had been so nervous about returning. Harrow paused at the library table and went to half sit, half lean on it. I still want her, he said quietly. I'm still willing to have her. On the condition she hasn't conceived, he broke off as Kev fastened a lethal glare on him. Oh, you may glower, but you can't deny the truth. Look at you. How can you justify what you've done? Harrow watched Kev closely as he continued. I'm sure you love her in your fashion. Not in a refined way, but as much as someone of your kind is capable. I find that somewhat touching and pitiable. No doubt Winifred feels that the bonds of childhood kinship give you more of a claim on her than any other man could possibly have. But she has been too long sheltered from the world. She has neither the wisdom nor the experience to know her own needs. If she does marry you, it will only be a matter of time before she tires of you and wants more than you could ever offer. Go find a sturdy peasant girl who would be happy with the simple life you could give her. Do the right thing, Mary Penn. Give her to me. It's not too late. She'll be safe with me. Kev could barely hear his own rasping voice, his pulse hammering with confusion and despair and fury. Maybe I should ask the Lanhams. Would they agree that she'd be safer with you? And without glancing to judge the effect of his words, Kev strode from the library. Wynne's sense of unease grew as evening settled over the house. She stayed in the parlour with her sisters and Miss Marks until Beatrix had tired of reading. The only relief from Wynne's growing tension was in watching the antics of Beatrix's ferret, Dodger, who seemed enamoured of Miss Marks, despite, or perhaps because of, her obvious antipathy. He kept creeping up to the governess and trying to steal one of her knitting needles, while she watched him with narrowed eyes. Don't! Even consider it, Miss Marks told the hopeful ferret with chilling calm, or I'll cut off your tail with a carving knife. Beatrix grinned. I thought that only happened to blind mice, Miss Marks. It works on any offending rodent, Miss Marks returned darkly. Ferrets are not rodents, actually, Beatrix said. They're classified as mustelidae, weasels. One might say the ferret is a distant cousin of the mouse. It's not a family I'd care to become closely acquainted with, Poppy said. Dodger draped himself across the arm of the settee and pinned a love-struck gaze on Miss Marks, who ignored him. Wynne smiled and stretched. I'm fatigued. I'll bid everyone good night now. I'm fatigued as well, Amelia said, covering a deep yawn. Perhaps we should all retire, Miss Marks suggested, deftly packing away her knitting in a little basket. They all went to their rooms, while Wynne's nerves bristled in the ominous silence of the hallway. Where was Kev? 
what had been said between him and Julian. A lamp burned low in her room, its glow pushing feebly against the encroaching shadows. She blinked as she saw a motionless form in the corner. Kev, occupying a chair. Oh, she breathed in surprise. His gaze tracked her as she came closer to him. Kev? she asked hesitantly, while a chill slithered down her spine. The talk had not gone well. Something was wrong. What is it? she asked huskily. Kev stood and towered over her, his expression unfathomable. Who was the doctor you saw in London? he asked. How did you find him? Then she understood. Her stomach dropped, and she took a few steadying breaths. There was no doctor, she said. I didn't see the need for it. You didn't see the need, he repeated slowly. No, because, as Julian said later, I could go from doctor to doctor until I found one who would give me the answer I wanted. Kev let out a breath that sounded like a scrape in his throat. He shook his head. Jesus. Wynne had never seen him look so devastated, beyond shouting or anger. She moved toward him with her hand outstretched. Kev, please, let me... Don't, please. He was struggling visibly to control himself. I'm sorry, she said earnestly. I wanted you so much, and I was going to have to marry Julian, and I thought if I told you about having seen another doctor, it would, well, push you a bit. He turned away from her, his hands clenched. It makes no difference, Wynne said, trying to sound calm, trying to think above the desperate pounding of her heart. It changes nothing, especially after today. It makes a difference if you lie to me, he said. She had broken Kev's trust at a time when he had been particularly vulnerable. He had let down his guard, let her inside. But how else could she have had him? I didn't feel I had a choice, she said. You're impossibly stubborn when your mind is made up. I didn't know how to change it. Then you've just lied again, because you're not sorry. I'm sorry that you're hurt and angry, and I understand how much you... She broke off as Kev moved with astonishing swiftness, seizing her by the upper arms, bringing her up against the wall. His snarling face descended close to hers. If you understood anything, you wouldn't expect me to give you a baby that will kill you. Rigid and trembling, Wynne stared into his eyes until she was drowning in darkness. She gulped a deep breath before managing to say stubbornly, I'll see as many doctors as you like. We'll gather a full variety of opinions, and you can calculate the odds. But no one can predict of a certainty what will happen, and none of it will change how I intend to spend the rest of my life. I'll live it on my terms. And you, you can have all of me or nothing. I won't be an invalid any longer. Not even if it means losing you. I don't take ultimatums. Wynne's eyes went blurry, and she damned the rising tears. She wondered in furious despair why fate seemed determined to withhold from her the ordinary life that other people took for granted. It's not your choice, she said hoarsely. It's mine. My body. My risk. And it may already be too late. I may have already conceived. No. He gripped her head and pressed his forehead to hers. I can't do this, he said raggedly. I won't be forced into hurting you. Just love me. Wynne wasn't aware that she was crying until she felt his mouth on her face, his throat vibrating with a low groan. He kissed her with a desperation that made her quiver from head to toe. As he crushed his body against hers, she felt the prodding of his arousal, even through the bunched layers of their clothes. It sent a shock of response through all her veins, and she felt her intimate flesh prickling, turning wet. She wanted him inside her, to pull him deep and close, 
to pleasure him until his ferocity was soothed. She reached down to the stiff length of him, kneading and gripping until he groaned into her mouth. She pulled her lips free long enough to gasp, Take me to bed, Kev, take me! But he pushed away from her with a curse. Kev! A scalding glance, and he left the room, the door trembling on its hinges from the abrupt slam. Chapter 20 Cam awakened slowly as he felt his wife's voluptuous body snuggling close to his. She always slept in a nightgown made of modest white cambric with infinite numbers of tucks and tiny ruffles. It never failed to stir him, knowing what splendid curves were concealed beneath the demure garment. The nightgown had ridden up to her knees during the night. One of her bare legs was hooked over his, her knee resting near his groin. The slight roundness of her stomach pressed against his side. Pregnancy had made her feminine form more ample and delicious. There was a glow about her these days, and a new vulnerability that filled him with an overwhelming urge to protect her. Knowing the changes in her were caused by his seed, a part of him growing inside her, that was undeniably arousing. He wouldn't have expected to be this enthralled by Amelia's condition, but he couldn't help it. She was the most beautiful and fascinating creature on earth. As he patted her hip drowsily, the urge to make love was too much to resist. He inched her gown upward and caressed her bare bottom. He kissed her lips, her chin, savouring the fine texture of her skin. Amelia stirred. Can, she murmured sleepily. Her legs parted, inviting more of the gentle exploration. Cam smiled against her cheek. What a good little wife you are, he whispered. She stretched and gave a pleasured sigh as his hands slipped over her warm body. He arranged her limbs carefully, stroking and praising her, kissing her breasts. His fingers played between her thighs, teasing wickedly, until she began to breathe in quiet moans. Her hands clutched at his back as he mounted her, his body hungry for the warm, wet welcome of her. A tap at the door, a muffled voice. Amelia! They both froze. The soft, feminine voice tried again. Amelia! One of my sisters, Amelia whispered. Cam muttered a curse that explicitly described what he had been about to do and was apparently not going to be able to finish. Your family, he began in a dark tone. I know, she flipped back the bedclothes. I'm sorry, I... She broke off as she saw the extent of his arousal and said weakly, Oh dear. Although he was usually tolerant when it came to the Hathaway's multitude of quirks and issues, Cam was currently in no mood to be understanding. Get rid of whoever it is, he said, and come back here. I'll try. She pulled a dressing robe over her nightgown and hastily fastened the top three buttons. As she hurried into the adjoining sitting room, the thin white dressing robe flapped behind her like the mainsail of a schooner. Cam remained on his side, listening intently. There was the sound of the door to the hallway opening and someone coming into the little sitting room. There was also the calm lilt of Amelia's questioning voice and the anxious response of one of her sisters. Win, he guessed, since Poppy and Beatrix would only awaken this early in the event of some major catastrophe. One of the things Cam adored about Amelia was her unflagging interest in all the concerns, large and small, of her siblings. She was a little mother hen, valuing family as much as any Romany wife. That felt good to him. It hearkened back to his early childhood, when he'd still been allowed to live with the tribe. Family was equally important to them, but it also meant having to share Amelia— which, at times like this, was damned annoying. After a few minutes, the feminine chatter still hadn't stopped. Gathering that Amelia wasn't going to return to bed any time soon, Cam sighed and left the bed. 
He dragged on some clothes, went into the sitting room, and saw Amelia on a small settee with Wynne, who looked wretched. They were so intent on their conversation that Cam's appearance was barely heeded. Sitting in a nearby chair, Cam listened until he comprehended that Wynne had lied to Mary Penn about having seen a doctor, that Mary Penn had been furious, and that the relationship between the two was in a shambles. Amelia turned to Cam, her forehead puckered with concern. Perhaps Wynne shouldn't have deceived him, but it's her right to make this decision for herself. Amelia retained her sister's hand as she spoke. You know I would love nothing better than to keep Wynne safe from harm, always, but even I have to acknowledge it isn't possible. Mary Penn must accept that Wynne wants a normal, married life with him. Cam rubbed his face and stifled a yawn. The way to make him accept that is not to manipulate him. He looked at Wynne directly. Little sister, you know it goes completely against his grain to be told what to do. I didn't tell him what to do, Wynne protested miserably. I just told him that it didn't matter what he thought or felt, Cam murmured, that you intend to live on your own terms no matter what. Yes, she said faintly, but I didn't mean to imply that I didn't care about his feelings. Cam smiled ruefully. I admire your fortitude, little sister. I even happen to agree with your position. But even your sister, who isn't generally known for her diplomacy, knows better than to approach me in such an uncompromising way. I am quite diplomatic when I wish to be, Amelia protested, frowning and he gave her a brief grin. Turning to Wynne, Amelia admitted reluctantly, Cam is correct, however. Wynne was quiet for a moment, absorbing that. What should I do now? Both women looked at Cam. The last thing he wanted was to involve himself in Wynne and Mary Penn's problems, and God knew Mary Penn would probably be as charming as a baited bear this morning. All Cam wanted was to go back to bed and plough his wife, and perhaps sleep a bit longer. But as the sisters stared at him with entreating blue eyes, he sighed. I'll talk to him, he muttered. He's most likely awake now, Amelia said hopefully. Mary Penn always rises early. Cam gave her a glum nod hardly relishing the prospect of talking to his surly brother about womanish matters. He's going to beat me like a dusty parlour rug, Cam said, and I won't blame him a bit. After dressing and washing, Cam went downstairs to the morning room, where Mary Penn invariably took breakfast. Passing the sideboard, Cam saw, toad in the hole, a casserole of sausages covered in batter and roasted, platters of bacon and eggs, sole fillets, fried bread, and a bowl of baked beans. A chair had been pushed back from one of the round tables. There was an empty cup and saucer, and a small steaming silver pot next to it. The scent of strong black coffee lingered in the air. Cam glanced at the glass doors that led to a back terrace, and saw Mary Penn's lean, dark form. Mary Penn appeared to be staring at the fruit orchard, beyond the structured formal garden. The set of his shoulders and head conveyed irritable tension. Hell! Cam had no idea what he was going to say to his brother. Any advice he tried to give would probably be tossed summarily back into his face. Picking up a slice of fried bread, Cam ladled a spoonful of orange marmalade on it and wandered out to the terrace. Mary Penn gave Cam a cursory glance, and returned his attention to the landscape, the flourishing fields beyond the manor grounds, the heavy forests nourished by the thick artery of the river. A few gentle streams of smoke arose from the distant river bank, one of the places where gypsies were wont to camp as they travelled through Hampshire. Cam had personally carved identifying marks on the trees to indicate that this was a friendly place for Roma, and every time a new tribe came, Cam went to visit them on the off chance that someone from his long-ago family might be there. "'Another Campania passing through,' he remarked casually, joining Mary Penn at the balcony. 
Why don't you come with me to visit them this morning? Mary Penn's tone was distant and unfriendly. The workmen are casting new plasterwork mouldings for the east wing, and after the way they fouled it up last time, I have to be there. Last time, the screeds they nailed up weren't properly aligned, Cam said. I know that, Mary Penn snapped. Fine. Feeling sleepy and annoyed, Cam rubbed his face. Look, I have no desire to stick my nose in your affairs, but then don't. It's not going to hurt you to hear an outside perspective. I don't give a damn about your perspective. If you weren't so self-absorbed, Cam said acidly, it might occur to you that you're not the only one who has something to worry about. Do you think I haven't given a thought to what might happen to Amelia now that she's conceived? Nothing will happen to Amelia, Mary Penn said dismissively. Cam scowled. Everyone in this family chooses to think of Amelia as indestructible. Amelia herself thinks it, but she's subject to all the usual problems and frailties of any other woman in her condition. The truth is, it's always a risk. Mary Penn's dark eyes simmered with hostility. More so for Wynne. Probably. But if she wants to assume that risk, it's her decision. That's where we differ, Rowan. Because I, because you don't take risks on anyone, do you? It's too bad you've fallen in love with a woman who won't be kept on a shelf, Frau. If you call me that again, Mary Penn growled, I'll take your bloody head off. Go ahead and try. Mary Penn would probably have launched at Cam then, if not for the glass doors opening and another figure stepping out on the terrace. Glancing in the direction of the intruder, Cam groaned inwardly. It was Harrow, looking controlled and capable. He approached Cam and ignored Mary Penn. Good morning, Rowan. I've just come to tell you that I'll be leaving Hampshire later in the day. If I can't persuade Winifred to come to her senses, that is. Of course, Cam said, schooling his expression into pleasant blankness. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. I only want what's best for her, the doctor murmured, still not looking at Mary Penn. I'll continue to believe that going to France with me is the wisest choice for all concerned. But it's her decision. He paused, his grey eyes sombre. I hope you'll do your best to make everyone understand what's at stake. He left the terrace, closing the glass door behind him. I hate that bastard, Mary Penn said beneath his breath. He's not my favourite either, Cam admitted. Wearily, he gripped the back of his own neck, trying to ease the stiffness of the pinching muscles. I'm going down to the Romany campsite, and if you don't mind, I'll take a cup of that bitter brew you drink. I despise the stuff, but I need something to help me stay awake. Have whatever's left in the pot, Mary Penn muttered. Cam nodded and went to the French doors but he paused at the threshold and smoothed the hair at the back of his neck and spoke quietly. The worst part about loving someone, Mary Penn, is that there will always be things you can't protect her from, things beyond your control. You finally realise there's something worse than dying, and that's having something happen to her. You have to live with that fear always, but you have to take the bad part if you want the good part. Kev looked at him bleakly. What's the good part? A smile touched Cam's lips. All the rest of it is the good part, he said, and went inside. I've been warned on pain of death not to say anything, was Leo's first comment as he joined Mary Penn in one of the East Wing rooms. There were two plasterers in the corner, measuring and marking on the walls, and another was repairing scaffolding that would support a man close to the ceiling. Good advice, Kev said. You should take it. I never take advice, good or bad. That would only encourage more of it. Despite Kev's brooding thoughts, he felt an unwilling smile tug at his lips. He gestured to a nearby bucket, filled with light grey ooze. Why don't you pick up a stick and stir the lumps out of that? What is it? A lime plaster and hairy clay mix. Hairy clay, lovely. 
but Leo obediently picked up a discarded stick and began to poke around in the bucket of plaster. The women are gone for the morning, he remarked. They went to Stony Cross Manor to visit Lady Westcliff. Beatrix warned me to be on the lookout for her ferret, which seems to be missing. And Miss Marks stayed here. A reflective pause. An odd little creature, wouldn't you say? The ferret or Miss Marks? Kev carefully positioned a strip of wood on the wall and nailed it in place. Marks, I've been wondering, is she a misandrist, or does she hate everyone in general? What is a misandrist? A man-hater. She doesn't hate men. She's always been pleasant to me and Rowan. Leo looked genuinely puzzled. Then she merely hates me. It would seem so. But she has no reason. You're arrogant and dismissive, Kev pointed out. That's part of my aristocratic charm, Leo protested. It would appear that's lost on Miss Marks. Kev arched a brow as he saw Leo's scowl. Why should it matter? You have no personal interest in her, do you? Of course not, Leo said indignantly. I'd sooner climb into bed with Bee's pet hedgehog. Imagine those pointy little elbows and knees— all those sharp angles. A man could do fatal harm to himself, tangling with marks. He stirred the plaster with new vigour, evidently preoccupied with the myriad dangers in bedding the governess. A bit too preoccupied, Kev thought. It was a shame, Cam mused, as he walked through a green meadow with his hands tucked in his pockets, that being part of a close-knit family meant one could never enjoy his own good fortune when someone else was having problems. There was so much for Cam to take pleasure in at the moment. Spring sunshine, new plants pushing up from the damp earth, and the tang of smoke from a Romany campfire ahead. Perhaps today he might finally find someone from his old tribe. On a day like this, anything seemed possible. He had a beautiful wife who was carrying his child. He loved Amelia more than life, and despite all he had to lose, Cam wouldn't let fear cripple him or prevent him from loving her with all his soul. Fear. His pace slowed as he became aware of a sudden escalation of his heartbeat, as if he'd been running for miles without stopping. Glancing across the field, he saw that the grass was unnaturally green. He started blinking, trying to clear his vision, while the thump of his heart became painful, as if someone were kicking him repeatedly. Bewildered, Cam tensed and put a shaking hand to his chest. The sun was too bright, making his eyes water. He blotted the moisture with his sleeve, and was abruptly surprised to find himself on the ground, on his knees. He waited for the pain to subside, for his heart to slow as it surely must— but it only worsened. He tried to stand, but his body would not obey. Nothing was under his control. It was hard to breathe. A slow, boneless collapse, grass stabbing harshly into his cheek. More pain, more, his heart threatening to explode from the extraordinary force of its beats. Cam realized with a sense of wonder that he was dying. He couldn't think why it was happening, or how, only that no one would take care of Amelia, and she needed him. He couldn't leave her. Someone had to watch over her. She needed someone to rub her feet when she was tired. So tired. He couldn't lift his head or arm, or move his legs. Muscles in his body were jumping independently, tremors jerking him like a puppet on strings. Amelia, I don't want to leave you. God, don't let me die. It's too soon but the pain kept pouring over him, smothering every breath. Amelia. He wanted to say her name, and he couldn't. It was an unfathomable cruelty that he couldn't leave the world with those last precious syllables on his lips. After an hour of nailing up screeds and testing various mixtures of lime, gypsum, and hairy clay— Kev, Leo, and the workman had settled on the right proportions. Leo had taken an unexpected interest in the process, even devising an improvement on the three-coat plasterwork by improving the base layer or scratch coat, 
Put more hair in this layer, he had suggested, and rough it up with a derby tool, and that will give more of a clinch to the next coat. It was clear to Kev that although Leo had little interest in the financial aspects of running the estate, his love of architecture and construction was more keenly developed than ever. As Leo was climbing down from the scaffolding, the housekeeper, Mrs. Barnstable, came to the doorway with a boy in tow. Kev regarded him with sharp interest. The boy was a rom, about eleven or twelve years of age. Sir, the housekeeper said to Kev apologetically, I beg your pardon for interrupting your work, but this lad came to the doorstep speaking gibberish, and he refuses to be chased away. We thought you might be able to understand him. The gibberish turned out to be perfectly articulate Romany. It's good to meet you, the boy said politely. Kev acknowledged the greeting with a nod. Are you from the Vitsa by the river? Yes, Kako. I was sent to tell you we found a rom lying in the field. He's dressed like a gajo. We thought he might belong to someone here. Lying in the field, Kev repeated, instantly worried. He knew at once something very bad had happened. With an effort, he kept his tone patient. Was he resting? The boy shook his head. He is ill and out of his head, and he shakes like this. He mimicked a tremor with his hands. Did he tell you his name? Kev asked. Did he say anything? Although they were still speaking in Romany, Leo and Mrs. Barnstable stared at Kev intently, gathering that some emergency was taking place. What is it? Leo asked, frowning. The boy answered Kev. No, Kako. He can't say much of anything. And his heart. The boy hit his own chest with a small fist in a few emphatic thumps. Take me to him. There was no doubt in Kev's mind that the situation was dire. Cam was never ill, and he was in superb physical condition. Whatever had befallen him, it was something abnormal. Switching to English, Kev spoke to Leo and the housekeeper. Rowan has been taken ill. He's at the Romany campsite. My lord, I suggest you dispense a footman and driver to Stony Cross Manor to collect Amelia at once. Mrs. Barnstable, send for the doctor. I'll bring Rowan here as soon as I can. Sir, the housekeeper asked in bewilderment, are you referring to Dr. Harrow? No, Kev said instantly. All his instincts warned him to keep Harrow out of this. In fact, don't let him know what's going on. For the time being, keep this as quiet as possible. Yes, sir. Although the housekeeper didn't understand Kev's reasons, she was too well trained to question his authority. Mr. Rowan seemed perfectly well earlier this morning, she said. What could have happened to him? We'll find out. Without waiting for further questions or reactions, Kev gripped the boy's shoulder and steered him toward the doorway. Let's go. The camp was occupied by a small and prosperous-looking family tribe. They had set up a well-organized camp with two vardos and some horses and donkeys. The leader of the tribe, whom the boy identified as the Romfuro, was an attractive man with long black hair and warm dark eyes. Although he wasn't tall, he was fit and lean, with an air of steady authority. Kev was surprised by the leader's relative youth. The word furo usually referred to a man of advanced age and wisdom. For a man who appeared to be in his late thirties, it signified that he was an unusually respected leader. They exchanged cursory greetings, and the rom furo led Kev to his own vardo. Is he your friend? the leader asked with obvious concern. My brother. For some reason, Kev's comment earned an arrested glance. It's good that you're here. It may be your last chance to see him this side of the veil. Kev was astonished by his own reaction to the comment, the rush of outrage and grief. He's not going to die, Kev said harshly, quickening his stride and fairly leaping into the vardo. The interior of the gypsy caravan was approximately twelve feet long and six feet broad, with the typical stove and metal chimney pipe located to the side of the door. A pair of transverse berths was located at the other end of the vardo, one upper and one lower. 
Cam's long body was stretched out on the lower berth, his booted feet dangling over the end. He was twitching and shivering, his head rolling ceaselessly on the pillow. Holy hell, Kev said thickly, unable to believe such a change had been wrought in such a short amount of time. The healthy colour had been leached out of Cam's face until it was as white as paper, and his lips were cracked and grey. He moaned in pain, panting like a dog. Kev sat on the edge of the berth and put his hand on his brother's icy forehead. Cam, he said urgently, it's Mary Penn. Open your eyes. Tell me what happened. Cam struggled to control the tremors, to focus his gaze, but it was impossible. He tried to form a word, but all he could produce was an incoherent sound. Flattening a hand on Cam's chest, Kev felt a ferocious and irregular heartbeat. He swore, recognising that no one's heart, no matter how strong, could go on at that pace for long. He may have eaten some kind of herb without knowing it was harmful, the Romfuro commented, looking troubled. Kev shook his head. My brother's very familiar with medicinal plants. He would never make that kind of mistake. Staring down at Cam's drawn face, Kev felt a mixture of fury and compassion. He wished his own heart could take over the work for his brother's. Someone poisoned him. Tell me what I can do, the tribe leader said quietly. First, we need to get rid of as much of the poison as possible. His stomach emptied before we brought him into the Vardo. That was good, but for the reaction to be this bad, even after expelling the poison, meant it was a highly toxic substance. The heart beneath Kev's hand seemed ready to burst from Cam's chest. He would go into convulsion soon. Something must be done to slow his pulse and ease the tremors, Kev said curtly. Do you have laudanum? No, but we have raw opium. Even better. Bring it quickly. The Romfuro gave orders to a pair of women who had come to the entrance of the Vardo. In less than a minute, they produced a tiny jar of thick brown paste. It was the dried fluid of an unripened poppy pod. Scraping up some of the paste with the tip of a spoon, Kev tried to feed it to Cam. Cam's teeth clattered violently against the metal, his head jerking until the spoon was dislodged. Doggedly, Kev slid his arm beneath Cam's neck and lifted him upward. Cam, it's me. I've come to help you. Take this for me. Take it now. He shoved the spoon back into Cam's mouth and held it there while he choked and shook in Kev's grip. That's it, Kev murmured, withdrawing the spoon after a moment. He laid a warm hand on his brother's throat, rubbing gently. Swallow. Yes, for all that's it. The opium worked with miraculous speed. Soon the tremors began to subside, and Cam's frantic gasping eased. Kev wasn't aware of holding his breath until he let it out in a relieved sigh. He put his palm over Cam's heart, feeling the jerking rhythm slow. Give him some water, the tribe leader suggested, handing a carved wooden cup to Kev. He pressed the edge of the cup against Cam's lips and coaxed him to take a sip. The heavy lashes lifted, and Cam focused on him with effort. Kev, I'm here, little brother. Cam stared and blinked. He reached up and clutched the placket of Kev's open-necked shirt like a drowning man. Blue, he whispered raggedly. Everything. Blue. Kev slid his arm around Cam's back and gripped him firmly. He glanced at the Romfuro and tried desperately to think. He'd heard of such a symptom before. A blue haze over the vision. It was caused by taking too much of a potent heart medicine. It could be digitalis, he murmured. But I don't know what that comes from. Foxglove, the Romfuro said. His tone was matter-of-fact, but his face was taut with anxiety. Very lethal. Kills livestock. What's the antidote? Kev asked sharply. The leader's reply was soft. I don't know. I don't even know if there is one. Chapter 21
After dispatching a footman for the village doctor, Leo decided to go to the gypsy camp and see how Cam was faring. Leo couldn't stand the inactivity or suspense of waiting, and he was troubled as hell by the thought of anything happening to Cam, who'd become the linchpin of the entire family. Leo rapidly made his way down the grand staircase to the entrance hall. He was approached by Miss Marks, who had a housemaid in tow. The girl was pale and red-eyed. My lord, Miss Marks said tersely, I bid you to come with us to the parlour immediately. There is something you should— In your supposed knowledge of etiquette, Marks, you should know that no one bids the master of the house to do anything. The governess's stern mouth twisted impatiently. Devil, take etiquette. This is important. Very well. It seems you must be humoured. But tell me here and now. The parlour, she insisted. After a brief glance heavenward, Leo followed the governess and housemaid through the entrance hall. I warn you, if this is about some trivial household matter, I'll have your head. There's an urgent matter I'm dealing with right now, and— Yes, Marx cut him off as they walked swiftly to the parlour. I know about that. You do? Hang it all. Mrs. Barnstable wasn't supposed to tell anyone. Secrets don't last long below stairs, my lord. As they went into the parlour, Leo stared at the governess's straight spine and experienced the same sting of irritation he always felt in her presence. She was like one of those unreachable itches on one's back. It had something to do with the coil of light brown hair pinned so tightly at her nape, and the narrow torso and tiny corseted waist, and the dry, pristine paleness of her skin. He couldn't help thinking about what it would be like to unlace, unpin, and unloosen her, remove her spectacles, do things that would make her all pink and steamy and profoundly bothered. Yes, that was it. He wanted to bother her. Repeatedly. Good God, what was wrong with him? Once they were in the parlour, Miss Marks closed the door and patted the housemaid's arm with a slender, white hand. This is Sylvia she told Leo. She was distressed by something she saw this morning and was afraid to tell anyone, but after learning of Mr. Rowan's illness, she came to me with the information. Why wait until now? Leo asked impatiently. Anything untoward should be reported at once. Miss Marks answered with annoying calmness. There are no protections for a servant who inadvertently sees something she shouldn't. Being a sensible girl— Sylvia doesn't want to be made a scapegoat. Do we have your assurance that Sylvia will suffer no ill consequences from what she's about to say? You have my word, Leo said, no matter what it is. Tell me, Sylvia. The housemaid nodded and leaned against Miss Marks for support. Sylvia was so much heavier than the frail governess, it was a wonder they didn't both topple over. My lord, the maid faltered, I polished the fish forks this morning and brought them to the breakfast sideboard for the soul fillets. But as I came into the morning room, I saw Mr. Mary Penn and Mr. Rowan out on the terrace talking, and Dr. Harrow was in the room watching them. And, Leo prompted as the girl's lips trembled, I thought I saw Dr. Harrow put something into Mr. Mary Penn's coffee pot. He reached for something in his pocket— it looked like one of those queer little glass tubes at the apothecary's, but it was so fast I couldn't be sure what he'd done, and then he turned around and looked at me as I came into the room. I pretended not to see anything, my lord. I didn't want to make no trouble. We think Mr. Rowan drank the adulterated beverage, the governess said. Leo shook his head. Mr. Rowan doesn't take coffee. Isn't it possible that he might have made an exception this morning? The edge of sarcasm in her voice was unbearably annoying. It's possible, but it wouldn't be in character. <sighs> Leo let out a harsh sigh. Damn it all. I'll try to find out what, if anything, Harrow did. Thank you, Sylvia. Yes, my lord. The housemaid looked relieved. As Leo strode from the room... He was exasperated to discover that Miss Marks was at his heels. Do not come with me, Marks. You need me, 
Go somewhere and knit something. Conjugate a verb. Whatever it is, governesses do. I would, she said acerbically, had I any confidence in your ability to handle the situation. But from what I've seen of your skills, I doubt you'll accomplish anything without my help. Leah wondered if other governesses dared to talk to the master this way. He didn't think so. I have skills you'll never be fortunate enough to see or experience, Marks. She made a scornful humph and continued to follow him. Reaching Harrow's room, Leo gave a perfunctory knock and went inside. The wardrobe was empty, and there was an open trunk by the bed. Do excuse the intrusion, Harrow, Leo said, with only the shallowest pretense of politeness. But a situation has arisen. Oh? The doctor looked remarkably incurious. Someone has been taken ill. That is unfortunate. I wish I could be of assistance. But if I am to reach London before midnight, I must leave shortly. You'll have to find another doctor. Surely you have an ethical obligation to help someone who needs it, Miss Mark said incredulously. What about the oath of Hippocrates? The oath isn't obligatory, and in light of recent events, I have every right to decline. You will have to find another doctor to treat him. Him. Leo didn't have to look at Miss Marks to know that she, too, had caught the slip. He decided to keep Harrow talking. Mary Penn won my sister fairly, old fellow, and what brought them together was set in motion long before you entered the scene. It's not sporting to blame them. I don't blame them, Harrow said curtly. I blame you. Me? Leo was indignant. What for? I had nothing to do with this. You have so little regard for your sisters that you would allow not one but two gypsies to be brought into your family. Out of the corner of his eye, Leo saw Dodger the ferret creeping across the carpeted floor. The inquisitive creature reached a chair over which a dark coat had been draped. Standing on his hind legs, he rummaged in the coat pockets. Miss Marks was speaking crisply. Mr. Mary Penn and Mr. Rowan are men of excellent character, Dr. Harrow. One may fault Lord Ramsay for many other things, but not for that. They're gypsies, Harrow said scornfully. Leo began to speak, but he was cut off as Miss Marks continued her lecture. A man must be judged by what he makes of himself, Dr. Harrow. Having lived in proximity to Mr. Mary Penn and Mr. Rowan, I can state with certainty that they are both fine, honourable men. Dodger extracted an object from the coat pocket and wriggled in triumph. He began to lope slowly around the edge of the room, watching Harrow warily. Forgive me if I don't accept assurances of character from a woman such as you, Harrow said to Miss Marks. But according to rumour, You've been in rather too much proximity with certain gentlemen in your past. The governess turned white with outrage. How dare you! I find that remark entirely inappropriate, Leo said to Harrow. It's obvious no sane man would ever attempt something scandalous with marks. Seeing the dodger had made it to the doorway, Leo reached for the governess's rigid arm. Come, marks, let's leave the doctor to his packing. At the same moment, Harrow caught sight of the ferret, who was carrying a slim glass vial in his mouth. Harrow's eyes bulged, and he went pale. Give that to me, he cried, and launched toward the ferret. That's mine! Leo leaped on the doctor and brought him to the floor. Harrow surprised him with a sharp right hook, but Leo's jaw had been hardened from many a tavern fight. He traded blow for blow, rolling across the floor with the doctor as they struggled for supremacy. What the devil? Leo grunted. Did you put into that coffee? Nothing! The doctor's strong hands clamped on his throat. Don't know what you're talking about! Leo bashed him in the side with a closed fist until the doctor's grip weakened. The hell you don't! Leo gasped and kneed him in the groin. Harrow collapsed to his side, groaning. Gentlemen! Wouldn't do that. Gentlemen, don't poison people either. Leo seized him. Tell me what it was, damn you. Despite his pain, 
Harrow's lips curved in an evil grin. Mary Penn will get no help from me. Mary Penn didn't drink the filthy stuff, you sodding idiot. Rowan did. Now tell me what you put in that coffee or I'll rip your throat out. The doctor looked stunned. He clamped his mouth shut and refused to speak. Leo struck him with a right and then a left, but the bastard remained silent. Miss Marx's voice broke through the boiling fury. My lord, stop it! This instant! I need your assistance in retrieving the vial. Hauling Harrow upward, Leo dragged him to the empty wardrobe and closed him inside. Leo locked the door and turned to face Miss Marx, his face sweating and his chest heaving. Their gazes locked for a split second. Her eyes turned as round as her spectacle lenses, but the peculiar awareness between them was immediately punctured by Dodger's triumphant chatter. The blasted ferret waited at the threshold, doing a happy war dance that consisted of a series of sideways hops. Clearly he was delighted by his new acquisition, and even more by the fact that Miss Marks seemed to want it. Let me out! Harrow cried in a smothered voice, and there was a violent pounding from inside the wardrobe. That blasted weasel! Miss Marks muttered. It's a game to him. He'll spend hours teasing us with that vial and keeping it just out of reach. Staring at the ferret, Leo sat on the carpet and relaxed his voice. Come here, you flea-ridden hairwad. You'll have all the sugar biscuits you want, if you'll give your new toy to me. He whistled softly and clicked. But the blandishments did not work. Dodger merely regarded him with bright eyes and stayed at the threshold, clutching the vial in his tiny paws. Give him one of your garters, Leo said, still staring at the ferret. I beg your pardon, Miss Marks asked frostily. You heard me. Take off a garter and offer it to him as a trade. Otherwise we'll be chasing this damned animal all through the house, and I doubt Cam will appreciate the delay. The governess gave Leo a long-suffering glance. Only for Mr. Rowan's sake would I consent to this. Turn your back. For God's sake, Marx, do you think anyone really wants a glance at those dried-up matchsticks you call legs? But Leo complied, facing the opposite direction. He heard a great deal of rustling as Miss Marx sat on a bedroom chair and lifted her skirts. It just so happened that Leo was positioned near a full-length looking-glass, the oval cheval style that tilted up or down to adjust one's reflection, and he had an excellent view of Miss Marks in the chair. And the oddest thing happened. He got a flash of an astonishingly pretty leg. He blinked in bemusement, and then the skirts were dropped. Here, Miss Marks said gruffly, and tossed it in Leo's direction. Turning, he managed to catch it in mid-air. Dodger surveyed them both with beady-eyed interest. Leo twirled the garter enticingly on his finger. Have a look, Dodger. Blue silk with lace trim. Do all governesses anchor their stockings in such a delightful fashion? Perhaps those rumours about your unseemly past are true, Marx. I'll thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head, my lord. Dodger's little head bobbed as it followed every movement of the garter. Fitting the vial in his mouth, the ferret carried it like a miniature dog, loping up to Leo with maddening slowness. This is a trade, old fellow, Leo told him. You can't have something for nothing. Carefully, Dodger set down the vial and reached for the garter. Leo simultaneously gave him the frilly circlet and snatched the vial. It was half filled with a fine, dull green powder. He stared down at it intently, rolling it in his fingers. Miss Marks was at his side in an instant, crouching on her hands and knees. Is it labelled? she asked breathlessly. No, damn it all! Leah was gripped with volcanic fury. Let me have it, Miss Marks said, prying the vial from him. Leo jumped to his feet immediately, hurling himself at the wardrobe. He slammed it with both his fists. Damn you, Harrow! What is it? What is this stuff? Tell me, 
or you'll stay in there until you rot. There was nothing but silence from the wardrobe. By God, I'm going to... Leo began. It's digitalin powder, Miss Marks interrupted. Leo threw her a distracted glance. She had opened the vial and was sniffing it cautiously. How do you know? My grandmother used to take it for her heart. The scent is like tea, and the colour is unmistakable. What's the antidote? I have no idea, Miss Mark said, looking more distressed by the moment. But it's a powerful substance. A large dose could easily stop a man's heart. Leo turned back to the wardrobe. Harrow, he bit out, if you want to live, you'll tell me the antidote now. Let me out first, came the muffled reply. No negotiating. Tell me what counteracts the poison, damn you. Never. Leo, a new voice entered the fray. He turned swiftly to see Amelia, Wynne, and Beatrix at the threshold. They were staring at him as if he'd gone mad. Amelia spoke with admirable composure. I have two questions, Leo. Why did you send for me? And why are you having an argument with the wardrobe? Harrow's in there, he told her. Her expression changed. Why? I'm trying to make him tell me how to counteract an overdose of digitalin powder. He glared vengefully at the wardrobe. And I'll kill him if he doesn't. Who's taken an overdose? Amelia demanded her face draining of colour. Is someone ill? Who is it? It was meant for Mary Pen, Leo said in a low voice, reaching out to steady her before he continued. But Cam took it by mistake. A strangled cry escaped her. Oh, God! Where is he? The Romany campsite. Mary Pen's with him. Tears sprang to Amelia's eyes. I must go to him. You won't do him any good without the antidote. Wynne brushed by them, striding to the bedside table. Moving with swift deliberation, she picked up an oil lamp and a tin matchbox and brought them to the wardrobe. What are you doing? Leo demanded, wondering if she had lost her wits entirely. He doesn't need a lamp, Wynne. Ignoring him, Wynne removed the glass fount and tossed it to the bed. She did the same with the brass wick burner, exposing the oil reservoir. Without hesitation, she poured the lamp oil over the front of the wardrobe. The pungent odour of highly flammable paraffin spread through the room. Have you lost your mind? Leo demanded, astonished not only by her actions, but also by her calm demeanour. I have a matchbox, Julian, she said. Tell me what to give to Cam, or I'll set the wardrobe on fire. You wouldn't dare! Harrow cried. Wynne, Leo said, you'll burn the entire damned house down just after it's been rebuilt. Give me the bloody matchbox. She shook her head resolutely. Are we starting a new springtime ritual? Leo demanded. The annual burning of the manse. Come to your senses, Wynne. Wynne turned from him and glared at the wardrobe door. I was told, Julian, that you killed your first wife possibly by poison. And now knowing what you have done to my brother-in-law, I believe it. If you don't help us, I'm going to roast you like Welsh rabbit. She opened the matchbox. Realising she couldn't possibly be serious, Leo decided to back her bluff. I'm begging you, Wynne, he said theatrically. Don't do this. There's no need to... Christ! This last as Wynne struck a match and set the wardrobe on fire. It wasn't a bluff, Leo thought dazedly. She actually intended to broil the bastard. At the first bright curling blossom of flame, there was a terrified cry from inside the wardrobe. All right, let me out! Let me out! It's tannic acid! Tannic acid! It's in my medical case! Let me out! Very well, Leo. Wynne said, a bit breathless, you may extinguish the fire. In spite of the panic that raced through his veins, Leo couldn't suppress a choked laugh. She spoke as if she'd asked him to snuff a candle, not put out a large flaming piece of furniture. Tearing off his coat, he rushed forward and beat wildly at the wardrobe door. 
You're a mad woman, he told Wynne as he passed her. He wouldn't have told us otherwise, Wynne said. Alerted by all the commotion, a few servants appeared, one of them a footman who removed his own coat and hastened to assist Leo. Meanwhile, the women were rummaging for Harrow's black leather medical case. Isn't tannic acid the same as tea? Amelia asked, her hands shaking as she fumbled with the latch. No, Mrs. Rowan, the governess said. I believe the doctor was referring to tannic acid from oak leaves, not the tannins from tea. She reached out quickly as Amelia nearly overturned the case. Careful, don't knock it over. He doesn't label his vials. Opening the hard-sided case, they found rows of neatly arranged glass tubes containing powders and liquids. Although the vials themselves were not marked, the slots they fit in had been identified with inked letters. Pouring over the vials, Miss Marks extracted one filled with pale yellow-brown powder. This one. Wynne took it from her. Let me take it to them, she said. I know where the campsite is, and Leo's busy putting out the wardrobe. I'll take the vial to Cam, Amelia said vehemently. He's my husband. Yes, and you're carrying his child. If you fell while riding at a breakneck pace, he would never forgive you for risking the baby. Amelia gave her an anguished glance, her mouth trembling. She nodded and croaked. Hurry, Wynne. Can you fashion a sling with canvas and poles? Mary Penn asked the Rom Furo. I must get him back to Ramsey House. The tribe leader nodded at once. He called out to a small group, waiting near the entrance of the Vardo, gave a few instructions, and they disappeared instantly. Turning back to Kev, he murmured, We'll have something put together in a few minutes. Kev nodded, staring down at Cam's ashen face. He wasn't well by any means, but at least the threat of convulsions and heart failure had been temporarily staved off. Robbed of his usual expressiveness, Cam looked young and defenceless. It was peculiar to think that they were brothers, and yet had spent their lives never knowing about each other. Kev had occupied his self-imposed solitude for so long, but lately it seemed to be wearing away, like a threadbare suit of clothes that was falling apart at the seams. He wanted to know more about Cam, to exchange memories with him. He wanted a brother. I always knew I wasn't supposed to be alone, Cam had told him on the day they discovered their blood ties. Kev had felt the same. He just hadn't been able to say it. Taking up a cloth, he blotted the film of sweat from Cam's face. A quiet whimper escaped Cam's lips, as if he were a child having a nightmare. It's all right, Fral, Kev murmured, putting a hand on Cam's chest, testing the slow and lurching heartbeat. You'll be well soon. I won't leave you. You're close to your brother, the Romfuro said softly. That's good. Do you have other family? We live with Gaja, Kev said, his gaze daring the man to disapprove. One of them is his wife. He glanced down at Cam again, thinking he was starting to look worse. If they need help making the sling to carry him. No, my men are fast. They'll finish soon but it must be made well and strong to carry a man of his size. Cam's hands were twitching, his long fingers plucking fitfully at the blanket they had put over him. Kev took the cold hand and gripped it firmly, trying to warm and reassure him. The Romfuro stared at the visible tattoo on Cam's forearm, the striking lines of the winged black horse. When did you meet Rowan? he asked quietly. Kev gave him a startled glance, his protective grasp tightening on Cam's hand. How do you know his name? The tribe leader smiled, his eyes warm. I know other things as well. You and your brother were separated for a long time. He touched the tattoo with his forefinger. And this mark, you have one too. Kev stared at him without blinking. The sounds of a minor to-do filtered in from outside, and someone came pushing through the doorway. A woman. With surprise and concern, Kev saw the gleam of white blonde hair. Win! he exclaimed, carefully setting Cam's hand down and coming to his feet. 
Unfortunately, he couldn't stand fully upright in the low-ceilinged vehicle. Tell me you didn't come here alone. It's not safe. Why are you— I'm trying to help. The skirts of Wynne's riding habit rustled stiffly as she hurried into the Vardo with something clutched in her hand. Here, here. She was breathing hard from riding to the camp at a breakneck pace, her cheeks flushed. What is it? Kev murmured, gently taking the object from her, his free hand coming to rub her back. He looked down at a small vial filled with powder. The antidote, she said. Give it to him quickly. How do you know it's the right medicine? I made Dr. Harrow tell me. He might have been lying. No, I'm sure he wasn't, because at that moment he was nearly on f I mean, he was under duress. Kev's fingers closed around the vial. There wasn't much choice. They could wait until they consulted a trustworthy doctor, but from the look of it, Cam didn't have much time to spare, and doing nothing was not an option either. Kev proceeded to dissolve ten grains in a small quantity of water. Reasoning it was better to start with a weak solution rather than overdose Cam with yet another poison. He eased Cam to a sitting position, supporting him against his chest. Delirious and unsteady, Cam made a protesting noise as the movement sent new pain through his cramping muscles. Although Kev couldn't see Cam's face, he saw Wynne's compassionate expression as she reached out to grip Cam's jaw. She rubbed the frozen muscles and pried his mouth open. After tilting the liquid from a spoon into his mouth, she massaged his cheeks and throat, coaxing him to swallow. Cam downed the medicine and shuddered and rested heavily against Kev. Thank you, Wynne whispered, stroking back Cam's damp hair, flattening her palm against the side of his cold face. You'll be better now. Lie easy and let it take effect. Kev thought she had never looked as lovely as she did at that moment, her face soft with tender gravity. After a few minutes, Wynne said quietly, his colour is improving. And so was his breathing, the jagged rhythm lengthening and slowing. Kev felt Cam's body relax, the clenched muscles softening as the active principles of the digitalis were neutralised. Cam stirred, as if he were waking from a long sleep. Amelia, he said in an opium-slurred voice. Wynne took one of his hands in hers. She's quite well. And waiting for you at home, dear. Home, he repeated with an exhausted nod. Kev lowered Cam carefully to the berth and looked over him in sharp assessment. The mask-like pallor was vanishing second by second, healthy colour returning to his face. The rapidity of the transformation was no less than astonishing. The amber eyes cracked open, and Cam focused on Kev. Mary Penn. Cam said, in a tone so lucid that Kev was overcome with relief. Yes, Fra. Am I dead? No. I must be. Why? Kev asked, amused. Because, Cam paused to moisten his dry lips, I just saw my cousin Noah over there. Chapter 22 the Romfuro came forward and knelt beside the berth. Hello, Camlo, he murmured. Cam regarded him with puzzled wonder. Noah, you're older. His cousin chuckled. Indeed, the last time I saw you, you barely came up to my chest. Now you look nearly a head taller than me. You never came back for me. Kev broke in tautly. And you never told him he had a brother. Noah's smile turned regretful as he regarded them both. I couldn't do either of those things, for your own protection. His gaze swerved in Kev's direction. We were told you were dead, Kev. I'm glad to find out we were wrong. How did you survive? Where have you been living? Kev scowled at him. Never mind about that. Rowan has spent years looking for you, looking for answers. You tell him the truth now, about why he was sent away from the tribe, and what that cursed tattoo means, 
and don't leave anything out. Noah looked mildly taken aback by Kev's autocratic manner. As the leader of the Vitsa, Noah wasn't used to taking orders from anyone. He's always like this, Cam told Noah. You'll get used to it. Reaching beneath the berth, Noah pulled out a wooden box and began to rummage through its contents. What do you know about our Irish blood? Kev demanded. What was our father's name? There's much I don't know, Noah admitted. Finding what he had evidently been looking for, he pulled it from the box and looked at Cam. But our grandmother told me what she could on her deathbed, and she gave me this. He raised a tarnished silver knife. In a lightning-swift reflex, Kev seized his cousin's wrist in a crushing grip. Wynne gave a startled cry, while Cam tried unsuccessfully to lift up on his elbows. Noah stared hard into Kev's eyes. Peace, cousin. I would never harm Camlo. He let his hand open. Take it from me. It belongs to you. It was your father's. His name was Brian Cole. Kev took the knife and slowly released Noah's wrist. He stared at the object, a boot knife with a double-edged fixed blade approximately four inches long. The handle was silver, with engraving on the bolsters. It looked old and costly, but what amazed Kev was the engraving on the flat of the handle, a perfect, stylized symbol of the Irish puka. He showed it to Cam, who stopped breathing for a moment. You are Cameron and Kevin Cole, Noah said. That horse symbol was the mark of your family. It was in their crest. When we separated the two of you, it was decided to put the mark on both of you, not only to identify you, but also to preserve and protect you. It's a powerful symbol. Cam stared at the knife and shook his head. Kev spoke for him. My brother hired heraldic experts and researchers to go through books of Irish family crests, and they never found this symbol. The Coles removed the puka from the crest about three hundred years ago, when the English king declared himself the head of the Church of Ireland. The puka was a pagan symbol. They thought it would threaten their standing in the Reformed Church, but the Coles were still fond of it. I remember your father wore a big silver ring engraved with the puka. Glancing at his brother, Kev sensed that Cam felt just as he did, that it was like having been in a closed room all his life and suddenly having a door opened. Your father, Brian, Noah continued, was the son of Lord Cavan, an Irish representative peer in the British House of Lords. Brian was his only heir, but your father made a mistake. He fell in love with a Romany girl named Sonia, quite beautiful. He married her in defiance of his family and hers. They lived away from everyone long enough for Sonia to have two sons. She died in her childbed when Cam was born. I always thought my mother died having me, Kev said softly. I never knew about a younger brother. It was after the second son that she went to God. Noah looked pensive. I was old enough to remember the day Cole brought you both to our grandmother. He told Mammy it had been a misery trying to live in both worlds, and he wanted to go back where he belonged. So he left his children with the tribe, and never returned. Why did you separate us? Cam asked, still looking exhausted, but far more like his usual self. Noah stood in an easy movement and went to the corner near the stove. As he replied, he made tea with deft assurance, measuring out dried leaves into a little pot of steaming water. After a few years, your father remarried, and then other witzes told us that some gajos had come looking for the boys, offering money for information and doing violence when Roma wouldn't tell them anything. We realized your father wanted to get rid of his half-breed sons, who were the legitimate heirs to the title. He had a new wife, who would bear him gaja children. And we were in the way of their inheritance, Kev said grimly. It would seem so. Noah strained the tea into a pot. He poured a cup, added sugar, and brought it to Cam. You need to wash the poison out. Cam sat up and leaned his back against the wall. He took the cup in a wobbling grip and sipped the hot brew carefully. So, 
To reduce the chances of both of us being found, he said, you kept me and gave Kev to our uncle. Yes, to Uncle Pov. Noah frowned and averted his gaze from Kev. Sonia was his favourite sister. We thought he would be a good protector. No one expected him to blame her children for her death. He hated Gacha, Kev said in a low voice. Noah looked contrite. After we heard you died, we thought it too dangerous to keep calm. So I brought him to London and helped him find work. In a gaming club, Cam said, a note of questioning scepticism in his voice. The best hiding places are in plain sight, came Noah's prosaic reply. Cam was shaking his head ruefully. I'll bet half of London has seen my tattoo. It's a wonder Lord Cavan never caught wind of it. Noah frowned. I told you to keep it covered. No, you didn't. I did, Noah insisted, and put his hand on his forehead. Ah, you were never good at listening. Wynne sat quietly beside Kev. She listened as the men talked, and wondered how Kev felt about having his Romany past finally uncovered. The mysteries explained. He seemed perfectly calm and controlled, but it must have been unsettling. With all the time that has passed, Cam was saying, I wonder if there's still danger to us. And is our father still alive? It would be easy enough to find out, Kev replied, and added darkly, He probably wouldn't be happy to find out that we were still alive. You're more or less safe as long as you remain Roma, Noah said. But if Kev reveals himself as the cavern heir and tries to claim the title, there could be trouble. Kev looked scornful. Why would I do that? Noah shrugged. You're half Gajo. I don't want the title or what comes with it, Kev said firmly, and I want nothing to do with a Coles, Lord Cavan, or anything Irish. And ignore half of yourself, Cam asked. I've spent most of life not knowing about my Irish half. It will be no problem to ignore it. A Romany boy came to the Vardo to let them know the sling had been finished. Good, Kev said decisively. I'll help him outside, and he— Oh, no, Cam said, scowling. There's no way I'm going to let myself be carried in a sling to Ramsey House. Kev gave him a sardonic glance. How are you planning to get there? I'll ride. Kev's brows lowered. You're in no condition to ride. You'll fall and break your neck. I can do it, Cam insisted stubbornly. It's not far. You'll fall off the horse. I'm not going in the bloody sling. It would frighten Amelia. You're not worried about Amelia. You're worried about your pride. You'll be carried and that's final. Bugger you, Cam snapped. Wynne and Noah exchanged a worried glance. The brothers seemed ready to come to blows. As the tribe leader, I may be able to help settle the dispute, Noah began diplomatically. Kev and Cam answered at the same time. No. Kev, Wynne murmured, could he ride with me? He could sit behind me and hold on to me for balance. All right, Cam said immediately. We'll do that. Kev scowled at them both. I'll go as well, Noah said with a slight smile. On my own horse. I'll tell my son to saddle him. He paused. Can you stay a few minutes more? You have many Romany cousins to meet, and I have a wife and children I want to show to you. And later, Kev said, I need to take my brother to his wife without delay. Very well. After Noah had gone outside, Cam stared absently into the dregs of his tea. What are you thinking? Kev asked. I'm wondering if our father had children by his second wife, and if so, how many? Are there half-brothers and half-sisters we don't know about? Kev's eyes narrowed. What does it matter? There are family. Kev rubbed his forehead with his hand. We have the Hathaways, and we have more than a dozen Roma running around outside, all apparently cousins. How much more damned family do you want? Cam only smiled.
Not surprisingly, Ramsay House was in an uproar. The Hathaways, Miss Marks, the servants, the parish constable, and a doctor were crowded in the entrance hall. Since the short ride had depleted Cam's strength, he was forced to lean on Kev as they went inside. They were immediately surrounded by the family, with Amelia pushing her way to Cam. She gave a sob of relief as she reached him, fighting tears as she ran frantic hands over his chest and face. Letting go of Kev, Cam wrapped his arms around Amelia, his head lowering nearly to her shoulder. They were quiet amid the tumult, breathing in measured sighs. One of her hands crept up to his hair, fingers closing in the dark layers. Cam murmured something against her ear, a soft and private reassurance, and he swayed, causing Amelia to grip him more tightly, while Kev took his shoulders to steady him. Cam lifted his head and looked down at his wife. I drank some coffee this morning, he told her. It didn't sit well. So I heard, Amelia said, smoothing her hand across his chest. She threw a worried glance at Kev. His gaze isn't focused. He's higher than a jackdaw, Kev said. We gave him raw opium to calm his heart before Wynne brought the antidote. Let's take him upstairs, Amelia said, using the edge of her sleeve to scrub her wet eyes. Raising her voice, she spoke to the elderly bearded man who stood outside the group. Dr. Martin, please accompany us upstairs, and you will be able to evaluate my husband's condition in private. I don't need a doctor, Cam protested. I wouldn't complain if I were you, Amelia told him. I'm tempted to send for at least a half dozen doctors, not to mention specialists from London. She paused long enough to glance at Noah. Are you the gentleman who helped Mr. Rowan? We are indebted to you, sir. Anything for my cousin, Noah replied. Cousin, Amelia repeated, her eyes widening. I'll explain upstairs, Cam said, lurching forward. Immediately, Noah took one side and Kev the other, and they half dragged, half carried Cam up the grand staircase. The family followed, exclaiming and talking excitedly. These are the noisiest gadget I've ever met, Noah remarked. This is nothing, Cam said, panting with effort as they ascended. They're usually much worse. Noah looked appalled. Cam's privacy was marginal at best as he was deposited on the bed and Dr. Martin began to examine him. Amelia made a few attempts to shoo family and relatives from the room, but they kept pushing back in to see what was happening. After Martin tested Cam's pulse, pupil size, lung sounds, skin moisture and colour, and reflexes, he pronounced that in his opinion the patient would make a full recovery. If there were troublesome symptoms during the night, such as heart palpitations, they could be soothed by imbibing a drop of laudanum in a glass of water. The doctor also said that Cam should be given clear liquids and bland foods, and he should rest for the next two or three days. He would probably experience a loss of appetite, and almost certainly some headaches, but when he was fully rid of the last traces of Digitalis, everything would be back to normal. Satisfied that his brother was in good condition, Kev went to Leo in the corner of the room and asked softly, Where is Harrow? Out of your reach, Leo said. They took him off to the jail just before you returned, and don't bother trying to get to him. I've already told the constable not to let you within a hundred yards of the pinfold. I should think you'd like to reach him first, Kev said. You despise him as much as I do. True, but I believe in letting due process take its course, and I don't want Beatrix to be disappointed. She's hoping for a trial. Why? She wants to present Dodger as a witness. Lifting his gaze heavenward, Kev went to the corner of the room and leaned back against the wall. He listened as the Hathaways exchanged their versions of the day's events, and the constable asked questions, and even Noah became involved, which then led to the revelation of Kev's and Cam's pasts and so forth. Information flew in animated volleys. It was never going to end.
Cam, in the meantime, seemed more than content to lie on the bed while Amelia fussed over him. She smoothed his hair, gave him water, straightened the covers, and caressed him repeatedly. He yawned and struggled to keep his eyes open and turned his cheek into the pillow. Kev turned his attention to Wynne, who was sitting in a chair near the bed, her back straight as always. She looked serene and proper, except for the loose strands of hair that had slipped from their pins. One would never guess that she was capable of setting a wardrobe on fire, with Dr. Harrow in it. As Leo had put it, the deed may not have reflected well on her intelligence, but one had to give her points for ruthlessness, and it had gotten the job done. Kev had been rather sorry to hear that Leo had pulled Harrow out, smoky but unharmed. Eventually, Amelia announced that the visit must soon come to an end, as Cam needed to rest. The constable departed, as did Noah and the servants, until the only ones left were immediate family. I think Dodger's under the bed. Beatrix dropped to the floor and peered under it. I want my garter back, Miss Marks said darkly, lowering to the carpet beside Beatrix. Leo regarded Miss Marks with covert interest. Meanwhile, Kev wondered what to do about Wynne. It seemed that love was working through him inexorably, more pervasive than oxygen from air. He was so damn tired of trying to resist it. Cam had been right. You could never predict what would happen. All you could do was love her. Very well. He would give in to it, to her, without trying to qualify or control anything. He would surrender. He would come out of the shadows for good. He took a long, slow breath and let it out. I love you, he thought, looking at Wynne. I love every part of you, every thought and word, the entire, complex, fascinating bundle of all the things you are. I want you with ten different kinds of need at once. I love all the seasons of you, the way you are now, the thought of how much more beautiful you'll be in the decades to come. I love you for being the answer to every question my heart could ask. It seemed so easy, once he capitulated. It seemed natural and right. Kev wasn't certain if he was surrendering to win or to his own passion for her, only that there was no more holding back. He would take her, and he would give her everything he had, every part of his soul, even the broken pieces. He stared at her without blinking, half fearing the slightest movement on his part might precipitate actions he wouldn't be able to control. He might simply launch toward her and drag her from the room. The anticipation was delicious, knowing he was going to have her soon. Drawn by his gaze, Wynne glanced at him. Whatever she saw in his face caused her to blink and colour. Her fingers fluttered to her throat, as if to soothe her own racing pulse. That made it worse, his desperate need to hold her. He wanted to taste the blush on her skin, absorb the heat with his lips and tongue. His most primitive impulses began firing, and he stared intently at her, willing her to move. Excuse me, Wynne murmured, standing in a graceful motion that impassioned him beyond sanity. Her fingers made that little flutter again this time near her hip, as if her nerves were jumping, and he wanted to seize her hand and bring it to his mouth. I'll leave you to rest, dear Cam, she said unsteadily. Thank you, Cam mumbled from the bed. Little sister, thank you for— As he hesitated, Wynne said with a quick little grin, I understand. Sleep well. The grin faded as she risked a glance at Kev. Seeming inspired by a healthy sense of self-preservation, she left the room hastily. Before another second had passed, Kev was at her heels. Where are they going in such a hurry? Beatrix asked from beneath the bed. Back, gammon, Miss Mark said hastily. I'm sure I heard them planning to play a round or two of backgammon. So did I, Leo commented. 
It must be fun to play backgammon in bed, Beatrix said innocently and snickered. Wynne went swiftly and silently toward her room, not daring to look back, though she had to be aware that he was following closely. The carpeted floor absorbed the sound of their footsteps, one set hurried, the other predatory. Still without looking at him, Wynne stopped at her closed door, her fingers curling around the handle. My terms, she said softly, as I told them to you before. Kev understood. Nothing would happen between them now unless Wynne had her way implicitly, and he loved her for her stubborn strength, while at the same time his Romany half bristled. She might have mastered him in some regards, but not all. He shouldered the door open, nudged her into the room, and closed them both inside. He turned the key in the lock. Before she could take another breath, he had secured her head in his hands, and he was kissing her, opening her mouth with his. The taste of her inflamed him, but he went slowly, letting the kiss become a deep, luscious gnawing, sucking to draw her tongue into his mouth. He felt her body mould against his, or at least as much as her heavy skirts would allow. Don't lie to me again, he said gruffly. Never again, I promise. Her blue eyes were brilliant with love. He wanted to touch the soft flesh beneath the layers of cloth and lace. He began to pull at the back of her gown, unfastening the ornate buttons, tearing off the resistant ones, tugging his way down until the whole mass of it loosened and she was gasping. Crushing the billows with his feet, he stood with her in the deep pink folds of the ruined gown as if they were at the heart of some gigantic flower. He reached for her undergarments, untying the ribbon at the neckline of her chemise and the tapes of her drawers. She moved to help him, her slender arms and legs emerging from the crumpled linen. Her pink and white nakedness was breathtaking. The slim, strong calves were sheathed in white stockings tied with plain garters. It was unbearably erotic, the contrast of luxurious warm flesh and prim white cotton. Intending to unfasten the garters, he knelt in the soft heaps of pink muslin. She crooked one of her knees to help him, the shy offering distracting him insanely. He bent to kiss her knees, the silken inner thighs, and when she murmured and tried to evade him, he gripped her hips and kept her still. He nuzzled gently into the pale curls, into the roseate fragrance and softness, using his tongue to separate her open her. Her moan was soft and pleading. My knees are shaking, she whispered. I'll fall. Kev ignored her, searching deeper. He lapped and sucked and ate her, his hunger surging at the first taste of female elixir. She pulsed around him as he thrust his tongue deeply, and he felt the response resonating through her body. Breathing into the plush folds, he licked one side of her, then the other, then straight between to the place where her pleasure centred. Entranced, he stroked her over and over, until her hands were gripped in his hair and her hips urged forward in tight undulations. He took his mouth from her and came to his feet. Her face was dazed, her gaze distant, as if she didn't quite see him. She was trembling from head to toe. His arms slid around her, gathering her naked body against his clothed one. Lowering his mouth to the tender crook of her neck and shoulder, he kissed her skin and touched his tongue to it. At the same time, he reached for the fastenings of his trousers and undid them. She clung to him as he lifted her and pressed her against the wall, one of his arms protecting her back from abrasion. Her body was supple and surprisingly light, her spine tensing as he eased her weight down, and she realized what he meant to do. He settled her fully, watching her mouth draw into a soft O of surprise as she was impaled in a slow, sure glide. The stockinged legs clamped around his waist, and she held on to him desperately, as if they were on the tossing deck of a storm-ravaged ship. Kev kept her pinned and secure 
letting his hips do the work. The band of his trousers slipped free of the anchoring clips of his braces, and the garment slid to his knees. He averted his face to hide a brief grin, momentarily considering the idea of stopping to take his clothes off. But it felt too good, the lust rising until it eclipsed every trace of amusement. Wynne let out a little breath with each wet, rolling drive, feeling herself being filled, ransacked. He paused to kiss her hungrily while he reached down with gentle fingers and teased the swollen lips apart. When the rhythm resumed, his thrusts grazed the little peak with each firm inward plunge. Her eyes closed as if in sleep, her intimate flesh working on him in frantic pulses. In and in, rooting deeper, driving her further to the edge. Her legs went tight around his waist. She stiffened and cried out against his mouth, and he sealed the kiss to keep her quiet. But little moans slipped through, her pleasure shuddering and overrunning. As Kev buried himself in the lovely milking softness, ecstasy shot through him, spilling hotly, gradually easing into helpless throbs. Gasping, Kev lowered her legs to the floor. They stood, their bodies moistly locked, their mouths rubbing in soothing kisses and sighs. Wynne's hands slipped beneath his shirt and moved over his sides and back in gentle benediction. He withdrew from her carefully and stripped the clothes from his steaming body. Somehow they made it to the bed. Kev dragged them both into the cocoon of wool and linen and nestled Wynne against him. The scents of her, of both of them, rose in a light saline perfume to his nose. He breathed it in, stirred by the mingled fragrance. Me volive too, he whispered, and brushed her smiling lips with his. When a rom tells his woman, I love you, the meaning of the word is never chaste. It expresses desire, lust. That pleased Wynne. Me volive too, she whispered back. Kev? Yes, love. How does one marry the Romany way? Join hands in front of witnesses and make a vow. But we'll do it the way of the Gaja too. And every other way I can think of. He took off her garters and unrolled her stockings one by one and wiggled her toes individually until she made a little purring sound. Reaching for him, she guided his head to her breasts, arching upward invitingly. He obliged her, taking a pink tip into his mouth and circling it with his tongue, until it contracted into a tender, hard bud. I don't know what to do now, Wynne said, her voice languid. Just lie there. I'll take care of the rest. She chuckled. No, what I meant was, what do people do when they finally reach their happy ever after? They make it a long one. He fondled her other breast, gently shaping the roundness with his fingers. Do you believe in happy ever after? She persisted, gasping a little as he gave her a playful nip. As in the children's tales? No. You don't? He shook his head. I believe in two people loving each other. A smile curved his lips finding pleasure in ordinary moments, walking together, arguing over things like the timing of an egg or how to manage the servants or the size of the butcher's bill, going to bed each night and waking up together each morning. Lifting his head, he cradled the side of her face in his hand. I've always started every day by going to the window for a glimpse of the sky, but now I won't have to. Why not? she asked softly. Because I'll see the blue of your eyes instead. How romantic you are, she murmured with a grin, kissing him gently. But don't worry. I won't tell anyone. Kev began to make love to her again, so engrossed that he didn't seem to notice the slight rattle of the door lock. Peeking over his shoulder, Wynne saw the long, skinny body of Beatrix's ferret stretching upward to pluck the key from the lock. 
Her lips parted to say something, but then Kev kissed her and spread her thighs. Later, she thought giddily, ignoring the sight of Dodger squeezing beneath the door with the key in his mouth. Perhaps later would be a better time to mention it. And soon she forgot all about the key. Chapter 23 A few days before the betrothal celebration, Cam had made a show of presenting himself as Kev's representative to negotiate a bride price with Leo. The two of them had mock debated the respective merits of groom and bride and how much the groom's family should pay for the privilege of acquiring a treasure such as Wynne. Both sides had concluded, with great hilarity, that it was worth a fortune to find a woman who would tolerate Mary Penn. All this while, Kev sat and scowled at them, which had amused the Adelpates even more. With that formality concluded, the betrothal celebration had been quickly planned and enthusiastically undertaken. A huge feast would be served, featuring roast pork and beef joints, all manner of fowl, and platters of potatoes fried with herbs and garlic. Music from guitars and violins filled the ballroom, while guests from the Romany campsite gathered in a circle. Dressed in a loose white shirt, leather breeches and boots, and a sash knotted at the side of his waist, Cam went to the centre of the circle. He held a bottle wrapped in bright silk, the neck of it wrapped with a string of gold coins. He gestured for everyone to be quiet, and the music obligingly settled into a vibrant lull. Enjoying the colourful tumult of the gathering, Wynne stood beside Kev and listened as Cam made a few remarks. She felt Kev's hand wrap slowly around hers, his thumb stroking the tender flesh just above her palm. After finishing the short speech, Cam came to Wynne. Deftly, he removed the coins from the bottle and placed them around her neck. They were heavy and cool against her skin, settling in a jubilant clatter. The necklace advertised that she was now betrothed, and any man other than Kev would now approach her at his peril. Smiling, Cam embraced Wynne firmly, murmured something affectionate in her ear, and gave her the bottle to drink from. She took a cautious sip of strong red wine and gave the bottle to Kev, who drank after her. Meanwhile, wine was served to all the guests. There were various cries wishing everyone good health as they drank in honour of the betrothed couple. The celebration began in earnest. Music flared into life, and the goblets were quickly drained. Dance with me, Kev surprised Wynne by murmuring. Wynne shook her head with a laugh, watching the couples twirl and move sinuously around each other. Women used their hands in shimmering motions around their bodies while men stomped with their heels and clapped their hands, and all the while they circled each other while holding each other's gaze. I don't know how, Wynne said. Kev stood behind her and crossed his arm around her front, drawing her back against him. Another surprise. He'd never touched her so openly. But amid the goings-on, 
it seemed no one noticed or cared. His voice was hot and soft in her ear. Watch for a moment. You see how little space is needed, how they circle each other. When Roma dance, they lift their hands to the sky, but they stomp their feet to express connection to the earth and to earthly passions. He smiled against her cheek and gently turned her to face him. Come, he murmured, and hooked his hand around her waist to urge her forward. Wynne followed him shyly, fascinated by a side of him she hadn't seen before. She wouldn't have expected him to be this self-assured, drawing her into the dance and watching her with a bright gleam in his eyes. He coaxed her to raise her arms upward, to snap her fingers, even to swish her skirts at him as he moved around her. She couldn't seem to stop giggling. They were dancing, and he was so good at it, turning it into a cat-and-mouse game. She twirled in a circle, and he caught her around the waist, pulling her close for one scalding moment. The scent of his skin, the movement of his chest against hers, filled her with intense desire. Leaning his forehead against hers, Kev stared at her, until she was drowning in the depths of his eyes, as dark and bright as hellfire. Kiss me, she whispered unevenly, not caring where they were or who might see them. A smile touched his lips. If I start now, I won't be able to stop. The spell was broken by an apologetic throat clearing from nearby. Kev glanced to the side where Cam was standing. Cam's face was carefully blank. My apologies for interrupting. But Mrs. Barnstable just came to me with the news that an unexpected guest has arrived. More family? Yes, but not from the Romany side. Kev shook his head, perplexed. Who is it? Cam swallowed visibly. Lord Cavan, our grandfather. It was decided that Cam and Kev would meet Cavan with no other family members present. While the celebration continued in full vigour, the brothers withdrew to the library and waited. Two footmen dashed back and forth, bringing in objects from a carriage outside. Cushions, a velvet-covered footstool, a lap blanket, a foot warmer, a silver tray bearing a cup. After a multitude of preparations was made, Cavan was announced by one of the footmen, and he entered the room. The old Irish earl was physically unimposing, old and small and slight. But Cavan had the presence of a deposed monarch, a faded grandeur textured with weary pride. A frill of white hair had been cut to lie against his ruddy scalp, and a goatee framed his chin like a lion's whiskers. His shrewd brown eyes assessed the young men dispassionately. Kevin and Cameron Cole! he said, rather than asked, in a flowing Anglo-Irish accent, the syllables graceful and lightly arid. Neither of them replied. Who's the elder? Cavan asked, seating himself in an upholstered chair. A footman immediately arranged a footstool beneath his heels. He is, Cam said, helpfully pointing at Kev, while Kev gave him a sideways glare. Ignoring the look, Cam spoke casually. How did you find us, my lord? A heraldic master recently approached me in London with the information that you had hired him to research a particular design. He had identified it as the Cole's ancient mark. When he showed me the sketch he'd made of the tattoo on your arm, I knew at once who you were and why you wanted the design researched. And why is that? Cam asked softly. You wanted to be recognized as a coal, and some day to gain your inheritance. Cam smiled without amusement. Believe me, my lord, I don't wish for gain. I merely wanted to know who I was. His eyes flashed with annoyance. And I paid that bloody researcher to give the information to me, not to take it to you first. I'll take a strip out of his hide for that. Why do you want to see us? Kev asked brusquely. We want nothing from you, and you'll get nothing from us. 
First, it may interest you to learn that your father is dead. He expired a matter of weeks ago, as a result of a riding accident. He was always inept with horses. It eventually proved the death of him. Our condolences, Cam said flatly. Kev merely shrugged. This is how you receive the death of your sire? Cavan demanded. I'm afraid we didn't know our sire well enough to display a more heartfelt reaction, Kev said sardonically. My son left behind a wife and three daughters. No sons, except for you. The earl made a temple of his knotty fingers. The lands are entailed to male issue only, and there are none to be found in the coal line in any of its branches. As things stand at present, the cavern title and all that is attached to it will become extinct upon my death. His jaw hardened. I won't let the patrimony be lost forever, merely because of your father's inability to reproduce. Kevin arched a brow. I'd hardly call two sons and three daughters an inability to reproduce. Daughters are of no consequence, and the two of you are half-breeds. One can hardly claim that your father succeeded in furthering the family's interests. But no matter. The situation must be tolerated. You are, after all, legitimate issue. An acrid pause. My only heirs. To the old man's annoyance, the brothers appeared singularly, rather maddeningly, unimpressed. Cavan spoke irritably to Kev. Your Viscount Mornington, inheritor of the Mornington estate in County Meath. Upon my death, you will also receive Notford Castle in Hillsborough, the Fairwall estate in County Down, and Watford Park in Hertfordshire. Does that mean anything to you? Not really. You're the last in line, Cavan persisted, his voice sharpening to a family that traces its origins to a thane created in the year 936. Moreover, you're the heir to an earldom. Have you nothing to say? Do you even understand the good fortune that has befallen you? Kev understood all of that. He also understood that an imperious old bastard, who had once wanted him dead, now expected him to fall over himself because of an unasked-for inheritance. Weren't you once searching for us with the intention of dispatching us like a pair of unwanted pups? Cavan scowled. That question has no relevance to the matter at hand. That means yes, Cam told Kev. Circumstances have altered, Cavan said. You have become more useful to me alive than dead, a fact for which you should be appreciative. Kev was about to tell Cavan where he could shove his estates and titles when Cam shouldered him roughly aside. Excuse us, Cam said over his shoulder to Cavan, while we have a brotherly chat. I don't want to chat, Kev muttered. For once would you listen to me, Cam asked, his tone mild, his eyes narrowed. Just once. Folding his arms over his chest, Kev inclined his head. Before you toss him out on his withered old ass, Cam said softly, you may want to consider a few points. First, he's not going to live long. Second, the tenants of the cavern lands are probably in desperate need of decent management and help. There is much you could do for them, even if you choose to reside in England and oversee the Irish portion of the entailment from afar. Third, think about Wynne. She'd have wealth and position. No one would dare slight a countess. Fourth, we apparently have a stepmother and three half-sisters with no one to care for them after the old man turns up his toes. Fifth, there's no need for fifth, Kev said. I'll do it. What? Cam raised his brows. You agree with me? Yes. All the points had been well taken, but the mere mention of Wynne would have been enough. She would live better and be treated with far more respect as a countess than a gypsy's wife. The old man regarded Kev with a sour expression. 
You seem to be under the misapprehension that I was giving you a choice. I wasn't asking you for anything. I was informing you of your good fortune and your duty. Furthermore, well, it's all settled, Cam interrupted hastily. Lord Cavan, you now have an heir and a spare. I propose that we all take leave of each other to contemplate our new circumstances. If it pleases you, my lord, we will meet again on the morrow to discuss the particulars. Agreed. May we offer you and your servants lodging for the night? I have already arranged to stay with Lord Westcliff, a most distinguished gentleman. I was acquainted with his father. Yes, Cam said gravely. We've heard of Westcliff. Cavan's lips thinned. I suppose it will fall to me to introduce you to him some day. He slid a disdainful glance over both of them. If we can do something about your clothing and deportment, and your education, God help us all. He snapped his fingers, and the two footmen swiftly collected the items they had brought in. Rising from the chair, Cavan allowed his coat to be draped over his narrow shoulders. With a morose shake of his head, he looked at Kev and muttered, As I frequently remind myself, you're better than nothing. Until tomorrow. The moment Cavan left the parlour, Cam went to the sideboard and poured two generous brandies. Looking bemused, he gave one to Kev. What are you thinking? he asked. He seems like the kind of grandfather we'd have, Kev said, and Cam nearly choked on his brandy as he laughed. Much later that evening, Wynne lay draped across Kev's chest, her hair streaming over him like trickles of moonlight. She was naked, except for the coin necklace. Gently disentangling it from her hair, Kev pulled the necklace off and set it on the nightstand. Don't, she protested. Why? I like wearing it. It reminds me that I'm betrothed. I'll remind you, he murmured, rolling until she lay in the crook of his arm. As often as you need. She smiled up at him, touching the edges of his lips with exploring fingertips. Are you sorry Lord Cavan found you, Kev? He kissed the delicate pads of her fingers as he pondered the question. No, he said eventually. I wouldn't care to spend a great deal of time in his company, but now I have the answers to things I wondered about for my entire life. And... He hesitated, before admitting sheepishly, I wouldn't mind being the Earl of Cavan some day. You wouldn't? She regarded him with a quizzical grin. Kev nodded. I think I might be good at it, he confessed. So do I, Wynne said in a conspiratorial whisper. Kev smiled and kissed her forehead. Did I tell you the last thing Cavan said before he left this evening? He said he frequently reminds himself that I'm better than nothing. What a silly old windbag, Wynne said, slipping her hand behind Kev's neck. And he's utterly wrong, she added, just before their lips met. Because, my love, you're better than everything. For a long time afterward, there were no words. <laughs> Epilogue. A 
According to the doctor, it had been the first delivery during which she had more concerns for the expectant father than the mother and infant. Kev had conducted himself quite well during the majority of Wynne's confinement, though he had tended to overreact at times. The commonplace aches and twinges of pregnancy had caused nothing short of alarm, and there had been many a time that he had insisted on sending for the doctor for no good reason at all, despite Wynne's exasperated refusal. But parts of it had been marvellous. The quiet evenings when Kev had rested beside her, with his hands flattened on her stomach to feel the baby kicking. The summer afternoons when they had walked through Hampshire, feeling at one with nature and the life teeming everywhere. The unexpected discovery that marriage, rather than weighting their relationship with seriousness, had somehow given life a sense of lightness, of buoyancy. Kev laughed often now. He was far more apt to tease, to play, to show his affection openly. He seemed to adore Cam and Amelia's son, Ronan, and readily joined in the family's general spoiling of the dark-haired infant. However, during the last few weeks of Wynne's pregnancy, Kev hadn't been able to conceal his growing dread, and when Wynne's labour had begun in the middle of the night, he had gone into a state of subdued terror that nothing would soothe. Every birthing pain, every sharp gasp she took, had caused Kev to turn ashen, until Wynne had realised she was faring far better than he. Please, Wynne had whispered to Amelia privately, do something with him. And so Cam and Leo had dragged Kev from the bedroom down to the library, plying him with good Irish whisky for most of the day. When the future Earl of Cavan was born, the doctor said he was perfectly healthy and that he wished all births could go so well. Amelia and Poppy bathed Wynne and dressed her in a fresh nightgown and cleaned and swaddled the baby in soft cotton. Only then was Kev allowed to come up to see them. After ascertaining for himself that his wife and child were both in good condition, Kev wept in unashamed relief and promptly fell asleep on the bed beside Wynne. She glanced from her handsome, slumbering husband to the baby in her arms. Her son was small but perfectly formed, fair-skinned, with a remarkable quantity of black hair. His eye colour was indeterminate at the moment, but Wynne thought his eyes would eventually turn out to be blue. She lifted him higher against her chest until her lips were close to his miniature ear, and in accordance with Romany tradition, she told him his secret name. You are Andre, she whispered. It was a name for a warrior. A son of Kev Merripen could be no less. Your Gajo name is Jason Cole. And your tribal name, she paused thoughtfully. Jado, came her husband's drowsy voice from beside her. Wynne looked down at Kev and reached out to stroke his thick, dark hair. The lines on his face were gone, and he looked relaxed and content. What does that mean? she asked. One who lives outside the rom. That's perfect. She let her hand linger in his hair. Oh, ye loisi, she asked him gently. Yes, Kev said, answering in English. There is heart here. And Wynne smiled as he sat up to kiss her. <laughs>